Aunt Nell by George A. Birmingham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Mrs. MacDermott splashed her way across the yard towards the stable. It was raining softly and persistently. The mud lay deep. There were pools of water here and there. Mrs. MacDermott neither paused nor picked her steps. There was no reason why she should. The rain could not damage the tweed cap on her head, her complexion, brilliant as the complexions of Irish women often are, was not of the kind that washes off. Her rough grey skirt, on which raindrops glistened, came down no further than her knees. On her feet were a pair of rubber boots, which reached up to the hem of her skirt, perhaps further. She was comfortably indifferent to rain and mud. If you reckon the years since she was born, Mrs. MacDermott was nearly forty, but that is no true way of estimating the age of man or woman. Seen not in the dusk with the light behind her, but in broad daylight on horseback, she was little more than thirty. Such is the reward of living an outdoor life in the damp climate of Connaught, and her heart was as young as her face and figure. She had known no serious troubles and very few of the minor cares of life. Her husband, a man twenty-five years older than she was, died after two years of married life leaving her a very comfortable fortune. Nell MacDermott, the whole country called her Nell, hunted three days a week every winter. Why shouldn't she be young? Young Gafferty, the groom, used to say. Hasn't she five good horses and the full of her skin of meat and drink? The likes of her never get old. Johnny Gafferty was rubbing down a tall bay mare when Mrs. MacDermott opened the stable door and entered the loose box. Johnny, she said, you'll put the cob in the governor's cart this afternoon and have him round at three o'clock. I'm going to the station to meet my nephew. I've had a letter from his father to say he'll be here today. Johnny Gafferty, though he had been eight years in Mrs. MacDermott's service, had never before heard of her nephew. It could be, he said cautiously, that the captain will be bringing a horse with him, or maybe two. He felt that a title of some sort was due to the nephew of a lady like Mrs. MacDermott. The assumption that he would have a horse or two with him was natural. All Mrs. MacDermott's friends hunted. He's not a captain, said Mrs. MacDermott, and he's bringing no horses, and he doesn't hunt. What's more, Johnny? He doesn't even ride, couldn't sit on the back of a donkey, so his father says anyway. Glory be to God, said Johnny. And what sort of a gentleman will he be at all? He's a poet, said Mrs. MacDermott. Johnny felt that he had perhaps gone beyond the limits of respectful criticism in expressing his first astonishment at the amazing news that Mrs. MacDermott's nephew could not ride. Well, he said, there's worse things than poetry in the world. Very few sillier things, said Mrs. MacDermott. But that's not the worst there is about him, Johnny. His health is completely broken down. That's why he's coming here. Nerve strain, they call it. That's what they would call it, said Johnny sympathetically, when it's a high-up gentleman like a nephew of your own and it's hard to blame him there's many a man does be a bit foolish without meaning any great harm by it to be a bit foolish is a kindly west of ireland phrase which means to drink heavily it is not that said mrs macdermott i don't believe from what i've heard of him that the man has even that much in him it's just what his father says poetry and nerves and he's coming here for the good of his health. It's Mr. Bertram they call him. Mr. Bertram Connell. Mrs. MacDermott walked up and down the platform, waiting for the arrival of her nephew's train. She was dressed in a very becoming pale blue tweed, and had wrapped a silk muffler of a rather brighter blue round her neck. 
her brown shoes though strong were very well made and neat between them and her skirt was a considerable stretch of knitted stocking blue like the tweed her ankles were singularly well formed and comely the afternoon had turned out to be fine and she had taken some trouble about her dress before setting out to meet a strange nephew whom she had not seen since he was five years old she might have taken more trouble still if the nephew had been anything more exciting than a nerve-shattered poet the train steamed in at last only one passenger got out of a first-class carriage mrs macdermott looked at him in doubt he was not in the least the sort of man she expected to see poets so she understood have long hair and sallow clean-shaven faces this young man's head was closely cropped and he had a fair moustache he was smartly dressed in well-fitting clothes poets are or ought to be sloppy in their attire also judged by the colour of his cheeks and his vigorous step this man was in perfect health mrs macdermott approached him with some hesitation the young man was standing in the middle of the platform looking around his eyes rested on mrs macdermott for a moment but passed from her again he was expecting someone whom he did not see are you bertram connell by any chance asked mrs macdermott that's me said the young man and i'm expecting an aunt to meet me i say are you a cousin i didn't know i had a cousin the mistake was an excusable one mrs macdermott looked very young and pretty in her blue tweed she appreciated the compliment paid her all the more because it was obviously sincere you haven't any cousins she said not on your father's side anyway i'm your aunt aunt nell he said plainly startled by the information great scott and i thought he paused and looked at mrs macdermott with genuine surprise then he recovered his self-possession he put his arm round her neck and kissed her heartily first on one cheek then on the other aunts are kissed by their nephews every day as a matter of course they expect it mrs macdermott had not thought about the matter beforehand if she had she would have taken it for granted that bertram would kiss her occasionally uncomfortably and without conviction the kisses she actually received embarrassed her she even blushed a little and was annoyed with herself for blushing there doesn't seem to be much the matter with your nerve she said bertram became suddenly grave my nerves are in a rotten state he said the doctor specialist you know tip-top man said the only thing for me was life in the country fresh air birds flowers new milk all that sort of thing your father wrote all that to me said mrs macdermott poor old dad said bertram he's horribly upset about it mrs macdermott was further puzzled about her nephew's nervous breakdown when she suggested about seven o'clock that it was time to dress for dinner bertram who had been talking cheerfully and smoking a good deal put his arm around her waist and ran her upstairs jolly thing to have an aunt like you he said mrs macdermott was slightly out of breath and angry with herself for blushing again at bedtime she refused a good-night kiss with some dignity bertram protested oh i say aunt nell that's all rot you know an aunt is just one of the people you do kiss night and morning no you don't she said and anyway you won't get the chance to-morrow morning i shall be off early it's a hunting day can't i get a horse somewhere said bertram mrs macdermott looked at him in astonishment your father told me she said that you couldn't ride and had never been on a horse in your life did he say that the poor dad i suppose he was afraid i'd break my neck if you're suffering from nervous breakdown i am frightfully that's why they sent me here then you shouldn't hunt said mrs macdermott you should sit quietly in the library and write poetry that reminds me the rector is coming to dinner tonight i thought you'd like to meet him why is he a sporting old bird not in the least but he's the only man about this country 
who knows anything about poetry. That's why I asked him. Johnny Gafferty made a report to Mrs. McDermott when she returned from hunting, which surprised her a good deal. The young gentleman, ma'am, he said, was round in the stable this morning shortly after you leaving, and nothing would do him only for me to saddle the bay for him. Did you do it? What else could I do, said Gafferty, when his heart was set on it? I suppose he's broken his own neck and the mare's knees, said Mrs. McDermott. He has not, then, neither the one nor the other. I don't know how he do if you faced him with a stone wall, but the way he took the bay over the fence at the end of the paddock was as neat as ever I seen. You couldn't have done it better yourself, ma'am. He can ride, then? Ride, said Gafferty. Is it ride? If his poetry is no worse, nor his riding, he'll make money by it yet. The dinner with the rector was not an entire success. The clergyman, warned beforehand that he was to entertain a well-known poet, had prepared himself by reading several books of Wordsworth's excursion. Bertram shied at the name of Wordsworth and insisted on hearing from his aunt a detailed account of the day's run. This puzzled Mrs. MacDermott a little, but she hit upon an explanation which satisfied her. The rector was enthusiastic in his admiration of Wordsworth. Bertram, a poet himself, evidently suffered from professional jealousy. Mrs. MacDermott, who had looked forward to her nephew's visit with dread, began to enjoy it. Bertram was a cheerful young man with an easy flow of slangy conversation. His tastes were very much the same as Mrs. MacDermott's own. He smoked and drank whiskey and soda in moderate quantities. He behaved in all respects like a normal man, showing no signs of the nervousness which goes with the artistic temperament. His politeness to her and the trouble he took about her comfort in small matters were very pleasant. He had large handsome blue eyes, and Mrs. MacDermott liked the way he looked at her. His gaze expressed a frank admiration which was curiously agreeable. A week after his arrival, Mrs. MacDermott paid a high compliment to her nephew. She promised to mount him on the bay mare and take him out hunting. She had satisfied herself that Johnny Gafferty was not mistaken and that the young man really could ride. Bertram, excited and in high good humor, succeeded before she had time to protest in giving her a hearty kiss of gratitude. The morning of the hunt was warm and moist. The meet was in one of the most favorable places in the country. Mrs. MacDermott, drawing on her gloves in the hall before starting, noted with gratification that her nephew's breeches were well cut and his stock neatly fastened. Johnny Gafferty could be heard outside the door speaking to the horses which he held ready. A telegraph boy arrived on a bicycle. He handed the usual orange envelope to Mrs. MacDermott. She tore it open impatiently and glanced at the message inside. She gave an exclamation of surprise and read the message through slowly and carefully. Then, without a word, she handed it to her nephew. Very sorry, the telegram ran. Only today discovered that Bertram had not gone to you as arranged. He is in a condition of complete prostration. Cannot start now. Connell. It's from my brother, said Mrs. MacDermott. But what on earth does it mean? You're here all right, aren't you? Yes, he said. I'm here. He laid a good deal of emphasis on the I. Mrs. MacDermott looked at him with sudden suspicion. I've had a top hole time, he said. What an utterly incompetent rotter Connell is. He had nothing on earth to do but lie low. His father couldn't have found out. Mrs. MacDermott walked over to the door and addressed Gafferty. Johnny, she said, the horses won't be wanted today. She turned to the young man who stood beside her. Now, she said, come into the library and explain what all this means. Oh, I say, Aunt Nell, he said, don't let's miss the day. I'll explain the whole thing to you in the evening after dinner. You'll explain it now if you can. She led the way into the library. It's quite simple, really, he said. 
bertram connell your nephew though a poet and all that is rather an ass are you bertram connell or are you not said mrs macdermott oh lord no i'm not that sort of fellow at all i couldn't write a line of poetry to save my life he's you simply can't imagine how frightfully brainy he is all the same i rather like him he was my fag at school and we were up together at cambridge i've more or less kept up with him ever since he's more like a girl than a man you know i dare say that's why i liked him then he crocked up nerves and that sort of thing and they said he must come over here he didn't like the notion a bit i was in london just then on leave and he told me how he hated the idea so did i said mrs macdermott i said that he was a silly ass and that if i had the chance of a month in the west of ireland in a sporting sort of a house he told me you hunted a lot i'd simply jump at it but the poor fellow was frightfully sick at the prospect said he was sure he wouldn't get on with you and that you'd simply hate him he had a book of poetry just coming out and he was hoping to get a play of his taken on a play about fairies i give you my word he was very near crying so after a lot of talking we hit on the idea of my coming here he was to lie low in london so that his father wouldn't find him you neither of you thought about me apparently said mrs macdermott oh yes we did we thought as you hadn't seen him since he was a child that you wouldn't know him and of course we thought you'd be frightfully old there didn't seem to be much harm in it and you you came here and called me aunt nell you're far the nicest aunt i've ever seen or even imagined and you actually had the cheek to mrs macdermott stopped abruptly and blushed she was thinking of the kisses his thoughts followed hers though she did not complete the sentence only the first day he said you wouldn't let me afterwards except once and you didn't really let me then i just did it i give you my word i couldn't help it you looked so jolly no fellow could have helped it i believe bertram would have done the same though he is a poet and now said mrs macdermott before you go must i go out of this house and back to london to-day said mrs macdermott but before you go i'd rather like to know who you are since you're not bertram connell my name is maitland robert maitland but they generally call me bob i'm in the thirtieth lancers i say it was rather funny your thinking i couldn't ride and turning on that old parson to talk poetry to me mrs macdermott allowed herself to smile the matter was really settled that day before bob maitland left for london but it was a week later when mrs macdermott announced her decision to her brother there's no fool like an old fool she wrote and at my age i ought to have more sense but i took to bob the moment i saw him and if he makes as good a husband as he did a nephew we'll get on together all right though he's a few years younger than i am End of the story aunt nell by george a birmingham read by lars rolander and cupid by arnold bennett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Cat and Cupid by Arnold Bennett. Part 1. The secret history of the Ebag marriage is now printed for the first time. The Ebag family, who prefer their name to be accented on the first syllable, once almost ruled Old Castle which is a clean and conceited borough with long historical traditions on the very edge of the industrial democratic and unclean five towns the ebag family 
still lives in the grateful memory of old castle for no family ever did more to preserve the celebrated old castilian superiority in social moral and religious matters over the vulgar five towns the episodes leading to the ebag marriage could only have happened in old castle by which i mean merely that they could not have happened in any of the five towns in the five towns that sort of thing does not occur i don't know why but it doesn't the people are too deeply interested in football starting prices rates public parks sliding scales excursions to blackpool and municipal shindies to concern themselves with organists as such in the five towns an organist may be a sanitary inspector or an auctioneer on mondays in old castle an organist is an organist recognized as such in the streets no one ever heard of an organist in the five towns being taken up and petted by a couple of old ladies but this may occur at old castle it in fact did the scandalous circumstances which led to the disappearance from the old castle scene of mr skerritt the original organist of st placid have no relation to the present narrative which opens when the ladies ebag began to seek for a new organist the new church of st placid owed its magnificent existence to the ebag family the apse had been given entirely by old caiaphas ebag ex m p now a paralytic sufferer at a cost of twelve thousand pounds and his was the original idea of building the church when owing to the decline of the working man's interest in beer and one or two other things caiaphas lost nearly the whole of his fortune which had been gained by honest labor in mighty speculations he rather regretted the church he would have preferred twelve thousand in cash to a view of the apse from his bedroom window but he was man enough never to complain he lived after his misfortunes in a comparatively small house with his two daughters mrs ebag and miss ebag these two ladies are the heroines of the tale mrs ebag had married her cousin who had died she possessed about six hundred a year of her own she was two years older than her sister miss ebag a spinster miss ebag was two years younger than mrs ebag no further information as to their respective ages ever leaked out miss ebag had a little money of her own from her deceased mother and caiaphas had the wreck of his riches the total income of the household was not far short of a thousand a year but of this quite two hundred a year was absorbed by young edith ebag mrs ebag's stepdaughter for mrs ebag had been her husband's second choice edith who was notorious as a silly chit and spent most of her time in london and other absurd places formed no part of the household though she visited it occasionally the household consisted of old caiaphas bedridden and his two daughters and goldie goldie was the tomcat so termed by reason of his splendid tawniness goldie had more to do with the ebag marriage than any one or anything except the weathercock on the top of the house this may sound queer but is as not to the queerness about to be unfolded part two it cannot be considered unnatural that mrs and miss ebag with the assistance of the vicar should have managed the affairs of the church people nicknamed them the church wardens which was not quite nice having regard to the fact that their sole aim was the truest welfare of the church they and the vicar in a friendly and effusive way hated each other sometimes they got the better of the vicar and less often he got the better of them in the choice of a new organist they won their candidate was mr carl ullman the artistic orphan 
Mr. Carl Ullman is the hero of the tale, the son of one of those German designers of earthenware who, at intervals, come and settle in the five towns for the purpose of explaining fully to the inhabitants how inferior England is to Germany. He had an English mother, and he himself was violently English. He spoke English like an Englishman, and German like an Englishman. He could paint, model in clay, and play three musical instruments, including the organ. His one failing was that he could never earn enough to live on. It seemed as if he was always being drawn by an invisible string towards the workhouse door. Now and then he made half a sovereign extra by deputizing on the organ. In such manner had he been introduced to the Ebag ladies. His romantic and gloomy appearance had attracted them, with the result that they had asked him to lunch after the service, and he had remained with them till the evening service. During the visit, they had learnt that his grandfather had been court counsellor in the kingdom of Saxony. Afterwards, they often said to each other how ideal it would be if only Mr. Skerritt might be removed and Carl Ullman take his place. And when Mr. Skerritt actually was removed by his own wickedness, they regarded it as almost an answer to prayer and successfully employed their powerful interest on behalf of Carl. The salary was a hundred a year. Not once in his life had Carl earned a hundred pounds in a single year. For him the situation meant opulence. He accepted it, but calmly, gloomily. Romantic gloom was his joy in life. He said with deep melancholy that he was sure he could not find a convenient lodging in Oldcastle. And the ladies Ebag then said that he must really come and spend a few days with them and Goldie and Papa until he was suited. He said that he hated to plant himself on people and yielded to the request. The ladies Ebag fussed around his dark-eyed and tranquil pessimism, and both of them instantly grew younger, a curious but authentic phenomenon. They adored his playing and they were enchanted to discover that his notion about hymn-tunes agreed with theirs, and by consequence disagreed with the vicar's. In the first week or two they scored off the vicar five times, and the advantage of having your organist in your own house grew very apparent. They were also greatly impressed by his gentleness with Goldie, and by his intelligent interest in serious questions. One day, Miss Ebag said timidly to her sister, "'It's just six months to-day.' "'What do you mean, sister?' asked Mrs. Ebag, self-consciously. "'Since Mr. Ullman came.' "'So it is,' said Mrs. Ebag, who was just as well aware of the date as the spinster was aware of it. They said no more. The position was the least bit delicate. Carl had found no lodging. He did not offer to go. They did not want him to go. He did not offer to pay. And really, he cost them nothing except laundry, whiskey, and fussing. How could they suggest that he should pay? He lived amidst them like a beautiful mystery, and all were seemingly content. Carl was probably saving the whole of his salary, for he never bought clothes, and he did not smoke. The ladies Ebag simply did what they liked about hymn tunes. Part 3 You would have thought that no outsider would find a word to say, and you would have been mistaken. The fact that Mrs. Ebag was two years older than Miss, and Miss two years younger than Mrs. Ebag, the fact that old Caiaphas was, for strong reasons, always in the house. The fact that the ladies were notorious cat idolaters. The fact that the reputation of the Ebag family was, and had ever been, spotless. The fact that 
the ebeck family had given the apse and practically created the entire church all these facts added together did not prevent the outsider from finding a word to say at first words were not said but looks were looked and coughs were coughed then someone strolling into the church of a morning while carl ullman was practicing saw miss ebag sitting in silent ecstasy in a corner and a few mornings later the same someone whose curiosity had been excited veritably saw mrs ebag in the organ loft with carl ullman but no sign of miss ebag it was at this juncture that words began to be said words not complete sentences the sentences were never finished of course it's no affair of mine but i wonder that people like the ebags should not that i should ever dream of hinting that first one and then the other well i'm sure that if either mrs or Miss Ebag had the slightest idea they'd at once, and so on. Intangible gossamer criticism floating in the air. Part 4 One evening, it was precisely the first of June, when a thunderstorm was blowing up from the southwest and scattering the smoke of the five towns to the four corners of the world and making the weathercock of the house of the Ebags creak. The ladies Ebag and Carl Ullman sat together as usual in the drawing room. The French window was open, but banged too at intervals. Carl Ullman had played the piano, and the ladies Ebag, Mrs. Ebag, somewhat comfortably stout, and Miss Ebag, spare, were talking very well and sensibly about the influence of music on character. They invariably chose such subjects for conversation. Carl was chiefly silent, but now and then, after a sip of whiskey, he would say yes with impressiveness and stare gloomily out of the darkening window. The ladies Ebag had a remarkable example of the influence of music on character in the person of Edith Ebag. It appeared that Edith would never play anything but waltzes. Walt Tufos for a choice, and that the foolish frivolity of her flyaway character was a direct consequence of this habit. Carl felt sadly glad, after hearing the description of Edith's carryings on, that Edith had chosen to live far away, and then the conversation languished and died with the daylight, and a certain self-consciousness obscured the social atmosphere. For a vague rumor of the chatter of the town had penetrated the house, and the ladies Ebag, though they scorned to chatter, were affected by it. Carl Ullman, too. It had the customary effect of such chatter. It fixed the thoughts of those chatted about on matters which perhaps would not otherwise have occupied their attention. The ladies Ebag said to themselves, we are no longer aged nineteen. We are moreover living with our father. If he is bedridden, what then? This gossip connecting our names with that of Mr. Ullman is worse than baseless. It is preposterous. We assert positively that we have no designs of any kind on Mr. Ullman. Nevertheless, by dint of thinking about that gossip, the naked idea of a marriage with Mr. Ullman soon ceased to shock them. They could gaze at it without going into hysterics. As for Carl, he often meditated upon his own age, which might have been anything between thirty and forty-five, and upon the mysterious ages of the ladies, and upon their goodness, their charm, their seriousness, their intelligence, and their sympathy with himself. Hence the self-consciousness in the gloaming. To create a diversion, Miss Ebag walked primly to the window and cried, Goldie! Goldie! 
it was goldie's bedtime in summer he always strolled into the garden after dinner and he nearly always sensibly responded to the call when his bed hour sounded no one would have dreamed of retiring until goldie was safely ensconced in his large basket under the stairs naughty goldie miss ebag said comprehensively to the garden she went into the garden to search and mrs ebag followed her and carl ullman followed mrs ebag and they searched without result until it was black night and the threatening storm at last fell the vision of goldie out in that storm desolated the ladies and carl ullman displayed the nicest feeling at length the rain drove them in and they stood in the drawing-room with anxious faces while two servants under directions from carl searched the house for goldie if you please em stammered the housemaid rushing rather unconventionally into the drawing-room cook says she thinks goldie must be on the roof in the vein on the roof in the vein exclaimed mrs ebag pale in the vein yes m whatever do you mean sarah said miss ebag even paler the ladies ebag were utterly convinced that goldie was not like other cats that he never went on the roof that he never had any wish to do anything that was not in the strictest sense gentlemanly and correct and if by chance he did go on the roof it was merely to examine the roof itself or to enjoy the view therefrom out of gentlemanly curiosity so that this reference to the roof shocked them the night did not favor the theory of view gazing cook says she heard the weather vane creaking ever since she went upstairs after dinner and now it's stopped and she can hear goldie a meowling like anything is cook in her attic asked mrs ebag yes m ask her to come out mr ullman will you be so very good as to come upstairs and investigate cook enveloped in a cloak stood out on the second landing while mr ullman and the ladies invaded her chamber the noise of meowling was terrible mr ullman opened the dormer window and the rain burst in together with a fury of meowling but he did not care it lightened and thundered but he did not care he procured a chair of cooks and put it under the window and stood on it with his back to the window and twisted forth his body so that he could spy up the roof. The ladies protested that he would be wet through, but he paid no heed to them. Then his head, dripping, returned into the room. I've just seen by a flash of lightning, he said in a voice of emotion, the poor animal has got his tail fast in the socket of the weather vane. He must have been whisking it about up there, and the vein turned and caught it. The vein is jammed. How dreadful, said Mrs. Ebag. Whatever can be done? He'll be dead before morning, sobbed Miss Ebag. I shall climb up the roof and release him, said Carl Ullman, gravely. They forbade him to do so then they implored him to refrain but he was adamant and in their supplications there was a note of insincerity for their hearts bled for goldie and further they were not altogether unwilling that carl should prove himself a hero and so amid apprehensive feminine cries of the acuteness of his danger carl crawled out of the window and faced the thunder the lightning, the rain, the slippery roof, and the maddened cat. A group of three servants were huddled outside the attic door. In the attic, the ladies could hear his movements on the roof, moving higher and higher. The suspense was extreme. Then there was silence. Even the meowling had ceased. Then a clap 
of thunder, and then, after that, a terrific clatter on the roof, a bounding downwards as of a great stone, a curse, a horrid pause, and finally, a terrific smashing of foliage and cracking of wood. Mrs. Ebag sprang to the window. It's all right, came a calm, gloomy voice from below. I fell into the rhododendrons, and Goldie followed me. I'm not hurt, thank goodness. Just my luck. A bell rang imperiously. It was the paralytic's bell. He had been disturbed by these unaccustomed phenomena. Sister, do go to father at once, said Mrs. Ebag, as they both hastened downstairs in a state of emotion, assuredly unique in their lives. Part 5 Mrs. Ebag met Carl and the cat as they dripped into the gaslit drawing room. They presented a surprising spectacle, and they were doing damage to the Persian carpet at the rate of about five shillings a second. But that Carl and the beloved creature for whom he had dared so much were equally unhurt, appeared to be indubitable. Of course, it was a miracle. It could not be regarded as other than a miracle. Mrs. Ebag gave vent to an exclamation in which were mingled pity, pride, admiration, and solicitude, and then remained, as it were, spellbound. The cat escaped from those protecting arms and fled away. Instead of following Goldie, Mrs. Ebag continued to gaze at the hero. How can I thank you? she whispered. What for? asked Carl with laconic gloom. For having saved my darling, said Mrs. Ebag, and there was passion in her voice. Oh, said Carl, it was nothing. Nothing, Mrs. Ebag repeated after him, with melting eyes, as if to imply that, instead of being nothing, it was everything, as if to imply that his deed must rank hereafter with the most splendid deeds of antiquity, as if to imply that the whole affair was beyond words to utter or gratitude to repay. And in fact, Carl himself was moved. You cannot fall from the roof of a two-story house into a very high-class rhododendron bush carrying a prize cat in your arms without being a bit shaken. And Carl was a bit shaken, not merely physically, but morally and spiritually. He could not deny to himself that he had, after all, done something rather wondrous, which ought to be celebrated in sounding verse. He felt that he was in an atmosphere far removed from the commonplace. He dripped steadily on to the carpet. You know how dear my cat was to me, proceeded Mrs. Ebag, and you risked your life to spare me the pain of his suffering, perhaps his death. How thankful I am that I insisted on having those rhododendrons planted just where they are fifteen years ago. I never anticipated. She stopped. Tears came into her dowager eyes. It was obvious that she worshipped him. She was so absorbed in his heroism that she had no thought even for his dampness. As Carl's eyes met hers, she seemed to him to grow younger, and there came into his mind all the rumor that had vaguely reached him, coupling their names together, and also his early dreams of love and passion and a marriage that would be one long honeymoon. And he saw how absurd had been those early dreams. He saw that the best chance of a felicitous marriage lay in a union of mature and serious persons, animated by grave interests and lofty ideals. Yes, she was older than he, but not much, not much, not more than how many years? And he remembered, surprising her rapt glance that very evening as she watched him playing the piano. 
what had romance to do with age romance could occur at any age it was occurring now her soft eyes her portly form exuded romance and had not the renowned beaconsfield espoused a lady appreciably older than himself and did not those espousals achieve the ideal of bliss in the act of saving the cat he had not been definitely aware that it was so particularly the cat of the household but now influenced by her attitude and her shining reverence he actually did begin to persuade himself that an uncontrollable instinctive desire to please her and win her for his own had moved him to undertake the perilous passage of the sloping roof in short the idle chatter of the town was about to be justified in another moment he might have dripped into her generous arms had not miss ebag swept into the drawing-room gracious gasped miss ebag the poor dear thing will have pneumonia sister you know his chest is not strong dear mr ullman please please do go and mm, change he did the discreet thing and went to bed hot whiskey following him on a tray carried by the housemaid part six the next morning the slightly unusual happened it was the custom for carl ullman to breakfast alone while reading the staffordshire signal the ladies ebag breakfasted mysteriously in bed but on this morning carl found miss ebag before him in the breakfast room she prosecuted minute inquiries as to his health and nerves she went out with him to regard the rhododendron bushes and shuddered at the sight of the ruin which had saved him she said following famous philosophers that chance was merely the name we give to the effect of laws which we cannot understand and upon this high level of conversation she poured forth his coffee and passed his toast it was a lovely morning after the tempest goldie all newly combed and looking as though he had never seen a roof strolled pompously into the room with tail unfurled miss ebag picked the animal up and kissed it passionately darling she murmured not exactly to mr ullman nor yet exactly to the cat then she glanced effulgently at carl and said when i think that you risked your precious life in that awful storm to save my poor goldie you must have guessed how dear he was to me no really mr ullman i cannot thank you properly i can't express my her eyes were moist although not young she was two years younger her age was two years less the touch of man had never profaned her no masculine kiss had ever rested on that cheek that mouth and carl felt that he might be the first to cull the flower that had so long waited he did not see just then the hollow beneath her chin the two lines of sinew that bounding a depression disappeared beneath her collarette he saw only her soul he guessed that she would be more malleable than the widow and he was sure that she was not in a position as the widow was to make comparisons between husbands certainly there appeared to be some confusion as to the proprietorship of this cat certainly he could not have saved the cat's life for love of two different persons but that was beside the point the essential thing was that he began to be glad that he had decided nothing definite about the widow on the previous evening darling said she again with a new access of passion kissing goldie but darting a glance at carl he might have put to her the momentous question between two bites of buttered toast had not mrs ebag 
at the precise instant, swum amply into the room. "'Sister, you up?' exclaimed Miss Ebag. "'And you, sister?' retorted Mrs. Ebag. Part 7 It is impossible to divine what might have occurred for the delectation of the very ancient borough of Oldcastle if that frivolous piece of goods Edith had not taken it into her head to run down from London for a few days, on the plea that London was too ridiculously hot. She was a pretty girl, with fluffy, honey-colored hair and about thirty white frocks, and she seemed to be quite as silly as her staid stepmother and her prim step-aunt had said. She transformed the careful order of the house into a wild disorder and left a novel or so lying on the drawing-room table between her stepmother's contemporary review and her step-aunt's history of European morals. Her taste in music was candidly and brazenly bad. It was a fact, as her elders had stated, that she played nothing but waltzes. What was worse, she compelled Carl Ullman to perform waltzes. And one day she burst into the drawing-room when Carl was alone there, with a roll under her luscious arm, and said, "'What do you think I've found at Barrelfoot's?' "'I don't know,' said Carl, gloomily smiling, and then smiling without gloom. "'Waltiful's waltzes arranged for four hands. You must play them with me at once.' And he did. It was a sad spectacle to see the organist of St. Placid's galloping through a series of dances with the empty-headed Edith. The worst was, he liked it. He knew that he ought to prefer the high intellectual plane, the severe artistic tastes of the elderly sisters. But he did not. He was amazed to discover that frivolity appealed more powerfully to his secret soul. He was also amazed to discover that his gloom was leaving him. This vanishing of gloom gave him strange sensations, akin to the sensations of a man who, after having worn gaiters into middle age, abandons them. After the waltful, she began to tell him all about herself, how she went slumming in the East End, and how jolly it was and how she helped in the Bloomsbury settlement, and how jolly that was. And later, she said, You must have thought it very odd of me, Mr. Ullman, not thanking you for so bravely rescuing my poor cat. But the truth is, I never heard of it till today. I can't say how grateful I am. I should have loved to see you doing it. Is Goldie your cat? he feebly inquired. "'Why, of course,' she said. "'Didn't you know?' "'Of course you did. Goldie always belonged to me. Grandpa bought him for me, but I couldn't do with him in London, so I always leave him here for them to take care of. He adores me. He never forgets me. He'll come to me before anyone. You must have noticed that. I can't say how grateful I am. It was perfectly marvelous of you. I can't help laughing, though, whenever I think what a state mother and auntie must have been in that night. Strictly speaking, they hadn't a cent between them, except his hundred a year. But he married her hair, and she married his melancholy eyes, and she was content to settle in Oldcastle where there are almost no slums. And her stepmother was forced by Edith to make the hundred up to four hundred. This was rather hard on Mrs. Ebag. Thus it fell out that Mrs. Ebag remained a widow, and that Miss Ebag continues a flower uncalled. However, gossip was stifled. In his appointed time, and in the fullness of years, Goldie died and was mourned, and by none was he more sincerely mourned than by the aged bedridden Caiaphas. 
I miss my cat, I can't tell you, said old Caiaphas pettishly to Carl, who was sitting by his couch. He knew his master, Goldie did. Edith did her best to steal him from me when you married and set up house. A nice thing considering I bought him, and he never belonged to anybody but me. I, I shall never have another cat like that cat. And this is the whole truth of the affair. End of The Cat and Cupid by Arnold Bennett Chubu and Sheemish by Lord Dunsany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chubu and Sheemish It was the custom on Tuesdays in the temple of Chubu for the priest to enter at evening and chant, There is none but Chubu. And all the people rejoiced and cried out, there is none but Chubu. And honey was offered to Chubu, and maize and fat, thus was he magnified. Chubu was an idol of some antiquity, as may be seen from the color of the wood. He had been carved out of mahogany, and after he was carved he had been polished. Then they had set him up on the diorite pedestal, with the brazier in front of it for burning spices, and the flat gold plates for fat. Thus they worshipped Chubu. He must have been there for over a hundred years, when one day the priest came in with another idol into the temple of Chubu, and set it upon a pedestal near Chubu's, and sang, There is also Shemish. And all the people rejoiced and cried out, There is also Shemish. Shemish was palpably a modern idol, and although the wood was stained with a dark red dye, you could see that he had only just been carved and honey was offered to Sheemish as well as Chubu, and also maize and fat. The fury of Chubu knew no time limit. He was furious all that night, and next day he was furious still. The situation called for immediate miracles. To devastate the city with a pestilence and kill all his priests was scarcely within his power. Therefore he wisely concentrated such divine powers as he had in commanding a little earthquake. Thus, thought Chubu, will I reassert myself as the only god, and men shall spit upon Shemish. Chubu willed it, and willed it, and still no earthquake came, when suddenly he was aware that the hated Shemish was daring to attempt a miracle too. He ceased to busy himself about the earthquake, and listened, or shall I say felt, for what Shemish was thinking for gods are aware of what passes in the mind by a sense that is other than any of our five. Shemish was trying to make an earthquake, too. The new god's motive was probably to assert himself. I doubt if Chubu understood or cared for his motive. It was sufficient for an idol already aflame with jealousy that his detestable rival was on the verge of a miracle. All the power of Chubu veered round at once and set dead against an earthquake, even a little one. It was thus in the temple of Chubu for some time, and then no earthquake came. To be a god and to fail to achieve a miracle is a despairing sensation. It is as though among men one should determine upon a hearty sneeze, and as though no sneeze would come. It was as though one should try to swim in heavy boots or remember a name that is utterly forgotten. All these pains were Shemish's and upon Tuesday the priests came in, and the people, and they did worship Chubu, and offered fat to him, saying, O oh, Chubu who made everything! And then the priests sang, There is also Shemish. And Chubu was put to shame, and spake not for three days. Now there were holy birds in the temple of Chubu, and when the third day was come, and the night thereof, it was, as it were, revealed to the mind of Chubu, that there was dirt upon the head of Shemish. And Chubu spake unto Shemish, as speak the gods, moving no lips, nor yet disturbing the silence, saying, There is dirt upon thy head, O Shemish. All night long he muttered again and again, 
there is dirt upon Shemish's head. And when it was dawn, and voices were heard far off, Chubu became exultant with earth's awakening things, and cried out till the sun was high, Dirt, dirt, dirt upon the head of Shemish! And at noon he said, So Shemish would be a god. Thus was Shemish confounded. And with Tuesday one came and washed his head with rose water, and he was worshipped again when they sang, There is also Shemish! And yet was Chubu content, for he said, The head of Shemish has been defiled. And again, His head was defiled, it is enough. And one evening, lo, there was dirt on the head of Chubu also. And the thing was perceived of Shemish. It is not with the gods as it is with men. We are angry one with another, and turn from our anger again, but the wrath of the gods is enduring. Chubu remembered, and Shemish did not forget. They spake as we do not speak, in silence yet heard of each other, nor were their thoughts as our thoughts. We should not judge them merely by human standards. All night long they spake, and all night said these words only, Dirty Chubu, Dirty Shemish, Dirty Chubu, Dirty Shemish, all night long. Their wrath had not tired at dawn, and neither had wearied of its accusation, and gradually Chubu came to realize that he was nothing more than the equal of Shemish. All gods are jealous, but this equality with the upstart Shemish, a thing of painted wood a hundred years newer than Chubu, and this worship given to Shemish in Chubu's own temple were particularly bitter. Chubu was jealous even for a god, and when Tuesday came again, the third day of Shemish's worship, Chubu could bear it no longer. He felt that his anger must be revealed at all costs, and he returned with all the vehemence of his will to achieve a little earthquake. The worshippers had just gone from his temple when Chubu settled his will to attain this miracle. Now and then his meditations were disturbed by that now familiar dictum, Dirty Chubu. But Chubu willed ferociously, not even stopping to say what he longed to say, and had already said nine hundred times, and presently even these interruptions ceased. They ceased because Shemish had returned to a project that he had never definitely abandoned, the desire to assert himself and exalt himself over Chubu by performing a miracle, and the district being volcanic, he had chosen a little earthquake as the miracle most easily accomplished by a small god. Now an earthquake that is commanded by two gods has double the chance of fulfillment than when it is willed by one, and an incalculably greater chance than when two gods are pulling different ways, as, to take the case of older and greater gods, when the sun and the moon pull in the same direction we have the biggest tides. Chubu knew nothing of the theory of tides, and was too much occupied with his miracle to notice what Shemish was doing, and suddenly the miracle was an accomplished thing. It was a very local earthquake, for there are other gods than Chubu, or even Shemish, and it was only a little one as the gods had willed. But it loosened some monoliths in a colonnade that supported one side of the temple, and the whole of one wall fell in, and the low huts of the people of that city were shaken a little, and some of their doors were jammed so they would not open. It was enough, and for a moment it seemed that it was all. Neither Chubu nor Shemish commanded there should be more, but they had set in motion an old law older than Chubu, the law of gravity, that the colonnade had held back for a hundred years, and the temple of Chubu quivered, and then stood still, swayed once, and was overthrown on the heads of Chubu and Shemish. No one rebuilt it, for nobody dared to near such terrible gods. Some said that Chubu wrought the miracle, but some said Shemish, and thereof schism was born. The weakly amiable, alarmed by the bitterness of rival sects, sought compromise and said that both had wrought it, but no one guessed the truth that the thing was done in rivalry. And a saying arose, and both sects held this belief in common, that whoso toucheth Chubu shall die, or whoso looketh upon Shemish. That is how Chubu came into my possession when I traveled once beyond the hills of Ting. I found him in the fallen temple of Chubu, with his hands and toes sticking up out of the rubbish, lying upon his back, and in that attitude, just as I found him, I keep him to this day on my mantelpiece, as he is less liable to be upset that way. Shemish was broken, so I left him where he was. And there is something so helpless about Chubu 
with his fat hand stuck up in the air, that sometimes I am moved out of compassion to bow down to him and pray, saying, O oh, Chubu, thou that made everything, help thy servant. Chubu cannot do much, though once I am sure that at a game of bridge he sent me the ace of trumps after I had not held a card worth having for the whole of the evening, and chance alone could have done as much as that for me, but I do not tell this to Chubu. End of Chubu and Sheemish by Lord Dunsany Read by Alan Winteroud District Doctor by Ivan S. Turgenev This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The District Doctor by Ivan S. Turgenev one day in autumn, on my way back from a remote part of the country, I caught cold and fell ill. Fortunately, the fever attacked me in the district town at the inn. I sent for the doctor. In half an hour, the district doctor appeared, a thin, dark-haired man of middle height. He prescribed me the usual sudorific, ordered a mustard plaster to be put on, very deftly slid a five-ruble note up his sleeve, coughing dryly, and looking away as he did so, and then was getting up to go home, but somehow fell into talk and remained. I was exhausted with feverishness. I foresaw a sleepless night, and was glad of a little chat with a pleasant companion. Tea was served. My doctor began to converse freely. He was a sensible fellow, and expressed himself with vigour and some humour. Queer little things happen in the world. You may live a long while with some people and be on friendly terms with them and never once speak openly with them from your soul. With others you have scarcely time to get acquainted and all at once you are pouring out to him or he to you all your secrets as though you were at a confession. I don't know how I gained the confidence of my new friend. Anyway, with nothing to lead up to it, he told me a rather curious incident. And here I will report this tale for the information of the indulgent reader. I will try to tell it in the doctor's own words. You don't happen to know, he began in a weak and quavering voice, the common result of the use of unmixed bearers of snuff. You don't happen to know the judge here, Milov, Pavel Lukish. You don't know him? Well, it's all the same. He cleared his throat and rubbed his eyes. Well, you see, the thing happened, to tell you exactly without mistake, in Lent, at the very time of the thaws. I was sitting at his house, our judges, you know, playing preference. Our judge is a good fellow and fond of playing preference. Suddenly, the doctor made frequent use of the word suddenly, they tell me, there's a servant asking for you. I say, what does he want? They say, he has brought a note. It must be from a patient. Give me the note, I say. So it is from a patient, well and good. You understand, it's our bread and butter. But this is how it was. A lady, a widow, writes to me. She says, my daughter is dying. Come, for God's sake. She says, and the horses have been sent for you. Well, that's all right. But she was twenty miles from the town, and it was midnight out of doors, and the roads in such a state, my word. And as she was poor herself, one could not expect more than two silver rubles, and even that problematic and afterwards it might only be a matter of a roll of linen and a sack of oatmeal in payment. However, duty, you know, before everything. A fellow creature may be dying. I hand over my cards at once to Calliopin, the member of the Provincial Commission, and return home. I look. A wretched little trap was standing at the steps, with peasants' horses, fat, too fat, and their coat as shaggy as felt, and the coachman sitting with his cap off out of respect. Well, I think to myself, it's clear, my friend, these patients aren't rolling in riches. You smile, but I tell you, a poor man like me has to take everything into consideration. If the coachman sits like a prince and doesn't touch his cap, and even sneers at you behind his beard, and flicks his whip, then you may bet on six roubles. But this case, I saw, had a very different air. However, I think there's no help for it, duty before everything. I snatch up the most necessary drugs and set off. Will you believe it? I only just managed to get there at all. The road was infernal, streams, snow, watercourses, and the dike had suddenly burst there. 
That was the worst of it. However, I arrived at last. It was a little thatched house. There was a light in the windows. That meant they expected me. I was met by an old lady, very venerable, in a cap. Save her, she says. She is dying. I say, pray don't distress yourself. Where is the invalid? Come this way. I see a clean little room, a lamp in the corner, on the bed, a girl of twenty, unconscious. She was in a burning heat and breathing heavily. It was fever. There were two other girls, her sisters, scared and in tears. Yesterday, they tell me, she was perfectly well and had a good appetite. This morning she complained of her head, and this evening, suddenly, you see, like this. I said again, pray don't be uneasy. It's a doctor's duty, you know. And I went up to her and bled her, told them to put on a mustard plaster and prescribed a mixture. Meantime, I looked at her. I looked at her, you know. There, by God, I have never seen such a face. She was a beauty, in a word. I felt quite shaken with pity. Such lovely features, such eyes. But, thank God, she became easier. She fell into a perspiration, seemed to come to her senses, looked round, smiled, and passed her hand over her face. Her sisters bent over her. They asked, How are you? All right, she says, and turns away. I looked at her. She had fallen asleep. Well, I say, now the patient should be left alone. So we all went out on tiptoe. Only a maid remained in case she was wanted. In the parlour there was a samovar standing on the table and a bottle of rum. In our profession one can't get on without it. They gave me tea, asked me to stop the night. I consented. Where could I go, indeed, at that time of night? The old lady kept groaning. What is it, I say? She will live. Don't worry yourself. You had better take a little rest yourself. It is about two o'clock. But you will send to wake me if anything happens? Yes, yes. The old lady went away, and the girls too went to their own room. They made up a bed for me in the parlour. Well, I went to bed, but I could not get to sleep, for a wonder, for in reality I was very tired. I could not get my patient out of my head. At last I could not put up with it any longer. I got up suddenly. I think to myself, I will go and see how the patient is getting on. Her bedroom was next to the parlour. Well, I got up and gently opened the door. How my heart beat! I looked in. The servant was asleep, her mouth wide open, and even snoring. The wretch! But the patient lay with her face towards me, and her arms flung wide apart, poor girl. I went up to her, when suddenly she opened her eyes and stared at me. Who is it? Who is it? I was in confusion. Don't be alarmed, madam, I say. I am the doctor. I have come to see how you feel. You the doctor? Yes, the doctor your mother sent for me from the town. We have bled you, madam. Now pray, go to sleep, and in a day or two, please God, we will set you on your feet again. Ah, yes, yes, doctor, don't let me die. Please, please. Why do you talk like that, God bless you? She is in a fever again, I think to myself. I felt her pulse. Yes, she was feverish. She looked at me and then took me by the hand. I will tell you why I don't want to die. I will tell you. Now we are alone, and only please don't you, not to anyone. Listen. I bent down. She moved her lips quite to my ear. She touched my cheek with her hair. I confess my head went round and began to whisper. I could make out nothing of it. Ah, she was delirious. She whispered and whispered, but so quickly, and as if it were not in Russian. At last she finished and shivering dropped her head on the pillow, and threatened me with her finger. Remember, doctor, to no one. I calmed her somehow, gave her something to drink, waked the servant, and went away. At this point the doctor again took snuff with exasperated energy, and for a moment seemed stupefied by its effect. However, he continued, the next day, contrary to my expectations, the patient was no better. I thought and thought, and suddenly decided to remain there, even though my other patients were expecting me. And you know one can't afford to disregard that. One's practice suffers if one does. But in the first place, the patient was really in danger. And secondly, to tell the truth, I felt strongly drawn to her. Besides, I liked the whole family. Though they were really badly off, they were singularly, I may say, cultivated people. Their father had been a learned man, an author, 
He died, of course, in poverty, but he had managed before he died to give his children an excellent education. He left a lot of books, too, either because I looked after the invalid very carefully or for some other reason. Anyway, I can venture to say all the household loved me as if I were one of the family. Meantime, the roads were in a worse state than ever. All communication, so to say, were cut off completely. Even medicine could, with difficulty, be got from the town. The sick girl was not getting better. Day after day, and day after day. But here, the doctor made a brief pause. I declare I don't know how to tell you. He again took snuff, coughed, and swallowed a little tea. I will tell you without beating about the bush. My patient, how should I say? Well, she had fallen in love with me. Or, no, it was not that she was in love. However, really, how should one say? The doctor looked down and grew red. No, he went on quickly, in love indeed. A man should not overestimate himself. She was an educated girl, clever and well-read, and I had even forgotten my Latin, one may say, completely. As to appearance, the doctor looked himself over with a smile. I am nothing to boast of there either. But God Almighty did not make me a fool. I don't take black for white. I know a thing or two. I could see very clearly, for instance, that Alexandra Andreevna that was her name, did not feel love for me, but had a friendly, so to say, inclination, a respect or something for me, though she herself perhaps mistook this sentiment. Anyway, this was her attitude. You may form your own judgment of it. But, the doctor added, who had brought out all these disconnected sentences without taking breath, and with obvious embarrassment, I seem to be wandering, rather. You won't understand anything like this. There, with your leave, I will relate it all in order. He drank off a glass of tea and began in a calmer voice. Well, then, my patient kept getting worse and worse. You are not a doctor, my good sir. You cannot understand what passes in a poor fellow's heart, especially at first, when he begins to suspect that the disease is getting the upper hand of him. What becomes of his belief in himself? You suddenly grow timid. It's indescribable. You fancy, then, that you have forgotten everything you knew, and that the patient has no faith in you, and that other people begin to notice how distracted you are, and tell you the symptoms with reluctance, that they are looking at you suspiciously, whispering, Ah, oh, it's horrid. There must be a remedy, you think, for this disease. If one could find it, isn't this it? You try. No, that's not it. You don't allow the medicine the necessary time to do good. You clutch at one thing, then at another. Sometimes you take up a book of medical prescriptions. Here it is, you think. Sometimes, by Jove, you pick one out by chance, thinking to leave it to fate. But meantime, a fellow creature's dying, and another doctor would have saved him. We must have a consultation, you say. I will not take the responsibility on myself. And what a fool you look at such times. Well, in time you learn to bear it. It's nothing to you. A man has died, but it's not your fault. You treated him by the rules. But what's still more torture to you is to see blind faith in you and to feel yourself that you are not able to be of use. Well, it was just this blind faith that the whole of Alexandra Andreevna's family had in me. They had forgotten to think that their daughter was in danger. I, too, on my side, assure them that it's nothing, but meantime my heart sinks into my boots. To add to our troubles, the roads were in such a state that the coachman was gone for whole days together to get medicine, and I never left the patient's room. I could not tear myself away. I tell her amusing stories, you know, and play cards with her. I watch by her side at night. The old mother thanks me with tears in her eyes, but I think to myself, I don't deserve your gratitude. I frankly confess to you, there is no object in concealing it now. I was in love with my patient and Alexandra Adreyevna had grown fond of me. She would not sometimes let anyone be in her room but me. She began to talk to me, to ask questions, where I had studied, how I lived, who were my people, whom I go to see. I feel that she ought not to talk, but to forbid her to, to forbid her resolutely, you know, I could not. Sometimes I held my head in my hands and asked myself, What are you doing, villain? and she would take my hand and hold it, give me a long, long look, and turn away, sigh, and say, how good you are. Her hands were so feverish, her eyes so large and languid. 
Yes, she said, you are a good, kind man. You are not like our neighbours. No, you are not like that. Why did I not know you till now? Alexandra Adreyevna, calm yourself, I say. I feel, believe me, I don't know how I have gained. But there, calm yourself. All will be right. You will be well again. And meantime, I must tell you, continued the doctor, bending forward and raising his eyebrows, that they associated very little with the neighbours, because the smaller people were not on their level, and pride hindered them from being friendly with the rich. I tell you, they were an exceptionally cultivated family, so you know it was gratifying for me. She would only take her medicine from my hands. She would lift herself up, poor girl, with my aid, take it and gaze at me. My heart fell as if it were bursting, and meanwhile she was growing worse and worse, worse and worse, all the time. She will die, I think to myself. She must die. Believe me, I would sooner have gone to the grave myself, and here were her mother and sisters watching me, looking into my eyes, and their faith in me was wearing away. Well, how is she? Oh, all right, all right. All right, indeed. My mind was failing me. Well, I was sitting one night alone again by my patient. The maid was sitting there too, and snoring away in full swing. I can't find fault with the poor girl, though. She was worn out too. Alexandra Adreyevna had felt very unwell all the evening. She was feverish. Until midnight she kept tossing about. At last she seemed to fall asleep. At least she lay still without stirring. The lamp was burning in the corner before the holy image. I sat there, you know, with my head bent. I even dozed a little. Suddenly it seemed as though someone touched me in the side. I turned round. Good God, Alexandra Adreyevna was gazing with intent eyes at me. Her lips parted. Her cheeks seemed burning. What is it? Doctor, shall I die? Merciful heavens. No, doctor, no. Please don't tell me I shall live. Don't say so. If you knew... Listen, for God's sake, don't conceal my real position. And her breath came so fast. If I can know for certain that I must die, then I will tell you all. All. Alexandra Adreyevna, I beg. Listen, I have not been asleep at all. I have been looking at you a long while. For God's sake, I believe in you. You are a good man, an honest man. I entreat you by all that is sacred in the world. Tell me the truth. If you knew how important it is for me. Doctor, for God's sake, tell me, am I in danger? What can I tell you, Alexandra Adreyevna, pray? For God's sake, I beseech you. I can't disguise from you, I say. Alexandra Adreyevna, you are certainly in danger, but God is merciful. I shall die, I shall die. And it seemed as though she were pleased. Her face grew so bright, I was alarmed. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. I am not frightened of death at all. She suddenly sat up and leaned on her elbow. Now, yes, now I can tell you that I thank you with my whole heart, that you are kind and good, that I love you. I stared at her like one possessed. It was terrible for me, you know. Do you hear I love you? Alexandra Adreyevna, how have I deserved? No, no, you don't, you don't understand me. And suddenly she stretched out her arms and taking my head in her hands, she kissed it. Believe me, I almost screamed aloud. I threw myself on my knees and buried my head in the pillow. She did not speak. Her fingers trembled in my hair. I listen. She is weeping. I began to soothe her, to assure her. I really don't know what I did say to her. You will wake up the girl, I say to her. Alexandra Adreyevna, I thank you. Believe me. Calm yourself. Enough, enough, she persisted. Never mind all of them. Let them wake, then. Let them come in. It doesn't matter. I am dying, you see. And what do you fear? Why are you afraid? Lift up your head. Or perhaps you don't love me. Perhaps I am wrong. In that case, forgive me. Alexandra Adreyevna, what are you saying? I love you, Alexandra Adreyevna. She looked straight into my eyes and opened her arms wide. Then take me in your arms. I tell you frankly, I don't know how it was that I did not go mad that night. I feel that my patient is killing herself. I see that she is not fully herself. I understand, too, that if she did not consider herself on the point of death, she would never have thought of me. And indeed, say what you will, it's hard to die at twenty without having known love. This was what was torturing her. This was why, in despair, she caught at me. Do you understand now? 
but she held me in her arms and would not let me go. Have pity on me, Alexandra Andreevna, and have pity on yourself, I say. Why, she says, what is there to think of? You know I must die. This she repeated incessantly. If I knew that I should return to life and be a proper young lady again, I should be ashamed. Of course, ashamed. But why now? But who has said you will die? Oh, no, leave off. You will not deceive me. You don't know how to lie. Look at your face. You shall live, Alexandra Andreevna. I will cure you. We will ask your mother's blessing. We will be united. We will be happy. No, no, I have your word. I must die. You have promised me. You have told me. It was cruel for me, cruel for many reasons, and see what trifling things can do sometimes. It seems nothing at all, but it's painful. It occurred to her to ask me, what is my name? Not my surname, but my first name. I must needs be so unlucky as to be called Trifon. Yes, indeed, Trifon Ivanovitch. Everyone in the house called me doctor. However, there's no help for it. I say, Trifon, madam. She frowned, shook her head, and muttered something in French. Ah, something unpleasant, of course. And then she laughed, disagreeably, too. Well, I spent the whole night with her in this way. Before morning I went away, feeling as though I were mad. When I went again into her room, it was daytime, after morning tea. Good God, I could scarcely recognize her. People are laid in their grave looking better than that. I swear to you, on my honor, I don't understand. I absolutely don't understand now how i lived through that experience three days and nights my patience still lingered on and what nights what things she said to me and on the last night only imagine to yourself i was sitting near her and kept praying to god for one thing only take her i said quickly and me with her suddenly the old mother comes unexpectedly into the room i had already the evening before told her the mother there was little hope and it would be well to send for a priest when the sick girl saw her mother, she said, It's very well you have come. Look at us. We love one another. We have given each other our word. What does she say, doctor? What does she say? I turned livid. She is wandering, I say, the fever. But she, Hush, hush, you told me something quite different just now, and have taken my ring. Why do you pretend? My mother is good. She will forgive. She will understand, and I am dying. I have no need to tell lies. Give me your hand. I jumped up and ran out of the room. The old lady, of course, guessed how it was. I will not, however, weary you any longer. And to me, too, of course, it's painful to recall all this. My patient passed away the next day. God rest her soul, the doctor added, speaking quickly and with a sigh. Before her death, she asked her family to go out and leave me alone with her. Forgive me, she said, I am perhaps to blame towards you, my illness, but believe me, I have loved no one more than you. Do not forget me, keep my ring. The doctor turned away. I took his hand. Ah, he said, let us talk of something else, or would you care to play preference for a small stake? It is not for people like me to give way to exalted emotions. There's only one thing for me to think of, how to keep the children from crying and the wife from scolding. Since then, you know, I have had time to enter into lawful wedlock, as they say. Oh, I took a merchant's daughter, 7,000 for her dowry. Her name's Akulina. It goes well with Trifon. She is an ill-tempered woman, I must tell you, but luckily she's asleep all day. Well, shall it be preference? We sat down to preference for half-penny points. Trifon Ivanovich won two rubles and a half from me and went home late, well pleased with his success. End of The District Doctor by Ivan S. Turgenev Eagle's Nest by Bjornsson Bjornstjern This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hermann Hoskins The Eagle's Nest The entry guards was the name of a small solitary parish surrounded by lofty mountains. It lay in a flat and fertile valley and was intersected by a broad river that flowed down from the mountains. 
This river emptied into a lake, which was situated close by the parish, and presented a fine view of the surrounding country. At the Andrew Lake the man had come rowing, who had first cleared this valley. His name was Andre, and it was his descendants who dwelt here. Some said he had fled Hitler on account of a murder he had committed, and that was why his family were so dark. Others said this was on account of the mountains, which shut out the sun at five o'clock of a midsummer afternoon. Over this parish there hung an eagle's nest. It was built on a cliff far up the mountains. All could see the mother eagle alight in her nest, but no one could reach it. The male eagle went sailing over the parish, now swooping down after a lamb, now after a kid. Once he had also taken a little child and borne it away. Therefore there was no safety in the parish as long as the eagle had a nest in this mountain. There was a tradition among the people that in old times there were two brothers who had climbed up to the nest and torn it down. But nowadays there was no one who was able to reach it. Whenever two met at the end regards, they talked about the eagle's nest and looked up. Everyone knew when the eagles reappeared in the new year, where they had swooped down and done mischief, and who had last endeavoured to reach the nest. The youth of the place from early boyhood practised climbing mountains and trees, wrestling and scuffling in order that one day they might reach the cliff and demolish the nest as those two brothers had done. At the time of which this story tells, the best boy at the entry guards was named Life, and he was not of the Andrew family. He had curly hair and small eyes, was clever in all play, and was fond of the fair sex. He early said of himself that one day he would reach the eagle's nest. But old people remarked that he should not have said so aloud. This annoyed him, and even before he had reached his prime, he made the ascent. It was one bright Sunday forenoon, early in the summer. The young eagles must be just about hatched. A vast multitude of people had gathered together at the foot of the mountain to behold the feat, the old people advising him against attempting it, the young ones urging him on. But he hearkened only to his own desires, and waiting until the mother eagle left her nest, he gave one spring into the air and hung in the tree several yards from the ground. The tree grew in a cleft in the rock, and from this cleft he began to climb upward. Small stones loosened under his feet. Earth and gravel came rolling down, otherwise all was still, save for the stream flowing behind with its suppressed ceaseless murmur. Soon he had reached the point where the mountain began to project. Here he hung long, by one hand, while his foot groped for a sure resting place, for he could not see. Many, especially women, turned away, saying he would never have done this had he had parents living. He found footing at last however sought again, now with the hand, now with the foot, failed, slipped, then hung fast again. They who stood below could hear one another breathing. Suddenly there rose to her feet a tall young girl, who had been sitting on a stone apart from the rest. It was said that she had been betrothed to life from early childhood, although he was not of her kindred. Stretching out her arms, she called aloud, Life, life, why do you do this? Every eye was turned on her. 
her father, who was standing close by, gave her a stern look, but she heeded him not. Come down again, life, she cried. I love you, and there is nothing to be gained up there. They could see that he was considering. He hesitated a moment or two, and then started onward. For a long time all went well, for he was sure-footed and had a strong grip, but after a while it seemed as if he were growing weary, for he often paused. Presently a little stone came rolling down as a harbinger, and every one who stood there had to watch its course to the bottom. Some could endure it no longer and went away. The girl alone still stood on the stone, and, wringing her hands, continued to gaze upward. Once more life took hold with one hand, but it slipped. She saw this distinctly. Then he tried the other. It slipped also. Life, she shouted so loud that her voice rang through the mountains, and all the others chimed in with her. He is sleeping, they cried, and stretched up their hands to him, both men and women. He was indeed sleeping, carrying with him sand, stones and earth. Slipping, continually slipping, ever faster and faster. The people turned away, and then they heard the rustling and scraping in the mountain behind them, after which something fell with a heavy thud like a great piece of wet earth. When they could look round again, he was lying there, crushed and mutilated beyond recognition. The girl had fallen down on the stone, and her father took her up in his arms, and bore her away. The youths who had taken the most pains to incite life to the perilous ascent now, dared not lend their hand to pick him up. Some were even unable to look at him. So the old people had to go forward. The eldest of them, as he took hold of the body, said, it is very sad, but, he added, casting a look upward, it is after all well that something hangs so high that it cannot be reached by everyone. End of the Eagle's Nest Read by Hermann Roskans Brahman by Law by Harry Day. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Indigent Brahmin. There was a Brahmin who had a wife and four children. He was very poor. With no resources in the world, he lived chiefly on the benefactions of the rich. His gains were considerable when marriages were celebrated or funeral ceremonies were performed, but as his parishioners did not marry every day, neither did they die every day, he found it difficult to make the two ends meet. His wife often rebuked him for his inability to give her adequate support, and his children often went about naked and hungry. But though poor, he was a good man. He was diligent in his devotions, and there was not a single day in his life in which he did not say his prayers at stated hours. His tutelary deity was the goddess Durga, the consort of Siva, the creative energy of the universe. On no day did he either drink water or taste food till he had written in red ink the name of Durga at least one hundred and eight times while throughout the day he incessantly uttered the ejaculation, O Durga, O Durga, have mercy upon me. 
Whenever he felt anxious on account of his poverty and his inability to support his wife and children, he groaned out, Durga, Durga, Durga. One day, being very sad, he went to a forest many miles distant from the village in which he lived, and, indulging his grief, wept bitter tears. He prayed in the following manner, O Durga, O Mother Bhagavati, wilt thou not make an end of my misery? Were I alone in the world, I should not have been sad on account of poverty, but thou hast given me a wife and children. Give me, O Mother, the means to support them. It so happened that on that day and on that very spot the god Siva and his wife Durga were taking their morning walk. The goddess Durga, on seeing the Brahmin at a distance, said to her divine husband, O Lord of Kailas, do you see that Brahmin? He is always taking my name on his lips and offering the prayer that I should deliver him out of his troubles. Can we not, my lord, do something for the poor Brahmin, oppressed as he is with the cares of a growing family? We should give him enough to make him comfortable. As the poor man and his family have never enough to eat, I propose that you give him a handi, which should yield him an inexhaustible supply of mudki. The lord of Kalas readily agreed to the proposal of his divine consort, and, by his decree, created on the spot a handi possessing the required quality. Durga then, calling the Brahmin to her, said, O Brahmin, I have often thought of your pitiable case. Your repeated prayers have at last moved my compassion. Here is a handi for you. When you turn it upside down and shake it, it will pour down a never-ceasing shower of the finest mudki, which will not end till you restore the handi to its proper position. Yourself, your wife, and your children can eat as much mudki as you like, and you can also sell as much as you like. The Brahmin, delighted beyond measure at obtaining so inestimable a treasure, made obeisance to the goddess, and, taking the handi in his hand, proceeded towards his house as fast as his legs could carry him. But he had not gone many yards when he thought of testing the efficacy of the wonderful vessel. Accordingly, he turned the handi upside down and shook it, when, lo and behold, a quantity of the finest mudki he had ever seen fell to the ground. He tied the sweetmeat in his sheet and walked on. It was now noon, and the Brahmin was hungry, but he could not eat without his ablutions and his prayers. As he saw in the way an inn, and not far from it a tank, he purposed to halt there that he might bathe, say his prayers, and then eat the much-desired mudki. The Brahmin sat at the innkeeper's shop, put the handi near him, smoked tobacco, besmeared his body with mustard oil, and, before proceeding to bathe in the adjacent tank, gave the handi in charge to the innkeeper, begging him again and again to take a special care of it. When the Brahmin went to his bath and his devotions, the innkeeper thought it strange that he should be so careful as to the safety of his earthen vessel. There must be something valuable in the handi, he thought. Otherwise, why should the Brahmin take so much thought about it? His curiosity being excited, he opened the handi, and to his surprise found that it contained nothing. What can be the meaning of this? thought the innkeeper within himself. Why should the Brahmin care so much for an empty handi? He took up the vessel and began to examine it carefully, and when, in the course of examination, he turned the handi upside down, a quantity of the finest mudki fell from it, and went on falling without intermission. The innkeeper called his wife and children to witness this unexpected stroke of good fortune. The showers of the sugared fried patty were so copious that they filled all the vessels and jars of the innkeeper. He resolved to appropriate to himself this precious handi, and accordingly put in its place another handi of the same size and make. The ablutions and devotions of the Brahmin being now over, he came to the shop in wet clothes, reciting holy texts of the Vedas. 
Putting on dry clothes, he wrote on a sheet of paper the name of Durga one hundred and eight times in red ink, after which he broke his fast on the mudki his handi had already given him. Thus refreshed, and being about to resume his journey homewards, he called for his handi, which the innkeeper delivered to him, adding, There, sir, is your handi. It is just where you put it. No one has touched it. The Brahmin, without suspecting anything, took up the handi and proceeded on his journey. And as he walked on, he congratulated himself on his singular good fortune. How agreeably, he thought within himself, will my poor wife be surprised. How greedily the children will devour the mudki of heaven's own manufacture. I shall soon become rich and lift up my head with the best of them all. The pains of travelling were considerably alleviated by these joyful anticipations. He reached his house, and calling his wife and children, said, Look now at what I have brought. This handy that you see is an unfailing source of wealth and contentment. You will see what a stream of the finest mudki will flow from it when I turn it upside down. The Brahmin's good wife, hearing of mudki falling from the handi unceasingly, thought that her husband must have gone mad, and she was confirmed in her opinion. When she found that nothing fell from the vessel, though it was turned upside down again and again. Overwhelmed with grief, the Brahmin concluded that the innkeeper must have played a trick with him. He must have stolen the handi Durga had given him, and put a common one in its stead. He went back the next day to the innkeeper and charged him with having changed his handi. The innkeeper put on a fit of anger, expressed surprise at the Brahmin's impudence in charging him with theft, and drove him away from his shop. The Brahmin then bethought himself of an interview with the goddess Durga, who had given him the handi, and accordingly went to the forest where he had met her. Siva and Durga again favored the Brahmin with an interview. Durga said, So you have lost the handi I gave you. Here is another. Take it and make good use of it. The Brahmin, elated with joy, made obeisance to the divine couple, took up the vessel, and went on his way. He had not gone far when he turned it upside down and shook it in order to see whether any mudki would fall from it. Horror of horrors! Instead of sweetmeats, about a score of demons of gigantic size and grim visage jumped out of the handi and began to belabor the astonished Brahmin with blows, fisticuffs, and kicks. He had the presence of mind to turn up the handi and to cover it when the demons forthwith disappeared. He concluded that this new handi had been given him only for the punishment of the innkeeper. He accordingly went to the innkeeper, gave him the new handi in charge, begged of him carefully to keep it till he returned from his ablutions and prayers. The innkeeper, delighted with this second godsend, called his wife and children and said, This is another handi brought here by the same Brahmin who brought the handi of Mudki. This time I hope it is not Mudki, but Sandisa. Come be ready with baskets and vessels, and I'll turn the handi upside down and shake it. This was no sooner done than scores of fierce demons started up, who caught hold of the innkeeper and his family and belabored them mercilessly. They also began upsetting the shop, and would have completely destroyed it, if the victims had not besought the Brahmin, who had by this time returned from his ablutions, to show mercy to them and send away the terrible demons. The Brahmin acceded to the innkeeper's request. He dismissed the demons by shutting up the vessel. He got the former handi, and with the two handis went to his native village. On reaching home, the Brahmin shut the door of his house, turned the mudki handi upside down, and shook it. The result was an unceasing stream of the finest mudki that any confectioner in the country could produce. The man, his wife, and their children devoured the sweetmeat to their heart's content. All the available earthen pots and pans of the house were filled with it, and the Brahmin resolved the next day to turn confectioner to open a shop in his house and sell mudki. On the very day the shop was opened, the whole village came to the Brahmin's house to buy the wonderful mudki. 
They had never seen such mudki in their life. It was so sweet, so white, so large, so luscious. No confectioner in the village or any town in the country had ever manufactured anything like it. The reputation of the Brahmin's mudki extended, in a few days, beyond the bounds of the village, and people came from remote parts to purchase it. Cartloads of the sweetmeat were sold every day, and the Brahmin, in a short time, became very rich. He built a large brick house and lived like a nobleman of the land. Once, however, his property was about to go to wreck and ruin. His children one day, by mistake, shook the wrong handy, when a large number of demons dropped down and caught hold of the Brahmin's wife and children and were striking them mercilessly, when happily the Brahmin came into the house and turned up the handi. In order to prevent a similar catastrophe in future, the Brahmin shut up the demon handi in a private room to which his children had no access. Pure and uninterrupted prosperity, however, is not the lot of mortals, and though the demon handi was put aside, what security was there that an accident might not befall the mudki handi? One day, during the absence of the Brahmin and his wife from the house, the children decided upon shaking the handi, but as each of them wished to enjoy the pleasure of shaking it, there was a general struggle to get it, and in the melee the handi fell to the ground and broke. It is needless to say that the Brahmin, when on reaching home, he heard of the disaster, became inexpressibly sad. The children were, of course, well cudgelled, but no flogging of children could replace the magical handi. After some days, he again went to the forest and offered many a prayer for Durga's favor. At last, Siva and Durga again appeared to him and heard how the handi had been broken. Durga gave him another handi, accompanied with the following caution. Brahman, take care of this handi. If you again break it or lose it, I'll not give you another. The Brahman made obeisance, and went away to his house at one stretch, without halting anywhere. On reaching home, he shut the door of his house, called his wife to him, turned the handi upside down, and began to shake it. They were only expecting Mudki to drop from it. But instead of Mudki, a perennial stream of beautiful Sandisa issued from it. And such Sandisa! No confectioner of Burabasa had ever made its like. It was more the food of gods than of men. The Brahmin forthwith set up a shop for selling Sandisa, the fame of which soon drew crowds of customers from all parts of the country. At all festivals, at all marriage feasts, at all funeral celebrations, at all pujas, no one bought any other sandisa than the brahmins every day and every hour many jars of gigantic size filled with the delicious sweetmeat were sent to all parts of the country the wealth of the brahmin excited the envy of the zemindar of the village who having heard that the sandisa was not manufactured but dropped from a handi devised a plan for getting possession of the miraculous vessel at the celebration of his son's marriage he held a great feast, to which were invited hundreds of people. As many mountain loads of Sandisu would be required for the purpose, the Zemindar proposed that the Brahmin should bring the magical handi to the house in which the feast was held. The Brahmin at first refused to take it there, but as the Zemindar insisted on it being carried to his own house, he reluctantly consented to take it there. After many Himalayas of Sandisa had been shaken out, the handi was taken possession of by the Zemindar, and the Brahmin was insulted and driven out of the house. The Brahmin, without giving vent to anger in the least, quietly went to his house, and taking the demon handi in his hand, came back to the door of the Zemindar's house. He turned the handi upside down and shook it on which a hundred demons started up as from the vasty deep and enacted a scene which it is impossible to describe. The hundreds of guests that had been bidden to the feast were caught hold of by their unearthly visitants and beaten. The women were dragged by their hair from the zenana and dashed about amongst the men, while the big and burly zemindar was driven about from room to room like a bale of cotton. 
If the demons had been allowed to do their will only for a few minutes longer, all the men would have been killed, and the very house razed to the ground. The Zemadar fell prostrate at the feet of the Brahmin and begged for mercy. Mercy was shown him, and the demons were removed. After that, the Brahmin was no more disturbed by the Zemindar or by anyone else, and he lived many years in great happiness and enjoyment. Thus my story ended. The Natiya thorn withereth, etc. End of the Indigent Brahmin by Lal Bahari Day Mortgagee by R. Austin Freeman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Missing Mortgagee, Part 1. Early in the afternoon of a warm, humid November day, Thomas Elton sauntered dejectedly along the Margate Esplanade, casting an eye now on the slate colored sea with its pall of slate colored sky and now on the harbor, where the ebb tide was just beginning to expose the mud. It was a dreary prospect, and Elton varied it by observing the few fishermen and fewer promenaders who walked foot to foot with their distorted reflections in the wet pavement. And thus it was that his eye fell on a smartly dressed man who had just stepped into a shelter to light a cigar. A contemporary joker has classified the Scotsmen who abound in South Africa into two groups, those, namely, who hail from Scotland, and those who hail from Palestine. Now something in the aspect of the broad back that was presented to his view, in that of the curly black hair and the exuberant raiment, suggested to Eldon a Scotsman of the latter type. In fact, there was a suspicion of disagreeable familiarity in the figure which caused him to watch it and slacken his pace. The man backed out of the shelter, diffusing azure clouds, and drawing an envelope from his pocket, read something that was written on it. Then he turned quickly, and so did Elton, but not quickly enough, for he was a solitary figure on that bold and empty expanse, and the other had seen him at the first glance. Elton walked away slowly, but he had not gone a dozen paces when he felt the anticipated slap on the shoulder, and heard the too well-remembered voice, "'Blow me if I don't believe you are trying to cut me, Tom,' it said." Elton looked around with ill-assumed surprise. "'Hello, Gordon. Who the deuce would have thought of seeing you here?' Gordon laughed thickly. "'Not you, apparently. And you don't look as pleased as you might now you have seen me. Whereas I'm delighted to see you, and especially to see that things are going so well with you.' "'What do you mean?' asked Elton. "'Taking your winter holiday by the sea like a blooming duke.' "'I'm not taking a holiday,' said Elton. I was so worn out that I had to have some sort of change, but I've brought my work down with me, and I put in a full seven hours every day. That's right, said Gordon. Consider the ant. Nothing like steady industry. I brought my work down with me, too, a little slip of paper with a stamp on it. You know the article, Tom. I know, but it isn't due till tomorrow, is it? Isn't it, by gum? It's due this very day, the 20th of the month. That's why I'm here, knowing your little weakness in the matter of dates, and having a small item to collect in Canterbury, I thought I'd just come on and save you the useless expense that results from forgetfulness. Elton understood the hint, and his face grew rigid. I can't do it, Gordon, I really can't. Haven't got it and shan't have it till I'm paid for the batch of drawings that I'm working on now. Oh, but what a pity, exclaimed Gordon, taking the cigar from his thick, pouting lips, to utter the exclamation. Here you are, bluing your capital on seaside jaunts and reducing your income at a stroke by a clear four pounds a year. How do you make that out, demanded Elton. Tut, tut, protested Gordon. What an unbusinesslike chap you are. Here's a little matter of twenty pounds, quarter's interest. If it's paid now, it's twenty. If it isn't, it goes on to the principal, and there's another four pounds a year to be paid. Why don't you try to be more economical, dear boy? Elton looked askance at the vampire by his side, at the plump, blue-shaven cheeks, the thick black eyebrows, the drooping nose, and the full red lips that embraced the cigar. And though he was a mild-tempered man, 
he felt that he could have battered that sensual, complacent face out of all human likeness, with something uncommonly like enjoyment. But of these thoughts nothing appeared in his reply, for a man cannot afford to say all he would wish to a creditor who could ruin him with a word. "'You mustn't be too hard on me, Gordon,' said he. "'Give me a little time. I'm doing all I can, you know. I earn every penny that I am able, and I have kept my insurance paid up regularly. I shall be paid for this work in a week or two, and then we can settle up.' Gordon made no immediate reply, and the two men walked slowly eastward, a curiously ill-assorted pair, the one prosperous, jaunty, overdressed, the other pale and dejected, and with his well-brushed but napless clothes, his patched boots, and shiny-brimmed hat, the very type of decent struggling poverty. They had just passed the pier, and were coming to the base of the jetty when Gordon next spoke. "'Can't we get off this beastly wet pavement?' he asked, looking down at his dainty and highly polished boots. "'What's it like down on the sands?' "'Oh, it's very good walking,' said Elton. "'Between here and Fornus, and probably drier than the pavement.' "'Then,' said Gordon, "'I vote we go down.' and accordingly they descended the sloping way beyond the jetty. The stretch of sand left by the retiring tide was as smooth and firm as a sheet of asphalt, and far more pleasant to walk upon. "'We seem to have the place all to ourselves,' remarked Gordon, "'with the exception of some half-dozen dukes like yourself.' As he spoke, he cast a cunning black eye furtively at the dejected man by his side, considering how much further squeezing was possible, and what would be the probable product of a further squeeze. But he quickly averted his gaze as Elton turned on him with a look eloquent of contempt and dislike. There was another pause, for Elton made no reply to the last observation. Then Gordon changed over from one arm to the other the heavy fur overcoat that he was carrying. "'Needn't have brought this beastly thing,' he remarked, "'if I'd known it was going to be so warm.' "'Shall I carry it for you a little way?' asked the naturally polite Elton. "'If you would, dear boy,' replied Gordon, "'it's difficult to manage an overcoat, an umbrella, and cigar all at once.' He handed over the coat with a sigh of relief, and having straightened himself and expanded his chest, remarked, "'I suppose you're beginning to do quite well now, Tom?' Elton shook his head gloomily. "'No,' he answered. "'It's the same old grind.' "'But surely they're beginning to recognize your talents by this time,' said Gordon, with a persuasive air of a counsel. "'That's just the trouble,' said Elton. "'You see, I haven't any, and they recognized the fact long ago. "'I'm just a journeyman, and journeyman's work is what I get given to me. "'You mean to say that the editors don't appreciate talent when they see it?' "'I don't know about that,' said Elton. "'But they're most infernally appreciative of the lack of it.' "'Gordon blew out a great cloud of smoke, and raised his eyebrows reflectively. "'Do you think,' he said after a brief pause, "'you'd give him a fair chance?' I've seen some of your stuff. It's bloomin' prim, you know. Why don't you try something more lively? More skittish, you know, old chap. Something with legs, you know, and high shoes. See what I mean, old chap? High with good full calves and not too fat in the ankle. That ought to fetch him, don't you think so? Elton scowled. You're thinking of the drawings in Hold Me Up, he said scornfully. But you're mistaken. Any fool can draw a champagne bottle upside down with a French shoe at the end of it. "'No doubt, dear boy,' said Gordon. "'But I expect that sort of fool knows what pays.' "'A good many fools seem to know that much,' retorted Elton, "'and then he was sorry he had spoken, "'for Gordon was not really an amiable man, "'and the expression of his face suggested "'that he had read a personal application into the rejoinder. "'So once more the two men walked on in silence. "'Presently their footsteps led them "'to the margin of the weed-covered rocks, "'and here, from under a high heap of bladder rack, a large green shore crab rushed out and menaced them with uplifted claws. Gordon stopped and stared at the creature with cockney surprise, prodding with his umbrella and speculating aloud as to whether it was good to eat. The crab, as if alarmed at the suggestion, suddenly darted away and began to scuttle over the green-clad rocks, finally plunging into a large deep pool. Gordon pursued it, hobbling awkwardly over the slippery rocks until he came to the edge of the pool over which he stooped, raking inquisitively among the weedy fringe with his umbrella. He was so much interested in his quarry that he had failed to allow for the slippery surface on which he stood. The result was disastrous. Of a sudden, one foot began to slide forward, 
and when he tried to recover his balance, was instantly followed by the other. For a moment he struggled frantically to regain his footing, executing a sort of splashing, stamping dance on the margin. Then the circling seabirds were startled by a yell of terror, an ivory-handled umbrella flew across the rocks, and Mr. Solomon Gordon took a complete header into the deepest part of the pool. What the crab thought of it, history does not relate. What Mr. Gordon thought of it is as unsuitable for publication, but as he rose, like an extremely up-to-date merman, he expressed his sentiments with a welt of adjectives that brought Elton in the verge of hysteria. "'It's a good job you brought your overcoat, after all,' Elton remarked, for the sake of saying something, and thereby avoiding the risk of exploding into undeniable laughter. The Hebrew made no reply, at least no reply that lends itself to verbatim report but staggered toward the hospitable overcoat, holding out his dripping arms. Having inducted him into the garment and buttoned him up, Elton hurried off to recover the umbrella, and, incidentally, to indulge himself in a broad grin, and having secured it, angled with it for the smart billycock which was floating across the pool. It was surprising what a change the last minute or two had wrought. The position of the two men were now quite reversed. Despite his shabby clothing, Elton seemed to walk quite jauntily as compared with his shuddering companion, who trotted by his side with short, miserable steps. Shrinking into the uttermost depths of his enveloping coat, like an alarmed winkle into its shell, puffing out his cheeks, and anathematizing the universe in general, as well as his chattering teeth would let him. For some time they hurried along towards the slope by the jetty, without exchanging any further remarks. Then suddenly Elton asked, "'What are you going to do, Gordon?' You can't travel like that. Can't you lend me a change? asked Gordon. Elton reflected. He had another suit, his best suit, which he had been careful to preserve in good condition for use on those occasions when a decent appearance was indispensable. He looked askance at the man by his side, and something told him that the treasured suit would probably receive less careful treatment than it was accustomed to. Still, the man couldn't be allowed to go about in wet clothes. I've got a spare suit, he said. It isn't quite up to your style, and may not be much of a fit, but I dare say you'll be able to put up with it for an hour or two. It'll be dry, anyhow, mumbled Gordon, so we won't trouble about the style. How far is it to your rooms? The plural number was superfluous. Elton's room was in a little ancient flint house at the bottom of a narrow close in the old quarter of the town. You reached it without any formal preliminaries of bell or knocker by simply letting yourself in by a street door, crossing a tiny room, opening the door of what looked like a narrow cupboard, and squeezing up a diminutive flight of stairs, which was unexpectedly exposed to view. By following this procedure, the two men reached a small bed-sitting room, that is to say, it was a bedroom, but by sitting down on the bed, you converted it into a sitting room. Gordon puffed out his cheeks and looked round distastefully. You might just ring for some hot water, old chappie, he said. Elton laughed aloud. Ring, he exclaimed. Ring what? Your clothes are the only things that are likely to get wrung. Well, then sing out for the servant, said Gordon. Elton laughed again. My dear fellow, said he, we don't go in for servants. There's only my landlady, and she never comes up here. She's too fat to get up the stairs, and besides, she's got a game leg. I look after my room myself. You'll be all right if you have a good rub down. Gordon groaned and emerged reluctantly from the depths of his overcoat, while Elton brought forth from the chest of drawers the promised suit and the necessary undergarments. One of these latter Gordon held up with a sour smile, as he regarded it with extreme disfavor. "'I shouldn't think,' said he. "'You need to have been at the trouble of marking them so plainly. No one's likely to want to run away with them.' The undergarments certainly contrasted very unfavorably with the delicate garments which he was peeling off, except in one respect, they were dry, and that had to console him for the ignominious change. The clothes fitted quite fairly, notwithstanding the difference between the figures of the two men. For while Gordon was a slender man grown fat, Elton was a broad man grown thin, which, in a way, averaged their superficial area. Elton watched the process of investment and noted the caution with which Gordon smuggled the various articles from his own pockets into those of the borrowed garments, without exposing them to view, heard the jingle of money, saw the sumptuous gold watch and massive chain transplanted, and noted with interest the large leather wallet 
that came forth from the breast pocket of the wet coat. He got a better view of this from the fact that Gordon himself examined it narrowly, and even opened it to expect the contents. Luckily that wasn't an ordinary pocket book, he remarked. If it had been, your receipt would have got wet, and so would one or two other little articles that wouldn't have been improved by salt water. And, talking of the receipt, Tom, shall I hand it over now? You can if you like, said Elton, but as I told you, I haven't got the money. On which Gordon muttered, pity, pity and thrust the wallet into his, or rather, Elton's breast pocket. A few minutes later, the two men came out together into the gathering darkness, and as they walked slowly up the close, Elton asked, Are you going up to town tonight, Gordon? How can I, was the reply. I can't go without my clothes. No, I shall run over to Broadstairs. A client of mine keeps a boarding house there. He'll have to put me up for the night, and if you can get my clothes cleaned and dried, I can come over for them tomorrow. These arrangements having been settled, the two men adjourned, at Gordon's suggestion, for tea at one of the restaurants on the front, and after that, again at Gordon's suggestion, they set forth together along the cliff path that leads to Broadstairs by way of Kingsgate. "'You may as well walk with me into Broadstairs,' said Gordon. "'I'll stand you the fare back by rail.' And to this Elton had agreed, not because he was desirous of the other man's company, but because he still had some lingering hopes of being able to adjust the little difficulty respecting the installment. He did not, however, open the subject at once. Profoundly as he loathed and despised the human spider whom necessity made his associate for the moment, he exerted himself to keep up a current of amusing conversation. It was not easy, for Gordon, like most men whose attention is focused on the mere requirement of money, looked with a dull eye on the ordinary aspects of life. His tastes in art he had already hinted at, and his other tastes lay much in the same direction. Money first, for its own sake, and then those coarser and more primitive gratifications that it was capable of purchasing. This was the horizon that bounded Mr. Solomon Gordon's field of vision. Nevertheless, they were well on their way before Elton alluded to the subject that was uppermost in both their minds. "'Look here, Gordon,' he said at length. "'Can't you manage to give me a bit more time to pay up this installment?' It doesn't seem quite fair to keep sending up the principal like this. Well, dear boy, replied Gordon, it's your own fault, you know. If you would only bear the dates in mind, it wouldn't happen. But, pleaded Elton, just consider what I'm paying you. I originally borrowed fifty pounds from you, and now I'm paying you eight pounds a year in addition to the insurance premium. That's close on a hundred a year, just about half what I managed to earn by slaving like a nigger. If you stick it up any further, you won't leave me with enough to keep body and soul together, which really means that I shan't be able to pay you at all. There was a brief pause. Then Gordon said dryly, You talk about not paying, dear boy, as if you had forgotten about that promissory note. Elton set his teeth. His temper was rising rapidly, but he restrained himself. I should have a pretty poor memory if I had, he replied, considering the number of reminders you've given me. You've needed them, Tom, said the other. I've never met a slacker man in keeping to his engagements. At this, Elton lost his temper completely. That's a damned lie, he exclaimed. And you know it, you infernal, dirty, blood-sucking parasite. Gordon stopped dead. Look here, my friend, said he. None of that. If I have any of your damned sauce, I'll give you a sound good hammering. The deuce you will, said Elton, whose fingers were itching, not for the first time, to take some recompense for all that he had suffered from the insatiable usurer. Nothing's preventing you now, you know, but I fancy cent per cent is more in your line than fighting. Give me any more sauce and you'll see, said Gordon. Very well, was the quiet rejoinder. I have great pleasure in informing you that you are a human maw worm. How does that suit you? For reply, Gordon threw down his overcoat and umbrella on the grass at the side of the path, and deliberately slapped Elton on the cheek. The reply followed instantly in the form of a smart left-hander, which took effect on the bridge of the Hebrew's rather prominent nose. Thus the battle was fairly started, and it proceeded with all the fury of accumulated hatred on the one side, and sharp physical pain on the other. What little science there was appertained to Elton, in spite of which, however, he had to give way to his heavier, better nourished, and more excitable opponent. Regardless of the punishment he received, the infuriated Jew rushed at him, and by sheer weight of onslaught drove him backward across the little green. 
Suddenly Elton, who knew the place by daylight, called out in alarm. Look out, Gordon, get back, you fool! But Gordon, blind with fury, and taking this as an attempt to escape, only pressed him harder. Elton's pugnacity died out instantly in mortal terror. He shouted out another warning, and as Gordon still pressed him, battered furiously, he did the only thing that was possible. He dropped to the ground. And then, in the twinkling of an eye, came the catastrophe. Borne forward by his own momentum, Gordon stumbled over Elton's prostrate body, staggered forward a few paces, and fell. Elton heard a muffled groan that faded quickly, and mingled with the sound of falling earth and stones. He sprang to his feet, and looked round and saw that he was alone. For some moments he was dazed by the suddenness of the awful thing that had happened. He crept timorously towards the unseen edge of the cliff and listened. There was no sound save the distant surge of the breakers, and the scream of an invisible seabird. It was useless to try to look over. Near as he was, he could not, even now, distinguish the edge of the cliff from the dark beach below. Suddenly he bethought him of a narrow cutting that led down from the cliff to the shore. Quickly crossing the green, and mechanically stooping to pick up Gordon's overcoat and umbrella, he made his way to the head of the cutting and ran down the rough chalk roadway. At the bottom he turned to the right, and striding hurriedly over the smooth sand, peered into the darkness at the foot of the cliff. Soon there loomed up against that murky sky the shadowy form of the little headland on which he and Gordon had stood, and almost at the same moment there grew out of the darkness of the beach a darker spot amidst a constellation of smaller spots of white. As he drew nearer, the dark spot took shape, a horrid shape with sprawling limbs and a head strangely awry. He stepped forward trembling and spoke the name that the thing had borne. He grasped the flabby hand and laid his fingers on the wrist, but it only told him the same tale as did that strangely misplaced head. The body lay face downwards, and he had not the courage to turn it over. But that his enemy was dead, he had not the faintest doubt. He stood up amidst the litter of fallen chalk and earth, and looked down at the horrible, motionless thing, wondering numbly and vaguely what he should do. Should he go and seek assistance? The answer to that came in another question. How came that body to be lying on the beach? and what answer should he give to the inevitable question? And swiftly there grew up in his mind, born of the horror of the thing that was, a yet greater horror of the thing that might be. A minute later, a panic-stricken man stole with stealthy swiftness up the narrow cutting and set forth towards Margate, stopping anon to listen and stealing away off the path into the darkness to enter the town by the inland road. Little sleep was there that night for Elton in his room in the old Flint house. The dead man's clothes, which greeted him on his arrival, hanging limply on the towel horse where he had left them, haunted him through the night. In the darkness, the sour smell of damp cloth assailed him with an endless reminder of their presence, and after each brief doze, he would start up in alarm and hastily light his candle, only to throw its flickering light on those dank, drowned-looking vestments. His thoughts, half-controlled, as night thoughts are, flitted erratically from the unhappy past to the unstable present, and thence to the incalculable future. Once he lighted the candle specially to look at his watch to see if the tide had yet crept up to that solitary figure on the beach, nor could he rest again until the time of high water was well past. And all through these wanderings of his thoughts there came, recurring like a horrible refrain, the question of what would happen when the body was found. Could he be connected with it, and if so, would he be charged with murder? At last he fell asleep and slumbered on until the landlady thumped at the staircase door to announce that she had brought his breakfast. As soon as he was dressed, he went out. Not, however, until he had stuffed Gordon's still damp clothes and boots, the cumbrous overcoat, and the smart billycock hat into his trunk, and put the umbrella into the darkest corner of the cupboard. Not that anyone ever came up to the room, but that already he was possessed with the uneasy secretiveness of the criminal. He went straight down to the beach, with what purpose he could hardly have said, but an irresistible impulse drove him thither to see if it was there. He went down by the jetty and struck out eastward over the smooth sand, looking about him with dreadful expectation for some small crowd or hurrying messenger. From the foot of the cliffs, over the rocks to the distant line of breakers, his eye roved with eager dread, and still he hurried eastward. 
always drawing nearer to the place that he feared to look on. As he left the town behind, so he left behind the one or two idlers on the beach, and when he turned Fornus Point, he lost sight of the last of them, and went forward alone. It was less than half an hour later that the fatal headland opened out beyond whiteness. Not a soul had he met along that solitary beach, and though once or twice he had started at the sight of some mass of driftwood or heap of seaweed, the dreadful thing that he was seeking had not yet appeared. He passed the opening of the cutting and approached the headland, breathing fast and looking about him fearfully. Already he could see the larger clumps of chalk that had fallen, and looking up, he saw a clean white patch at the summit of the cliff. But still there was no sign of the corpse. He walked on more slowly now, considering whether it could have drifted out to sea, or whether he should find it in the next bay. And then, rounding the headland, he came in sight of a black hole at the cliff foot, the entrance to a deep cave. He approached yet more slowly, sweeping his eye round the little bay, and looking apprehensively at the cavity before him. Suppose the thing should have washed in there. It was quite possible. Many things did wash into that cave, for he had once visited it, and had been astonished at the quantity of seaweed and jetsam that had accumulated within it. But it was an uncomfortable thought. It would be doubly horrible to meet the awful thing in the dim twilight of the cavern. And yet, the black archway seemed to draw him on, step by step, until he stood at the portal and looked in. It was an eerie place, chilly and damp, the clammy walls and roofs stained green and purple and black with encrusted lichens. At one time, Elton had been told it used to be haunted by smugglers, and then communicated with an underground passage, and the old smuggler's lookout still remained. A narrow tunnel high up the cliff, looking out into Kingsgate Bay, and even some vestiges of the rude steps that led up to the lookout platform could still be traced and were not impossible to climb. Indeed, Elton had, at his last visit, climbed to the platform and looked out through the spy hole. He recalled the circumstance now, as he stood peering nervously into the darkness and straining his eyes to see what jetsam the ocean had brought since then. At first he could see nothing but the smooth sand near the opening. Then, as his eyes grew more accustomed to the gloom, he could make out the great heap of seaweed on the floor of the cave. Insensibly he crept in, with his eyes riveted on the weedy mass, and, as he left the daylight behind him, so did the twilight of the cave grow clearer. His feet left the firm sand and trod the springy mass of weed, and, in the silence of the cave, he could now hear plainly the rain-like patter of the leaping sand hoppers. He stopped for a moment to listen to the unfamiliar sound, and still the gloom of the cave grew lighter to his more accustomed eyes. And then in an instant he saw it. From a heap of weed a few paces ahead projected a boot, his own boot. He recognized the patch on the sole, and at the sight his heart seemed to stand still. Though he had somehow expected to find it here, its presence seemed to strike him with a greater shock of horror from that very circumstance. He was standing stock still, gazing with fearful fascination at the boot and the swelling mound of weed, when suddenly there struck upon his ear the voice of a woman singing. He started violently. His first impulse was to run out of the cave, but a moment's reflection told him what madness this would be. And then the voice drew nearer, and there broke out the high, rippling laughter of a child. Elton looked in terror at the bright opening of the cavern's mouth, expecting every moment to see it frame a group of figures. If that happened, he was lost, for he would have been seen actually with the body. Suddenly he bethought him of the spy hole and the platform, both of which were invisible from the entrance. In turning, he ran quickly over the sodden weed till he came to the remains of the steps. Climbing hurriedly up these, he reached the platform, which was enclosed in a large niche, just as the reverberating sound of voices told him as the strangers were within the mouth of the cave. He strained his ears to catch what they were saying, and to make out if they were entering farther. It was a child's voice that he had first heard, and very weird were the hollow echoes of the thin treble that were flung back from the rugged walls. But he could not hear what the child had said. The woman's voice, however, was quite distinct, and the words seemed significant in more senses than one. "'No, dear,' it said. "'You had better not go in.' It's cold and damp. 
Come out into the sunshine. Elton breathed more freely. But the woman was more right than she knew. It was cold and damp, that thing under the black tangle of weed. Better far to be out in the sunshine. He himself was already longing to escape from the chill and gloom of the cavern. But he could not escape yet. Innocent as he actually was, his position was that of a murderer. He must wait until the coast was clear, and then steal out to hurry away unobserved. He crept up cautiously to the short tunnel and peered out through the opening across the bay, and then his heart sank. Below him, on the sunny beach, a small party of visitors had established themselves just within view of the mouth of the cave, and even as he looked, a man approached from the wooden stairway down the cliff, carrying a couple of deck chairs. So for the present, his escape was hopelessly cut off. He went back to the platform, and sat down to wait for his release, and as he sat, his thoughts went back once more to the thing that lay under the weed. How long would it lie there undiscovered? And what would happen when it was found? What was there to connect him with it? Of course, there was his name on the clothing, but there was nothing incriminating in that, if he had only the courage to give information at once. But it was too late to think of that now. Besides, it suddenly flashed upon him there was the receipt in the wallet. That receipt mentioned him by name and referred to a loan. Obviously, its suggestion was most sinister, coupled with his silence. It was a deadly item of evidence against him, but no sooner had he realized the appalling significance of this document than he also realized that it was still within his reach. Why should he leave it there to be brought in evidence, in false evidence too, against him? Slowly he rose, and creeping down the tunnel once more looked out. The people were sitting quietly in their chairs, the man was reading, and the child was digging in the sand. Elton looked across the bay to make sure that no other person was approaching, and then hastily climbing down the steps, walked across the great bed of weed, driving an army of sandhoppers before him. He shuddered at the thought of what he was going to do, and the clammy chill of the cave seemed to settle on him in a cold sweat. He came through the little mound from which the boot projected, and began, shudderingly and with faltering hand, to lift the slimy, tangled weed. As he drew aside the first bunch, he gave a gasp of horror and quickly replaced it. The body was lying on its back, and as he lifted the weed, he had uncovered, not the face, for the thing had no face. It had struck either the cliff or a stone upon the beach, and, but there is no need to go into particulars, it had no face. When he had recovered a little, Elton groped shudderingly among the weed until he found the breast pocket from which he quickly drew out the wallet, now clammy, sodden, and loathsome. He was rising with it in his hand when an apparition, seen through the opening of the cave, arrested his movement as if he had been suddenly turned into stone. A man, apparently a fisherman or sailor, was sauntering past some thirty yards from the mouth of the cave, and at his heels trotted a mongrel dog. The dog stopped, and lifting his nose, seemed to sniff the air and then he began to walk slowly and suspiciously toward the cave. The man sauntered on, and soon passed out of view, but the dog still came on towards the cave, stopping now and again with upraised nose. The catastrophe seemed inevitable. But just at that moment, the man's voice rose, loud and angry, evidently calling the dog. The animal hesitated, looking wistfully from his master to the cave, but when the summons was repeated, he turned reluctantly and trotted away. Elton stood up and took a deep breath. The chilly sweat was running down his face. His heart was thumping and his knees trembled, so that he could hardly get back to the platform. What hideous peril had he escaped, and how narrowly! For there he had stood, and had the man entered he would have been caught in the very act of stealing the incriminating document from the body. For that matter, he was little better off now, with a dead man's property on his person, and he resolved instantly to take out and destroy the receipt and put back the wallet. But this was easier thought of than done. The receipt was soaked with seawater, and refused utterly to light when he applied a match to it. In the end, he tore it up into little fragments and deliberately swallowed them one by one. But to restore the wallet was more than he was equal to just now. He would wait until the people had gone home to lunch, and then he would thrust it under the weed as he ran past. 
so he sat down again and once more took up the endless thread of his thoughts. The receipt was gone now, and with it the immediate suggestion of motive. There remained only the clothes with their two legible markings. They certainly connected him with the body, but they offered no proof of his presence at the catastrophe. And then suddenly another most startling idea occurred to him. Who could identify the body, the body that had no face? There was the wallet, it was true, but he could take that away with him, and there was a ring on the finger and some articles in the pockets which might be identified. But, a voice seemed to whisper to him, these things were removable too, and if he removed them, what then? Why, then the body was that of Thomas Elton, a friendless, poverty-stricken artist about whom no one would trouble to ask any questions. He pondered on this new situation profoundly. It offered him a choice of alternatives. Either he might choose the imminent risk of being hanged for a murder that he had not committed, or he might surrender his identity forever and move away to a new environment. He smiled faintly. His identity. What might that be worth to barter against his life? Only yesterday he would gladly have surrendered it as the bare price of emancipation from the vampire who had fastened on to him. He thrust the wallet into his pocket and buttoned his coat. Thomas Elton was dead, and that other man, as yet unnamed, should go forth, as the woman had said, into the sunshine. Part 2. Related by Christopher Jervis, M.D. From various causes, the insurance business that passed through Thorndyke's hands had, of late, considerably increased. The number of societies which regularly employed him had grown larger, and since the remarkable case of Percival Bland, the Griffin had made it a routine practice to send all inquest cases to us for report. Compiler's Note The Percival Bland case actually follows directly after this one in the book. Clearly the order of stories has been transposed. It was in reference to one of these latter that Mr. Stalker, a senior member of the staff of that office, called on us one afternoon in December, when he had laid his bag on the table and settled himself comfortably before the fire, he opened the business without preamble. "'I've brought you another inquest case,' said he. "'A rather queer one, quite interesting from your point of view. As far as we can see, it has no particular interest for us, excepting that it does rather look as if our examining medical officer had been a little casual.' "'What is the special interest of the case from our point of view?' asked Thorndyke. "'I'll just give you a sketch of it,' said Stalker, "'and I think you will agree that it's a case after your own heart. "'On the 24th of last month, "'some men who were collecting seaweed to use as manure "'discovered in a cave at Kingsgate, "'in the Isle of Thanet, the body of a man, "'lying under a mass of accumulated weed. "'As the tide was rising, "'they put the body into their cart "'and conveyed it to Margate, "'where, of course, an inquest was held.' and the following facts were elicited. The body was that of a man named Thomas Elton. It was identified by the name marks on the clothing, by the visiting cards, and a couple of letters which were found in the pockets. From the address on the letters, it was seen that Elton had been staying in Margate, and on inquiry at that address, it was learned from the old woman who left the lodgings that he had been missing about four days. The landlady was taken to the mortuary, and at once identified the body as that of her lodger. It remained only to decide how the body came into the cave, and this did not seem to present much difficulty, for the neck had been broken by a tremendous blow, which had practically destroyed the face, and there were distinct evidences of a breaking away of a portion of the top of the cliff, only a few yards from the position of the cave. There was apparently no doubt that Elton had fallen sheer from the top of the overhanging cliff onto the beach. Now one would suppose, with the evidence of this fall of about a hundred and fifty feet, the smashed face and broken neck, there was not much room for doubt as to the cause of death. I think you will agree with me, Dr. Jervis. Well, certainly, I replied. It must be admitted that a broken neck is a condition that tends to shorten life. Quite so, agreed Stalker. But our friend, the local coroner, is a gentleman who takes nothing for granted, a very Thomas Didymus who apparently agrees with Dr. Thorndyke, that if there is no post-mortem, there is no inquest. So he ordered a post-mortem, which would have appeared to me in an absurdly unnecessary proceeding, 
and I think that even you will agree with me, Dr. Thorndyke. But Thorndyke shook his head. Not at all, said he. It might, for instance, be much more easy to push a drugged or poisoned man over a cliff than to put over that same man in his normal state. The appearance of violent accident is an excellent mask for the less obvious forms of murder. That's perfectly true, said Stalker, and I suppose that is what the coroner thought. At any rate, he had the post-mortem made, and the result was most curious, for it was found on opening the body that the deceased had suffered from a small thoracic aneurysm which had burst. Now, as the aneurysm must obviously have burst during life, it leaves the cause of death, so I understand, uncertain. At any rate, the medical witness was unable to say whether the deceased fell over the cliff in consequence of the bursting of the aneurysm, or burst the aneurysm in consequence of falling over the cliff. Of course, it doesn't matter to us which way the thing happened. The only question which interests us is whether a comparatively recently insured man ought to have had an aneurysm at all. Have you paid the claim? asked Thorndyke. No, certainly not. We never pay a claim until we have had your report. But as a matter of fact, there is another circumstance that is causing delay. It seems that Elton had mortgaged his policy to a money lender named Gordon, and it is by him that the claim has been made, or rather, by a clerk of his named Hyams. Now we have had a good many dealings with this man Gordon, and hitherto he has always acted in person, and as he is a somewhat slippery gentleman, we have thought it desirable to have the claim actually signed by him and that is the difficulty, for it seems that Mr. Gordon is abroad, and his whereabouts unknown to Hyams, so as we certainly can take Hyams' receipt for payment, the matter is in abeyance until Hyams can communicate with his principal. And now I must be running away. I have brought you, as you will see, all the papers, including the policy and the mortgage deed. As soon as he was gone, Thorndyke gathered up the bundle of papers and sorted them out in what he apparently considered the order of their importance. First he glanced quickly through the proposal form, and then took up the copy of the coroner's depositions. The medical evidence, he remarked, is very full and complete. Both the coroner and the doctor seem to know their business. Seeing that the man apparently fell over a cliff, said I, the medical evidence would not seem to be of first importance. It would seem to be more to the point to ascertain how he came to fall over. That's quite true, replied Thorndyke, and yet this report contains some rather curious matter. The deceased had an aneurysm of the arch. That was probably rather recent, but he also had some slight old-standing aortic disease with full compensatory hypertrophy. He also has a nearly complete set of false teeth. Now, doesn't it strike you, Jervis, as rather odd that a man who has passed only five years ago as a first-class life should, in that short interval, have become actually uninsurable? Yes, it certainly does look, said I, as if the fellow had had rather bad luck. What does the proposal form say? I took the document up and ran my eyes over it. On Thorndyke's advice, medical examiners for the Griffin were instructed to make a somewhat fuller report than is usual in some companies. In this case, the ordinary answers to questions set forth that the heart was perfectly healthy and the teeth rather exceptionally good, and then, in the summary at the end, the examiner remarked, The proposer seems to be a completely sound and healthy man. He presents no physical defects whatever, with the exception of a bony ankylosis of the first joint of the third finger of the left hand, which he states to have been due to an injury. Thorndyke looked up quickly. Which finger did you say? he asked. The third finger of the left hand, I replied. Thorndyke looked thoughtfully at the paper that he was reading. It's very singular, said he, for I see that the Margate doctor states that the deceased wore a signet ring on the third finger of his left hand. Now, of course, you couldn't get a ring onto a finger with bony ankylosis of the joint. He must have mistaken the finger, said I, or else the insurance examiner did. That is quite possible, Thorndyke replied. But doesn't it strike you as very singular that, whereas the insurance examiner mentions the ankylosis, which was of no importance from an insurance point of view, the very careful man who made the post-mortem 
should not have mentioned it, though, owing to the unrecognizable condition of the face, it was of vital importance for the purpose of identification? I admitted that it was very singular indeed, and we then resumed our study of the respective papers. But presently I noticed that Thorndyke had laid the report upon his knee and was gazing speculatively into the fire. I gather, said I, that my learned friend finds some matter of interest in this case. For reply, he handed me the bundle of papers, recommending me to look through them. Thank you, said I, rejecting them firmly, but I think I can trust you to have picked out all the plums. Thorndyke smiled indulgently. They're not plums, Jervis, said he. They're only currants, but they make quite a substantial little heap. I disposed myself in a receptive attitude, somewhat after the fashion of the juvenile pelican, and he continued, If we take the small and unimpressive items and add them together, you will see that quite a considerable sum of discrepancy results, thus. In 1903, Thomas Elton, age 31, had a sound set of teeth. In 1908, at the age of 36, he was more than half toothless. Again, at the age of 31, his heart was perfectly healthy. At the age of 36, he had an old aortic disease with fully established compensation and an aneurysm that was probably due to it. When he was examined, he had a noticeable incurable malformation. No such malformation is mentioned in connection with the body. He appears to have fallen over a cliff, and he had also burst an aneurysm. Now the bursting of the aneurysm must obviously have occurred during life, but it would occasion practically instantaneous death. Therefore, if the fall was accidental, the rupture must have occurred either as he stood at the edge of the cliff, as he was in the act of falling, or on striking the beach. At the place where he apparently fell, the footpath is some thirty yards distance from the edge of the cliff. It is not known how he came to that spot, or whether he was alone at the time. Someone is claiming five hundred pounds as the immediate result of his death. There, you see, Jervis, are seven propositions, none of them extremely striking, but rather suggestive when taken together. You seem, said I, to suggest a doubt as to the identity of the body. I do, he replied. The identity was not clearly established. You don't think the clothing and the visiting cards conclusive? They're not parts of the body, he replied. Of course, substitution is highly improbable, but it is not impossible. And the old woman, I suggested, but he interrupted me. My dear Jervis, he exclaimed, I'm surprised at you. How many times has it happened, within our knowledge, that women have identified the bodies of total strangers as those of their husbands, fathers, or brothers? The thing happens almost every year. As to this old woman, she saw a body with an unrecognizable face dressed in the clothes of her missing lodger. Of course, it was the clothes that she identified. I suppose it was, I agreed. And then I said, you seem to suggest the possibility of foul play. Well, he replied, if you consider those seven points, you will agree with me that they present a cumulative discrepancy which it is impossible to ignore. The whole significance of the case turns on the question of identity. For, if this was not the body of Thomas Elton, it would appear to have been deliberately prepared to counterfeit that body, and such deliberate preparation would manifestly imply an attempt to conceal the identity of some other body. Then, he continued after a pause, there is this deed. It looks quite regular and is correctly stamped, but it seems to me that the surface of the paper is slightly altered in one or two places, and if one holds the document up to the light, the paper looks a little more transparent in those places. He examined the documents for a few seconds with his pocket lens, and then passing lens and document to me, he said, Have a look at it, Jervis, and tell me what you think. I scrutinized the paper closely, taking it over to the window to get a better light, and to me also the paper appeared to be changed in certain places. Are we agreed as to the position of the altered places? Thorndyke asked when I announced the fact. I only see three patches, I answered, two corresponding to the name Thomas Elton, and the third to one of the figures in the policy number. Exactly, said Thorndyke, and the significance is obvious. If the paper has really been altered, it means that some other name has been erased 
and Elton substituted, by which arrangement, of course, the correctly dated stamp would be secured, and this, the alteration of an old document, is the only form of forgery that is possible with a dated impressed stamp. Wouldn't it be rather a stroke of luck, I asked, for a forger to happen to have in his possession a document needing only these two alterations? I see nothing remarkable in it, Thorndyke replied. A money lender would have a number of documents of this kind in hand, and you observe that he was not bound down to any particular date. Any date within a year or so of the issue of the policy would answer his purpose. This document is, in fact, dated, as you will see, about six months after the issue of the policy. I suppose, said I, that you will draw Stockler's attention to this matter. He will have to be informed, of course, Thorndyke replied, but I think it would be interesting in the first place to call on Mr. Himes. You will have noticed that there are some rather mysterious features in this case, and Mr. Himes' conduct, especially if this document should turn out to be really a forgery, suggests that he may have some special information on the subject. He glanced at his watch, and after a few moments' reflection added, I don't see why we shouldn't make our little ceremonial call at once. But it will be a delicate business, for we have mighty little to go upon. Are you coming with me? If I had had any doubts, Thorndyke's last remark disposed of them, for the interview promised to be quite a sporting event. Mr. Hyams was presumably not quite newly hatched, and Thorndyke, who utterly despised bluff of any kind, and whose exact mind refused either to act or speak one hair's breadth beyond his knowledge, was admittedly in somewhat of a fog. The meeting promised to be really entertaining. Mr. Hyams was discovered, as the playwrights have it, in a small office at the top of a high building in Queen Victoria Street. He was a small gentleman of sallow and greasy aspect, with heavy eyebrows and a still heavier nose. "'Are you Mr. Gordon?' Thorndyke suavely inquired as we entered. Mr. Hyam seemed to experience a momentary doubt on the subject, but finally decided that he was not. "'But perhaps,' he added brightly, "'I can do your business for you as well.' "'I dare say you can,' Thorndyke agreed significantly on which we were conducted into an inner den, where I noticed Thorndyke's eye rest for an instant on a large iron safe. Now, said Mr. Hyams, shutting the door ostentatiously, what can I do for you? I want you, Thorndyke replied, to answer one or two questions with reference to the claim made by you on the Griffin office in respect of Thomas Elton. Mr. Hyams' manner underwent a sudden change. He began rapidly to turn over papers, and opened and shut the drawers of his desk, with an air of restless preoccupation. "'Did the Griffin people send you here?' he demanded brusquely. "'They did not specially instruct me to call on you,' replied Thorndyke. "'Then,' said Hyams, bouncing out of his chair, "'I can't let you occupy my time. I'm not here to answer conundrums from Tom, Dick, or Harry.' Thorndyke rose from his chair. Then I am to understand, he said, with unruffled suavity, that you would prefer me to communicate with the directors and leave them to take any necessary action. This gave Mr. Hyams pause. What action do you refer to, he asked, and who are you? Thorndyke produced a card and laid it on the table. Mr. Hyams had apparently seen the name before, for he suddenly grew rather pale and very serious. "'What is the nature of the questions you wish to ask?' he inquired. "'They refer to this claim,' replied Thorndyke. "'The first question is, where is Mr. Gordon?' "'I don't know,' said Hyams. "'Where do you think he is?' asked Thorndyke. "'I don't think at all,' replied Hyams, turning a shade paler and looking everywhere but at Thorndyke. "'Very well,' said the latter. "'Then the next question is, are you satisfied that this claim is really payable?' I shouldn't have made it if it hadn't been, replied Hyams. Quite so, said Thorndyke. And the third question is, are you satisfied that the mortgage deed was executed as it purports to have been? I can't say anything about that, replied Hyams, who was growing every moment paler and more fidgety. It was done before my time. Thank you, said Thorndyke, 
you will of course understand why I am making these inquiries. I don't, said Hyams. Then, said Thorndyke, perhaps I had better explain. We are dealing, you observe, Mr. Hyams, with the case of a man who has met with violent death under somewhat mysterious circumstances. We are dealing also with another man who has disappeared, leaving his affairs to take care of themselves, and with a claim put forward by a third party on behalf of the one man in respect of the other. When I say that the dead man has been imperfectly identified, and that the document supporting the claim presents certain peculiarities, you will see that the matter calls for further inquiry. There was an appreciable interval of silence. Mr. Hyams had turned a tallowy white, and looked furtively about the room, as if anxious to avoid the stony gaze that my colleague had fixed on him. "'Can you give us no assistance?' Thorndyke inquired at length. Mr. Hyams chewed a pinholder ravenously as he considered the question. At length he burst out in an agitated voice. "'Look here, sir. If I tell you what I know, will you treat the information as confidential?' "'I can't agree to that, Mr. Hyams,' replied Thorndyke. "'It might amount to compounding a felony. "'But you will be wiser to tell me what you know. "'The document is a side issue, which my clients may never raise. "'My own concern is with the death of this man.' "'Hyams looked distinctly relieved. "'If that's so,' said he, "'I'll tell you all I know, which is precious little, "'and which just amounts to this. Two days after Elton was killed,' Someone came to this office in my absence and opened the safe. I discovered the fact the next morning. Someone had been to the safe and rummaged over all the papers. It wasn't Gordon, because he knew where to find everything, and it wasn't an ordinary thief, because no cash or valuables had been taken. In fact, the only thing that I missed was a promissory note drawn by Elton. You didn't miss a mortgage deed? suggested Thorndyke and Hyams, having snatched a little further refreshment from the pinholder, said he did not. And the policy, suggested Thorndyke, was apparently not taken? No, replied Hyams, but it was looked for. Three bundles of policies had been untied, but this one happened to be in a drawer of my desk, and I had the only key. And what do you infer from this visit? Thorndyke asked. Well, replied Hyams, the safe was opened with keys, and they were Gordon's keys, or at any rate they weren't mine, and the person who opened it wasn't Gordon, and the things that were taken, at least the thing I mean, chiefly, concerned Elton. Naturally I smelt a rat, and when I read a finding of the body I smelt a fox. And have you formed any opinion about the body that was found? Yes, I have, he replied. My opinion is that it was Gordon's body, that Gordon had been putting the screw on Elton, and Elton had just pitched him over the cliff and gone down and changed clothes with the body. Of course, that's only my opinion. I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hyams was not wrong. An exhumation, consequent on Thorndyke's challenge of the identity of the deceased, showed that the body was that of Solomon Gordon. A hundred pounds reward was offered for information as to Elton's whereabouts, but no one ever earned it. A letter bearing the postmark of Marseilles and addressed by the missing man to Thorndyke, gave a plausible account of Gordon's death, which was represented as having occurred accidentally at the moment when Gordon chanced to be wearing a suit of Elton's clothes. Of course, this account may have been correct, or again, it may have been false. But whether it was true or false, Elton from that moment vanished from our ken, and has never since been heard of. End of The Missing Mortgagee By R. Austin Freeman Read by Alan Winteroud. Audio. Dot boomcoach. Dot com. Nine of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9. Containing Further Particulars Concerning the Pleasant Old Gentleman and His Hopeful Pupils It was late next morning when Oliver awoke from a sound, long sleep. 
there was no other person in the room but the old jew who was boiling some coffee in a saucepan for breakfast and whistling softly to himself as he stirred it round and round with an iron spoon he would stop every now and then to listen when there was the least noise below and when he had satisfied himself he would go on whistling and stirring again as before although oliver had roused himself from sleep he was not thoroughly awake there is a drowsy state between sleeping and waking when you dream more in five minutes with your eyes half open and yourself half conscious of everything that is passing around you than you would in five nights with your eyes fast closed and your senses wrapped in perfect unconsciousness at such time a mortal knows just enough of what his mind is doing to form some glimmering conception of its mighty powers its bounding from earth and spurning time and space when freed from the restraint of its corporeal associate oliver was precisely in this condition he saw the jew with his half-closed eyes heard his low whistling and recognized the sound of the spoon grating against the saucepan's sides and yet the self-same senses were mentally engaged at the same time in busy action with almost everybody he had ever known when the coffee was done the jew drew the saucepan to the hob standing then in an irresolute attitude for a few minutes as if he did not know how to employ himself he turned around and looked at oliver and called him by his name he did not answer and was to all appearances asleep after satisfying himself upon this head the jew stepped gently to the door which he fastened he then drew forth as it seemed to oliver from some trap in the floor a small box which he placed carefully on the table his eyes glistened as he raised the lid and looked in dragging an old chair to the table he sat down and took from it a magnificent gold watch sparkling with jewels aha said the jew shrugging up his shoulders and distorting every feature with a hideous grin clever dogs clever dogs staunch to the last never told the old parson where they were never poached upon old Fagin, and why should they it wouldn't have loosened the knot or kept the drop up a minute longer no 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 fine fellows fine fellows with these and other muttered reflections of the like nature the jew once more deposited the watch in its place of safety at least half a dozen more were severally drawn forth from the same box and surveyed with equal pleasure besides rings brooches bracelets and other articles of jewellery of such magnificent materials and costly workmanship that oliver had no idea even of their names having replaced these trinkets the jew took out another so small that it lay in the palm of his hand there seemed to be some very minute inscription on it for the jew laid it flat upon the table and shading it with his hand pored over it long and earnestly at length he put it down as if despairing of success and leaning back in his chair muttered what a fine thing capital punishment is dead men never repent dead men never bring awkward stories to light ah it's a fine thing for the trade five of em strung up in a row and none left to play booty or turn white-livered as the jew uttered these words his bright dark eyes which had been staring vacantly before him fell on oliver's face the boy's eyes were fixed on his in mute curiosity 
and although the recognition was only for an instant, for the briefest space of time that can possibly be conceived, it was enough to show the old man that he had been observed. He closed the lid of the box with a loud crash, and laying his hand on a bread knife which was on the table, started furiously up. He trembled very much, though, for even in his terror, Oliver could see that the knife quivered in the air. "'What's that?' said the Jew. "'What do you watch me for? Why are you awake? What have you seen? Speak out, boy! Quick! Quick for your life!' "'I wasn't able to sleep any longer, sir,' replied Oliver meekly. "'I'm very sorry if I have disturbed you, sir.' "'You were not awake an hour ago,' said the Jew, scowling furiously on the boy. "'No, no, indeed,' replied Oliver. "'Are you sure?' cried the Jew, with a still fiercer look than before, and a threatening attitude. "'Upon my word, I was not, sir,' replied Oliver earnestly. "'I was not, indeed, sir.' "'Tush, tush, my dear!' said the Jew, abruptly resuming his old manner, and playing with the knife a little before he laid it down, as if to induce the belief that he had caught it up in mere sport. Of course I knew that, my dear. I only tried to frighten you. You're a brave boy. Ha <laughs> ha! You're a brave boy, Oliver. The Jew rubbed his hands with a chuckle, but glanced uneasily at the box, notwithstanding. Did you see any of these pretty things, my dear? said the Jew, laying his hand upon it after a short pause. Yes, sir, replied Oliver. Ah, said the Jew, turning rather pale. Dear, dear mine, Oliver, my little property, all I have to live on in my old age. The folks called me a miser, my dear. Only a miser, that's all. Oliver thought the old gentleman must be a decided miser to live in such a dirty place, with so many watches, but thinking that Perhaps his fondness for the Dodger and the other boys cost him a good deal of money. He cast only a deferential look at the Jew, and asked if he might get up. Certainly, my dear, certainly, replied the old gentleman. Stay, there's a pitcher of water in the corner by the door. Bring it here, and I'll give you a basin to wash in, my dear. Oliver got up, walked across the room, and stooped for an instant to raise the pitcher. When he turned his head, the box was gone. He had scarcely washed himself, and made everything tidy by emptying the basin out of the window agreeably to the Jew's directions, when the Dodger returned, accompanied by a very sprightly young friend whom Oliver had seen smoking on the previous night, and who was now formally introduced to him as Charlie Bates. The four sat down to breakfast on the coffee and some hot rolls and ham which the Dodger had brought home in the crown of his hat. Well, said the Jew, glancing slyly at Oliver and addressing himself to the Dodger, I hope you've been at work this morning, my dears. Hard, replied the Dodger. As nails, added Charlie Bates. Good boys, good boys, said the Jew. What have you got, Dodger? A couple of pocket books, replied that young gentleman. Lined? inquired the Jew with eagerness. Pretty well, replied the Dodger, producing two pocket books, one green and the other red. Not so heavy as they might be, said the Jew, after looking at the insides carefully but very neat and nicely made. Ingenious workman, ain't he, Oliver? Very indeed, sir, said Oliver, at which Mr. Charles Bates laughed uproariously, very much to the amazement of Oliver, who saw nothing to laugh at in anything that had passed. And what have you got, my dear? said Fagin to Charlie Bates. Wipes! replied Master Bates, at the same time producing four pocket handkerchiefs. Well, said the Jew, inspecting them closely, they're good ones, very. You haven't marked them well, though, Charlie, so the marks shall be picked out with a needle. 
and we'll teach Oliver how to do it. Shall us, Oliver, eh? <laughs> if you please, sir, said Oliver, you'd like to be able to make pocket handkerchiefs as easy as Charlie Bates, wouldn't you, my dear? said the Jew. Very much indeed, if you'll teach me, sir, replied Oliver. Master Bates saw something so exquisitely ludicrous in this reply that he burst into another laugh, which laugh, meeting the coffee he was drinking and carrying it down some wrong channel, very nearly terminated in his premature suffocation. He is so jolly green, said Charlie when he recovered, as an apology to the company for his unpolite behavior. The Dodger said nothing. But he smoothed Oliver's hair over his eyes, and said he'd know better by and by, upon which the old gentleman, observing Oliver's color mounting, changed the subject by asking whether there had been much of a crowd at the execution that morning. This made him wonder more and more, for it was plain from the replies of the two boys that they had both been there, and Oliver naturally wondered how they could possibly have found time to be so very industrious. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman, placing a snuff-box in one pocket of his trousers, and a note-case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket with a guard-chain around his neck, and sticking a mock diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tight round him, and putting his spectacle case and his handkerchief in his pockets, trotted up and down the room with a stick in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets any hour in the day. Sometimes he stopped at the fireplace, and sometimes at the door, making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop windows. At such times he would look constantly around him, for fear of thieves, and would keep slapping all his pockets in turn, to see that he hadn't lost anything, in such a very funny and natural manner that Oliver laughed till the tears ran down his face. All this time the two boys followed him closely about, getting out of his sight so nimbly every time he turned around that it was impossible to follow their motions. At last the dodger, trod upon his toes, or ran upon his boot accidentally, while Charlie Bates stumbled up against him behind, and in that moment they took from him, with the most extraordinary rapidity, snuff-box, note-case, watch-guard, chain, shirt-pin, pocket-handkerchief, even the spectacle-case. If the old gentleman felt a hand in any of his pockets, he cried out where it was, and then the game began all over again. When this game had been played a great many times, a couple of young ladies called to see the young gentleman, one of whom was named Bet, and the other Nancy. They wore a great deal of hair, not very neatly turned up behind, and were rather untidy about the shoes and stockings. They were not exactly pretty, perhaps, but they had a great deal of color in their faces, and looked quite stout and hearty. Being remarkably free and agreeable in their manners, Oliver thought them very nice girls indeed, and there is no doubt they were. The visitors stopped a long time. Spirits were produced, in consequence of one of the young ladies complaining of a coldness in her inside, and the conversation took a very convivial and improving turn. At length, Charlie Bates expressed his opinion that it was time to pad the hoof. This, it occurred to Oliver, must be French for going out, for directly afterwards the Dodger and Charlie and the two young ladies went away together, having been kindly furnished by the amiable old Jew with money to spend. "'Dear, my dear,' said Fagin, "'that's a pleasant life, isn't it? They have gone out for the day.' "'Have they done work, sir?' inquired Oliver. Yes, said the Jew, that is, unless they should unexpectedly come across any when they are out, and they won't neglect it if they do, my dear, depend upon it. 
Make him your models, my dear. Make him your models. Tapping the fire shovel on the hearth to add force to his words. Do everything they bid you. Take their advice in all matters, especially the Dodgers, my dear. He'll be a great man himself, and will make you one too, if you take pattern by him. Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear? said the Jew, stopping short. Yes, sir, said Oliver. See if you can take it out, without my feeling it, as you saw them do, when we were at play this morning. Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand, as he had seen the dodger hold it, and drew the handkerchief lightly out with the other. Is it gone? cried the Jew. Here it is, sir, said Oliver, showing it in his hand. You're a clever boy, my dear, said the playful old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head approvingly. I never saw such a sharper lad. Here's a shilling for you. If you go on in this way, you'll be the greatest man of all time. Now come here, and I'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs. Oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man. But, thinking that the Jew, being so much his senior, must know best, he followed him quietly to the table, and was soon deeply involved in his new study. End of chapter 9 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Read by Adam Shopkeeper by Marjorie Verner Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Matt Perard the Pawn Shop Keeper by Marjorie Verner Reed I am an old man, and life has long since lost the glamour it once held for me. The thrills of youth are no more, novelty is a forgotten word, and things that once would have made my heart leap now leave me cold. Old age, indeed, is in itself a punishment for the follies of youth, and sad is it to await alone the coming of death without some loved face near. For one by one the friends of bygone days have dropped by the roadside, and I have been left alone to follow my weary way. Happy they who die while still young, and do not know the solitude of a lonely old man. Day after day, as I sit behind my counter, or warm my old hands by the cheerful blaze of the fire, do customers come to me to buy something, or perhaps to sell some loved relic, in order that they may live. All of them faces, strange and new. They look at me as if to say, Why this one dried leaf of another year left on this tree? I, and why am I left? Why among these young green leaves am I the only withered one? Why were no companions left to cheer me? But these are questions I cannot answer, for I know not the ways of God. As I sit here, musing over the past, faces I have known come back to me, and I love to wonder what fate held in store for them, as, advancing, the filmy mists of their futures were slowly lifted until the last veil was drawn back, and the story of their lives was told. The snow is falling, and covering in white the grim rows of houses opposite my little shop. The streets are deserted, save by a few hurrying pedestrians, and some merry school children going down to the frozen river for an hour's skating before dusk. And I am here before the fire, dreaming and waiting for yesterday, brought me an experience very different from my usual monotonous life. Was it all some phantom? It must be. The Miriam that I have longed for all these years was not here yesterday, did not sit in this very chair. It must have been a vision, the mere fancy of an old man's mind. For how many times in sleep has not the same dream come to me as a whispered message from another world, 
from her grave even, and on awakening I always seemed to know that her journey through life was at an end. But no, it was not a phantom, for here is the necklace. Then it was not a dream. Fate has really sent her to me so we can cheer each other in these the last hours of our earthly lives. But will she come back today as she promised, or will she depart again, this time for good, so that I shall see her no more until I have crossed the river of death? Oh, Miriam, come to me. I need you more now than ever before. Come, I am waiting with outstretched arms. Yes, she is coming. I see the yet distant form of the one I love. She is approaching, coming ever nearer. Miriam, what happiness we shall yet have together in the dusk of our lives. What pleasant hours here by the fire. Death, kindly death, come now to me. She passed by my shop and turned the corner and went toward the station. Her heart, then, is still cold as stone. It was the money I paid her for the necklace that bought her ticket to another town. End of The Pawn Shop Keeper by Marjorie Verner Reed A Respectable Woman by Kate Chopin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Respectable Woman by Kate Chopin Mrs. Baroda was a little provoked to learn that her husband expected his friend, Governail, up to spend a week or two on the plantation. They had entertained a good deal during the winter, much of the time had also been passed in New Orleans in various forms of mild dissipation. She was looking forward to a period of unbroken rest now, and undisturbed tete-a-tete -tete with her husband, when he informed her that Governail was coming up to stay a week or two. This was a man she had heard much of, but never seen. He had been her husband's college friend, was now a journalist, and in no sense a society man or a man about town, which were, perhaps, some of the reasons she had never met him but she had unconsciously formed an image of him in her mind. She pictured him tall, slim, cynical, with eyeglasses, and his hands in his pockets, and she did not like him. Gouvernail was slim enough, but he wasn't very tall nor very cynical. Neither did he wear eyeglasses nor carry his hands in his pockets, and she rather liked him when he first presented himself. But why she liked him she could not explain satisfactorily to herself when she partly attempted to do so. She could discover in him none of those brilliant and promising traits which Gaston, her husband, had often assured her that he possessed. On the contrary, he sat rather mute and receptive before her chatty eagerness to make him feel at home, and in face of Gaston's frank and wordy hospitality. His manner was as courteous toward her as the most exacting woman could require, but he made no direct appeal to her approval or even esteem. Once settled at the plantation, he seemed to like to sit upon the wide portico in the shade of one of the big Corinthian pillars, smoking his cigar lazily and listening attentively to Gaston's experience as a sugar planter. This is what I call living, he would utter with deep satisfaction, as the air that swept across the sugar field caressed him with its warm and scented velvety touch. It pleased him also to get on familiar terms with the big dogs that came about him, rubbing themselves sociably against his legs. He did not care to fish, and displayed no eagerness to go out and kill grosbecks when Gaston proposed doing so. Governail's personality puzzled Mrs. Baroda, but she liked him. Indeed, he was a lovable, inoffensive fellow. After a few days, when she could understand him no better than at first, she gave over being puzzled and remained piqued. In this mood, she left her husband and her guest, for the most part, alone together. Then, finding that Governail took no manner of exception to her action, she imposed her society upon him, accompanying him in his idle strolls to the mill and walks along the bature. She persistently sought to penetrate the reserve in which he had unconsciously enveloped himself. "'When is he going, your friend?' she one day asked her husband. "'For my part he tires me frightfully.' not for a week yet, dear. I can't understand. He gives you no trouble. No, 
I should like him better if he did. If he were more like others, and I had to plan somewhat for his comfort and enjoyment. Gaston took his wife's pretty face between his hands and looked tenderly and laughingly into her troubled eyes. They were making a bit of toilet sociably together in Mrs. Baroda's dressing room. "'You are full of surprises, ma belle,' he said to her. "'Even I can never count upon how you are going to act under given conditions.' He kissed her and turned to fasten his cravat before the mirror. "'Here you are,' he went on, "'taking poor Governail seriously and making a commotion over him, the last thing he would desire or expect.' "'Commotion?' she hotly resented. "'Nonsense! How can you say such a thing? Commotion, indeed! But you know you said he was clever.' "'So he is. But the poor fellow is run down by overwork now. That's why I asked him here to take a rest.' "'You used to say he was a man of ideas,' she retorted, unconciliated. "'I expected him to be interesting, at least. I'm going to the city in the morning to have my spring gowns fitted. Let me know when Mr. Governail is gone. I shall be at my Aunt Octavie's.' That night she went and sat alone upon a bench that stood beneath a live oak tree at the edge of the gravel walk. She had never known her thoughts or her intentions to be so confused. She could gather nothing from them but the feeling of a distinct necessity to quit her home in the morning. Mrs. Baroda heard footsteps crunching the gravel, but could discern in the darkness only the approaching red point of a lighted cigar. She knew it was Governail, for her husband did not smoke. She hoped to remain unnoticed, but her white gown revealed her to him. He threw away a cigar and seated himself upon the bench beside her, without a suspicion that she might object to his presence. "'Your husband told me to bring this to you, Mrs. Baroda,' he said, handing her a filmy white scarf, with which she sometimes enveloped her head and shoulders. She accepted the scarf from him with a murmur of thanks and let it lie in her lap. He made some commonplace observation upon the baneful effect of the night air at the season. Then, as his gaze reached out into the darkness, he murmured half to himself, "'Night of south winds, night of the large few stars.' still nodding night. She made no reply to this apostrophe to the night, which indeed was not addressed to her. Governail was in no sense a diffident man, for he was not a self-conscious one. His periods of reserve were not constitutional, but the result of moods. Sitting there beside Mrs. Baroda, his silence melted for the time. He talked freely and intimately in a low, hesitating drawl that was not unpleasant to hear. He talked of the old college days when he and Gaston had been a good deal to each other, of the days of keen and blind ambitions and large intentions. Now there was left with him, at least, a philosophic acquiescence to the existing order, only a desire to be permitted to exist, with now and then a little whiff of genuine life, such as he was breathing now. Her mind only vaguely grasped what he was saying. Her physical being was, for the moment, predominant. She was not thinking of his words, only drinking in the tones of his voice. She wanted to reach out her hand in the darkness and touch him with the sensitive tips of her fingers upon the face or the lips. She wanted to draw close to him and whisper against his cheek. She did not care what, as she might have done if she had not been a respectable woman. The stronger the impulse grew to bring herself near him, the further, in fact, did she draw away from him. As soon as she could do so without an appearance of too great rudeness, she rose and left him there alone. Before she reached the house, Governail had lighted a fresh cigar and ended his apostrophe to the night. Mrs. Baroda was greatly tempted that night to tell her husband, who was also her friend, of this folly that had seized her. But she did not yield to the temptation. Beside being a respectable woman, she was a very sensible one, and she knew there are some battles in life which a human being must fight alone. When Gaston arose in the morning, his wife had already departed. She had taken an early morning train to the city. She did not return till Governail was gone from under her roof. There was some talk of having him back during the summer that followed, that is, Gaston greatly desired it, but this desire yielded to his wife's strenuous opposition. However, before the year ended, she proposed, wholly from herself, to have Governail visit them again. Her husband was surprised and delighted with the suggestion coming from her. I am glad, cher ami, to know that you have finally overcome your dislike for him. Truly, he did not deserve it. 
Oh, she told him laughingly, after pressing a long, tender kiss upon his lips. I have overcome everything. You will see. This time I shall be very nice to him. End of A Respectable Woman by Kate Chopin Read by Lois Hill Information by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A guard came to the prison shoe shop where Jimmy Valentine was assiduously stitching uppers and escorted him to the front office. There the warden handed Jimmy his pardon, which had been signed that morning by the governor. Jimmy took it in a tired sort of way. He had served nearly ten months of a four-year sentence. He had expected to stay only about three months at the longest. When a man with as many friends on the outside as Jimmy Valentine had is received in the stir, it is hardly worthwhile to cut his hair. "'Now, Valentine,' said the warden, "'you'll go out in the morning. Brace up and make a man of yourself. You're not a bad fellow at heart. Stop cracking safes and live straight.' Me? said Jimmy in surprise. Why, I never cracked a safe in my life. Oh, no, laughed the warden. Of course not. Let's see now. How was it you happened to get sent up on that Springfield job? Was it because you wouldn't prove an alibi for fear of compromising somebody in extremely high-toned society? Or was it merely a case of a mean old jury that had it in for you? It's always one or the other with you, innocent victims. Me? said Jimmy, still blankly virtuous. Why, Warden, I never was in Springfield in my life. Take him back, Cronin, said the Warden, and fix him up without going close. Unlock him at seven in the morning and let him come to the bullpen. Better think over my advice, Valentine. At a quarter past seven on the next morning, Jimmy stood in the Warden's outer office. He had on a suit of the villainously fitting, ready-made clothes, and a pair of the stiff, squeaky shoes that the state furnishes to its discharged compulsory guests. The clerk handed him a railroad ticket and the five-dollar bill with which the law expected him to rehabilitate himself into good citizenship and prosperity. The warden gave him a cigar and shook hands. Valentine 9762 was chronicled on the books, pardoned by Governor, and Mr. James Valentine walked out into the sunshine. Disregarding the song of the birds, the waving green trees, and the smell of the flowers, Jimmy headed straight for a restaurant. There he tasted the first sweet joys of liberty in the shape of a broiled chicken and a bottle of white wine, followed by a cigar a great better than the one the warden had given him. From there he proceeded leisurely to the depot. He tossed a quarter into the hat of a blind man sitting by the door and boarded his train. Three hours set him down in a little town near the state line. He went into the café of one Mike Dolan and shook hands with Mike, who was alone behind the bar. "'Sorry we couldn't make it sooner, Jimmy be by said Mike. "'But we had that protest from Springfield to walk against, and the governor nearly balked. "'Feeling all right?' "'Fine,' said Jimmy. "'Got my key?' He got his key and went upstairs, unlocking the door of a room at the rear. Everything was just as he had left it. There on the floor was still Ben Price's collar button that had been torn from that eminent detective's shirt band when they had overpowered Jimmy to arrest him. Pulling out from the wall a folding bed, Jimmy slid back a panel in the wall and dragged out a dust-covered suitcase. He opened this and gazed fondly at the finest set of burglar's tools in the East. It was a complete set made of specially tempered steel, the latest designs in drills, punches, braces, and bits, jimmies, clamps, and augers, with two or three novelties invented by Jimmy himself, in which he took pride. Over nine hundred dollars they had cost him to have made at blank, a place where they make such things for the profession. In half an hour Jimmy went downstairs and through the cafe. He was now dressed in tasteful and well-fitting clothes, and carried his dusted and clean suitcase in his hand. "'Got anything on?' asked Mike Dolan, genially. "'Me?' said Jimmy, in a puzzled tone. "'I don't understand. 
I'm representing the New York Amalgamated Short Snap Biscuit Cracker and Frazzled Wheat Company. This statement delighted Mike to such an extent that Jimmy had to take a seltzer and milk on the spot. He never touched hard drinks. A week after the release of Valentine 9762, there was a neat job of safe burglary done in Richmond, Indiana, with no clue to the author. A scant $800 was all that was secured. Two weeks after that, a patented, improved, burglar-proof safe in Logansport was opened like a cheese to the tune of $1,500 currency, securities and silver untouched. That began to interest the rogue catchers. Then an old-fashioned bank safe in Jefferson City became active and threw out of its crater an eruption of banknotes amounting to $5,000. The losses were now high enough to bring the matter up to Ben Price's class of work. By comparing notes, a remarkable similarity in the methods of the burglaries was noticed. Ben Price investigated the scenes of the robberies and was heard to remark, That's Dandy Jim Valentine's autograph. He's resumed business. Look at that combination knob, jerked out as easy as pulling up a radish in wet weather. He's got the only clamps that can do it. And look how clean those tumblers were punched out. Jimmy never has to drill but one hole. Yes, I guess I want Mr. Valentine. He'll do his bit next time without any short time or clemency foolishness. Ben Price knew Jimmy's habits. He had learned them while working up the Springfield case. Long jumps, quick getaways, no Confederates, and a taste for good society. These ways had helped Mr. Valentine to become noted as a successful dodger of retribution. It was given out that Ben Price had taken up the trail of the elusive cracksman, and other people with burglar-proof safes felt more at ease. One afternoon, Jimmy Valentine in his suitcase climbed out of the mail hack in Elmore, a little town five miles off the railroad down in the blackjack country of Arkansas. Jimmy, looking like an athletic young senior just home from college, went down the board sidewalk toward the hotel. A young lady crossed the street, passed him at the corner, and entered a door over which was the sign, The Elmore Bank. Jimmy Valentine looked into her eyes, forgot what he was, and became another man. She lowered her eyes and colored slightly. Young men of Jimmy's style and looks were scarce in Elmore. Jimmy collared a boy that was loafing on the steps of the bank as if he were one of the stockholders and began to ask him questions about the town, feeding him dimes at intervals. By and by the young lady came out, looking royally unconscious of the young man with the suitcase, and went her way. "'Isn't that young lady Polly Simpson?' asked Jimmy with specious guile. "'Nah,' said the boy. "'She's Annabelle Adams. Her pa owns this bank. What'd you come to Elmore for? Is that a gold watch chain? I'm going to get a bulldog.' Got any more dimes? Jimmy went to the Planters Hotel, registered as Ralph D. Spencer, and engaged a room. He leaned on the desk and declared his platform to the clerk. He said he had come to Elmore to look for a location to go into business. How was the shoe business now in the town? He had thought of the shoe business. Was there an opening? The clerk was impressed by the clothes and manner of Jimmy. He himself was something of a pattern of fashion to the thinly gilded youth of Elmore, but now he perceived his shortcomings. While trying to figure out Jimmy's manner of tying his four in hand, he cordially gave information. Yes, there ought to be a good opening in the shoe line. There wasn't an exclusive shoe store in the place. The dry goods and general stores handled them. Business in all lines was fairly good. Hope Mr. Spencer would decide to locate in Elmore. He would find it a pleasant town to live in, and the people very sociable. Mr. Spencer thought he would stop over in the town a few days and look over the situation. No, the clerk needn't call the boy. He would hurry up his suitcase himself. It was rather heavy. Mr. Ralph Spencer, the phoenix that arose from Jimmy Valentine's ashes, ashes left by the flame of a sudden and alterative attack of love, remained in Elmore and prospered. He opened a shoe store and secured a good run of trade. Socially, he was also a success and made many friends, and he accomplished the wish of his heart. He met Miss Annabel Adams, 
and became more and more captivated by her charms. At the end of a year, the situation of Mr. Ralph Spencer was this. He had won the respect of the community, his shoe store was flourishing, and he and Annabel were engaged to be married in two weeks. Mr. Adams, the typical plodding country banker, approved of Spencer. Annabel's pride in him almost equaled her affection. He was as much at home in the family of Mr. Adams and that of Annabel's married sister as if he were already a member. One day Jimmy sat down in his room and wrote this letter, which he mailed to the safe address of one of his old friends in St. Louis. Dear old pal, I want you to be at Sullivan's place in Little Rock next Wednesday night at nine o'clock. I want you to wind up some little matters for me, and also I want to make you a present of my kit of tools. I know you'll be glad to get them. You couldn't duplicate the lot for a thousand dollars. Say, Billy, I've quit the old business a year ago. I've got a nice store. I'm making an honest living, and I'm going to marry the finest girl on earth two weeks from now. It's the only life, Billy, the straight one. I wouldn't touch a dollar of another man's money now for a million. After I get married, I'm going to sell out and go west, where there won't be so much danger of having old scores brought up against me. I tell you, Billy, she's an angel. She believes in me, and I wouldn't do another crooked thing for the whole world. Be sure to be at Sully's for I must see you. I'll bring along the tools with me. Your old friend, Jimmy. On the Monday night after Jimmy wrote this letter, Ben Price jogged unobtrusively into Elmore in a livery buggy. He lounged about town in his quiet way until he found out what he wanted to know. From the drugstore across the street from Spencer's shoe store, he got a good look at Ralph D. Spencer. "'Going to marry the banker's daughter, are you, Jimmy?' said Ben to himself, softly. "'Well, I don't know.' The next morning Jimmy took breakfast at the Adamses. He was going to Little Rock that day to order his wedding suit and buy something nice for Annabelle. That would be the first time he had left town since he came to Elmore. It had been more than a year now since those last professional jobs, and he thought he could safely venture out. After breakfast, quite a family party went downtown together. Mr. Adams, Annabelle, Jimmy, and Annabelle's married sister with her two little girls, aged five and nine. They came by the hotel where Jimmy still boarded, and he ran up to his room and brought along his suitcase. Then they went on to the bank. There stood Jimmy's horse and buggy and Dolph Gibson, who was going to drive him over to the railroad station. All went inside the high carved oak railings into the banking room. Jimmy included, for Mr. Adams' future son-in-law was welcome anywhere. The clerks were pleased to be greeted by the good-looking, agreeable young man who was going to marry Miss Annabel. Jimmy set his suitcase down. Annabel, whose heart was bubbling with happiness and lively youth, put on Jimmy's hat and picked up the suitcase. "'Wouldn't I make a nice drummer?' said Annabel. "'My, Ralph, how heavy it is! Feels like it was full of gold bricks!' A lot of nickel-plated shoehorns in there, said Jimmy coolly, that I'm going to return. Thought I'd save express charges by taking them up. I'm getting awfully economical. The Elmore Bank had just put in a new safe and vault. Mr. Adams was very proud of it and insisted on an inspection by everyone. The vault was a small one, but it had a new patented door. It fastened with three solid steel bolts thrown simultaneously with a single handle and had a time lock. Mr. Adams beamingly explained its workings to Mr. Spencer, who showed a courteous but not too intelligent interest. The two children, May and Agatha, were delighted by the shining metal and funny clock and knobs. While they were thus engaged, Ben Price sauntered in and leaned on his elbow, looking casually inside between the railings. He told the teller that he didn't want anything, he was just waiting for a man he knew. Suddenly there was a scream or two from the women and a commotion. Unperceived by the elders, May, the nine-year-old girl, in a spirit of play, had shut Agatha in the vault. She had then shot the bolts and turned the knob of the combination as she had seen Mr. Adams do. The old banker sprang to the handle and tugged at it for a moment. "'The door can't be opened,' he groaned. "'The clock hasn't been wound, nor the combination set.' Agatha's mother screamed again, hysterically. "'Hush!' said Mr. Adams, raising his trembling hand. "'All be quiet for a moment. Agatha!' 
He called as loudly as he could, Listen to me! During the following silence, they could just hear the faint sound of the child, wildly shrieking in the dark vault in a panic of terror. "'My precious darling!' wailed the mother. "'She will die of fright! Open the door! Oh, break it open! Can't you men do something?' "'There isn't a man nearer than Little Rock who can open that door,' said Mr. Adams in a shaky voice. "'My God! Spencer, what shall we do? That child! She can't stand it long in there. There isn't enough air!' And besides, she'll go into convulsions from fright. Agatha's mother, frantic now, beat the door of the vault with her hands. Somebody wildly suggested dynamite. Annabel turned to Jimmy, her large eyes full of anguish, but not yet despairing. To a woman, nothing seems quite impossible to the powers of the man she worships. Can't you do something, Ralph? Try, won't you? He looked at her with a queer, soft smile on his lips and in his keen eyes. Annabel, he said, give me that rose you are wearing, will you? Hardly believing that she heard him aright, she unpinned the bud from the bosom of her dress and placed it in his hand. Jimmy stuffed it into his vest pocket, threw off his coat, and pulled up his shirt sleeves. With that act, Ralph D. Spencer passed away, and Jimmy Valentine took his place. Get away from the door, all of you, he commanded shortly. He set his suitcase on the table and opened it out flat. From that time on, he seemed to be unconscious of the presence of anyone else. He laid out the shining, queer implements swiftly and orderly, whistling softly to himself, as he always did when at work. In a deep silence and immovable, the others watched him as if under a spell. In a minute, Jimmy's pet drill was biting smoothly into the steel door. In ten minutes, breaking his own burglarious record, he threw back the bolts and opened the door. Agatha, almost collapsed but safe, was gathered into her mother's arms. Jimmy Valentine put on his coat and walked outside the railings toward the front door. As he went, he thought he heard a faraway voice that he once knew call, Ralph! But he never hesitated. At the door, a big man stood somewhat in his way. Hello, Ben, said Jimmy, still with his strange smile. Got around at last, have you? Well, let's go. I don't know that it makes much difference now. And then Ben Price acted rather strangely. Guess you're mistaken, Mr. Spencer, he said. Don't believe I recognize you. Your buggy's waiting for you, ain't it? And Ben Price turned and stroll down the street. End of A Retrieved Reformation by O. Henry Read by Winston Tharp Nox at Sea From The Book of Pity and of Death By Pierre Lotti Translated by Thomas Power O'Connor this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Slaughter of an Ox at Sea We were in the midst of the Indian Ocean on a sad evening, in which the wind is beginning to groan. Two poor oxen remain to us of the twelfth that we had taken in at Singapore, to eat on the way. These had been spared because the voyage was being prolonged owing to the contrary winds of the monsoon. Two poor oxen, wasted, thin, pitiable, their hides already shabby and worn through by the bones shaken by the rocking of the vessel. For many days they had sailed over this miserable sea, their backs turned to their old pasture lands far away, where nobody would ever take them again, fastened tightly to each other by a rope round their horns, and their heads lowered with resignation each time that a wave came to inundate their bodies with the new chilling bath. 
with mournful eyes they strew together some bad hay wet with the salt of the sea animals condemned to death doomed from the beginning and without hope of mercy but destined to suffer still for a long time before death to suffer from the cold the shock of the vessel from the constant wetting from the numbness and from fear the evening of which i speak was especially somber at sea there are many such evenings when ugly and livid fox spread themselves over the horizon as the light is fading when the wind begins to swell its voice and the night announces beforehand that it is going to be unsafe at such hours feeling oneself isolated in the midst of these infinite waters one is seized with a vague anguish which the twilight never brings on land even in the most funereal places and these two poor oxen children of the meadow and the pasture alone more completely exiles than we men in these moving deserts and unbuoyed by hope as we are must in spite of their rudimentary intelligence suffer after their fashion from the depression of such scenes although they see only confusedly the image of their approaching death yet with the slowness of the invalided their large and dim eyes remained fixed on these sinister distances in the sea one by one their companions had been slaughtered on these planks beside them for two weeks then they had lived together drawn toward each other by the solitude supporting each other in the rocking of the vessel and in their friendship rubbing their horns together and now the person who is charged with the supply of provisions him whom on board vessels we call the maître commis came toward me on the bridge to tell me in the usual phrase captain the cow is going to be killed the devil take him say i this maître commis i receive him very badly although assuredly he was not to blame but in truth i had no luck from the beginning of this voyage it was always during my watch that the time came for the slaughter of the oxen besides it takes place immediately below the bridge on which we walk and it is useless to turn away one's eyes to think of other things to look abroad on the waters you cannot avoid hearing the stroke of the axe between the horns and in the center of the poor forehead bound very low to a ring on the deck and then comes the noise of the animal as he falls down on the deck with a rattling of his bones soon after he is quickly cut to pieces a horrible and musty smell comes from his entrails when they are opened and all around the deck of the vessel ordinarily so clean is soiled by blood and unclean things and now it was the moment to slaughter the ox some sailors formed a circle around the ring by which it was to be tied for execution and of the two that remain they take the more infirm one who was already dying and who allowed itself to be carried away without resistance then the other turned slowly its head to follow it with melancholy eyes and seeing that they brought it toward the same fatal spot where all its brothers had fallen it understood 
a ray of light could be seen in the poor depressed forehead of this chewing animal, and it uttered a low sound of distress. The cry of that ox was one of the saddest sounds that ever made me groan, and at the same time was one of the most mysterious things that I had ever heard. There was in it a dim reproach against all men, and then a kind of resignation that was deeply moving, something so restrained and subdued as though it felt how useless was its groan of despair, and that its cry would be heard by nobody. With the consciousness of its universal abandonment, it appeared to say, Ah, yes, the inevitable hour has come for him who was my last brother, who came with me from Laba, from the country where we ran on the grass, and my turn will come soon, and not another being in the world will have pity on me any more than on him. Ah, yes, I did have pity on him. I experienced it, a sense of pity, indeed, that was almost exotic, and an impulse came upon me to go and take hold of his head, and feeble and revolting though it was to support it on my breast, since that is one of the physical methods most natural to us, when we wish to soothe with a sense of protection those who suffer or are about to die. But in fact, he did not receive any help from anybody, for even I, who had felt the supreme distress of its cry, remained stiff and impassive in my place, merely turning away my eyes. Because an animal is in despair, one cannot change the direction of a ship and prevent three hundred men from eating their rations of fresh meat. A man who should even think of such a thing for a minute would pass for a lunatic. Nevertheless, a little cabin boy, who perhaps also was alone in the world and had never found any pity, had heard the appeal, and so understood it in the depths of his soul, as I had. He approached the ox quite gently, and softly and gently began to rub its nose. If he had only thought, he might have been able to predict to him thus, All these will die also, these who are going to eat you tomorrow, all even the strongest and the youngest, and perhaps the terrible hour will be still more cruel for them than for you, with suffering more prolonged. Perhaps then they would prefer the stroke of the axe right in the midst of their foreheads. The animal returned to him his caress, looking at him with affectionate eyes, and licking his hands. But it was all over. The ray of light, which had penetrated his slow and narrow forehead, went out in the sinister immensity in which the ship carried him, always faster, in the cold fog, in the twilight announcing the bad night by the body of his companion, who was now nothing but a shapeless mass of meat, hung on hooks, he began once more to shoo quietly. Did this poor ox? His brief intelligence did not go further. He thought of nothing. He no longer remembered anything. End of The Slaughter of an Ox at Sea by Pierre Lotti Read by Hermann Hoskans
The Survivors by Elise Singmaster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the year 1868, when Memorial Day was instituted, Fosterville had 35 men in its parade. Fosterville was a border town. In it, enthusiasm had run high, and many more men had enlisted than those required by the draft. All the men were on the same side but Adam Faust, who, slipping away, joined himself to the troops of his mother's southern state. It could not have been any great trial for Adam to fight against most of his companions at Fosterville, for there was only one of them with whom he did not quarrel. That one was his cousin Henry, from whom he was inseparable, and of whose friendship for any other boys he was intensely jealous. Henry was a frank, open-hearted lad who would have lived on good terms with the whole world if Adam had allowed him to. Adam did not return to Fosterville until the morning of the first Memorial Day, of whose establishment he was unaware. He had been ill for months, and it was only now that he had earned enough money to make his way home. He was slightly lame and had lost two fingers of his left hand. He got down from the train at the station and found himself at once in a great crowd. He knew no one, and no one seemed to know him. Without asking any questions, he started up the street. He meant to go, first of all, to the house of his cousin Henry, then to set about making arrangements to resume his long-interrupted business, that of a saddler, which he could still follow in spite of his injury. As he hurried along, he heard the sound of band music and realized that some sort of a procession was advancing. With the throng about him, he pressed to the curb. The tune was one which he hated, the colors he hated also, the marchers all but one he had never liked. There was Newton Town, with a sergeant stripe on his blue sleeve. There was Edward Green, a captain. There was Peter Allenson, a color bearer. At their head, taller, handsomer, dearer than ever to Adam's jealous eyes, walked Henry Faust. In an instant of forgetfulness, Adam waved his hand, but Henry did not see. Adam chose to think he saw but would not answer. The veterans passed, and Adam drew back and was lost in the crowd. But Adam had a parade of his own. In the evening, when the music and the speeches were over, and the half-dozen graves of those of Fosterville's young men who had been brought home had been heaped with flowers, and Fosterville sat on doorsteps and porches talking about the day, had him put on a gray uniform and walked from one end of the village to the other. There were people who had known him always. The word flew from step to step. Many persons spoke to him. Some laughed and a few jeered. To no one did Adam pay any heed. Past the house of Newton Town, past the store of Ed Green, past the wide lawn of Henry Faust, walked Adam, his hands clasped behind his back, as though to make more perpendicular than perpendicularity itself that stiff backbone. Henry Faust ran down the steps and out to the gate. Oh, Adam, cried he. Adam stopped. Stock still, he could see Peter Allison in Newton Town and even Ed Green on Henry's porch. They were all having ice cream and cake together. Well, what, he said roughly. Won't you shake hands with me? No, said Adam. Won't you come in? Never. Still Henry persisted. Someone might do you harm, Adam. Let them, Adam said. Then Adam walked on alone. Adam walked alone for forty years. Not only on Memorial Day did he don his gray uniform and make the rounds of the village. When the Fosterville Grand Army Post met on Friday evenings in the post room, Adam managed to meet most of the members either going or returning. He and his gray suit became gradually so familiar to the village that no one turned his head or glanced up from book or paper to see him go by. He had from time to time a new suit, and he ordered from somewhere in the south a succession of gray, broad-brimmed military hats. The further the war sank into the past, the straighter grew old Adam's back, the prouder his head. Sometimes early in the forty years, the acquaintances of his childhood, especially the women, remonstrated him. The war is over, Adam, they would say. Can't you forget it? Those G.A.R. fellows don't forget it, Adam would answer. They haven't changed their principles. Why should I change mine? But you might make up with Henry. That's nobody's business but my own. But when you were children, you were never separated. Make up, Adam. When Henry needs me, I'll help him, said Adam. Henry will never need you. Look at all he's got. Well, then I don't need him, declared Adam as he walked away. He went back to his saddler shop, where he sat all day stitching. He had ample time to think of Henry in the past. Brought up like twins, he would say, sharing like brothers. Now he has a fine business and a fine house and fine children, and I have nothing. But I have my principles. I ain't never truckled to him. Some day he'll need me, you'll see. 
As Adam grew older, it became more and more certain that Henry would never need him for anything. Henry tried again and again to make friends, but Adam would have none of him. He talked more and more to himself as he sat at his work. He used to help him over the brook and bait his hook for him. He even built corn cob houses for him to knock down. That much littler he was than me. Stepped out of the race when I found he wanted Annie. He might ask me for something. Adam seemed often to be growing childish. By the year 1875, 15 of Fosterville's 35 veterans had died. The men who survived the war were, for the most part, not strong men, and weaknesses established in prisons and on long marches asserted themselves. Fifteen times the Fosterville Post paraded to the cemetery and read his committal service and fired at salute. For these parades, Adam did not put on his gray uniform. During the next twenty years, deaths were fewer. Fosterville had prospered as never before. It built factories and an electric car line. Of all its enterprises, Henry Faust was at the head. He enlarged his house and bought farms and grew handsomer as he grew older. Everybody loved him. All Fosterville, except Adam, sought his company. It seemed sometimes as though Adam would almost die from loneliness and jealousy. Henry Faust, sitting with Ed Green, said Adam to himself, as though he could never accustom his eyes to this phenomenon. Henry consorting with Newt Town. The Grand Army Post also grew in importance. It paraded each year with more ceremony. It imported fine music and great speakers for Memorial Day. Presently, the sad procession to the cemetery began once more. There was a long, cold winter with many cases of pneumonia, and three veterans succumbed. There was an intensely hot summer, and twice in one month, the post read its committal service and fired its salute. A few years more, and the post numbered but three. Past them still, on post evenings, walked Adam, head in air, hands clasped behind his back. There was Edward Green, round, fat, who puffed and panted. There was Newton Town, who walked, in spite of his palsy, as though he had won the Battle of Gettysburg. There was last of all Henry Faust, who at seventy-five was hale and strong. Usually a tall son walked beside him or a grandchild clung to his hand. He was almost never alone. It was as though everyone who knew him had tried to have as much as possible of his company. Past him with a grave nod walked Adam. Adam was two years older than Henry. It required more and more stretching of arms behind his back to keep his shoulders straight. In April, Newton Town was taken ill and died. Edward Green was terrified. Though he considered himself, in spite of his shortness of breath, a strong man. Don't let anything happen to you, Henry, he would say. Don't let anything get you, Henry. I can't march alone. I'll be there, Henry would reassure him. Only one look at Henry and the most alarmed would have been comforted. It would kill me to march alone, said Edward Green. As if Fosterville realized that it could not continue long to show its devotion to its veterans, it made this year special preparations for Memorial Day. The Fosterville band practiced elaborate music. The children were drilled in marching. The children were to proceed the veterans to the cemetery and were to scatter flowers over the graves. Houses were gaily decorated. Flags and banners floated in the pleasant spring breeze. Early in the morning, carriages and wagons began to bring in the country folk. Adam Faust realized, as well as Fosterville, that the parades of veterans were drawing to their close. This may be the last time I can show my principles, said he with grim setting of his lips. I will put on my gray coat early in the morning. Though the two veterans were to march to the cemetery, carriages were provided to bring them home. Fosterville meant to be as careful as possible of its treasures. I don't need any carriage to ride in like Ed Green, said Adam proudly. I could march out and back. Perhaps Ed Green will have to ride out as well as back. But Edward Green neither rode nor walked. The day turned suddenly warm. The heat and excitement accelerated his rapid breathing, and the doctor forbade him setting foot to ground. But I will, cried Edward in whom the spirit of war still lived. No, said the doctor. Then I will ride. You will stay in bed, said the doctor. So without Edward Green, the parade was formed. Before the courthouse waited the band, and the long line of school children, and the Burgess, and the fire company, and the distinguished stranger who was to make the address, until Henry Faust appeared, in his blue suit, with his flag on his breast, and his bouquet in his hand. On each side of him walked a tall, middle-aged son, who seemed to hand him over reluctantly to the marshal who was to escort him to his place. Smilingly, he spoke to the marshal, but he was the only one who smiled or spoke. For an instant, men and women broke off in the middle of their sentences, a husky something in their throats. Children looked up at him with awe. Even his own grandchildren did not dare to wave or call from their places in the ranks. Then the storm of cheers broke. 
Round the next corner, Adam Faust waited. He was clad in his gray uniform. Those who looked at him closely saw with astonishment that it was a new uniform. His brow met in a frown. His gray mustache seemed to bristle. How he hates them, said one citizen of Fosterville to another. Just look at poor Adam. Used to bait his hook for him, Adam was saying. Used to carry him pickaback. Used to go halves with him on everything. Now he walks with Ed Green. Adam pressed forward to the curb. The band was playing Marching Through Georgia, which he hated. Everybody was cheering. The volume of sound was deafening. Cheering Ed Green, Adam said. Fat, lazy, didn't have a wound. Dare say he hid behind a tree, dare say. The band was in sight now. The back of the drum major appeared, then all the musicians swung round the corner. After them came the little children with their flowers and their shining faces. Him and Ed Green next, said old Adam. But Henry walked alone. Adam's whole body jerked in his astonishment. He heard someone say that Edward Green was sick, that the doctor had forbidden him to march, or even to ride. As he pressed near the curb, he heard the admiring comments of the crowd. Isn't he magnificent? See his beautiful flowers. His grandchildren always send him his flowers. He's our first citizen. He's mine, Adam wanted to cry out. He's mine. Never had Adam felt so miserable, so jealous, so heartsick. His eyes were filled with the great feet. Henry was in truth magnificent, not only in himself, but in what he represented. He seemed symbolic of a great era of the past, and at the same time of a new age which was advancing. Old Adam understood all his glory. He's mine, said old Adam again foolishly. Then Adam leaned forward with startled, staring eyes. Henry had bowed and smiled in answer to the cheers. Across the street, his own house was a mass of color, red, white, and blue, over windows and doors, gay dresses on the porch. On each side, the pavement was crowded with a shouting multitude. Surely no hero had ever had a more glorious passage through the streets of his birthplace. But old Adam saw that Henry's face blanched, that there appeared suddenly upon it an expression of intolerable pain. For an instant, Henry's step faltered and grew uncertain. Then old Adam began to behave like a wild man. He pushed himself through the crowd. He flung himself upon the rope as though to tear it down. He called out, Wait, wait! Frightened women, fearful of some sinister purpose, tried to grasp and hold him. No man was immediately at hand, or Adam would have been seized and taken away. As for the feeble women, Adam shook them off and laughed at them. Let me go, you geese, he said. A mounted marshal saw him and rode down upon him. Men started from under the ropes to pursue him, but Adam eluded them or outdistanced them. He strode across an open space with a surety that would give no hint of the terrible beating of his heart until he reached the side of Henry. Henry greeted breathlessly and with terrible eagerness. Henry, he said, gasping. Henry, do you want me to walk along? Henry saw the alarm crowds. He saw the marshal's hands stretched to seize Adam. He saw most clearly of all the tearful eyes under the beetling brows. Henry's voice shook, but he made himself clear. It's all right, he said to the marshal. Let him be. I saw you were alone, said Adam. I said, Henry needs me. I know what it is to be alone, I. But Adam did not finish his sentence. He found a hand on his, a blue arm linked tightly in his gray arm. He felt himself moved along amid thunderous roars of sound. Of course I need you, said Henry. I've needed you all along. Then, old but young, their lives almost ended, but themselves immortal, united to be divided no more. Amid an ever-thickening sound of cheers, the two marched down the street. End of the Survivors by Elise Sangmaster. This has been a recording by William A. Crenshaw. Of Welleran by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Where the great plain of Tarfet runs up, as the sea in estuaries, among the Cyresian mountains, there stood long since the city of Merimna well nigh among the shadows of the crags. I have never seen a city in the world so beautiful as Merimna seemed to me when first I dreamed of it. It was a marvel of spires and figures of bronze and marble fountains, and trophies of fabulous wars, and broad streets given over wholly to the beautiful. Right through the center of the city there went an avenue fifty strides in length, and along each side of it stood likenesses in bronze of the kings of all the countries that the people of Merimna had ever known. 
At the end of that avenue was a colossal chariot with three bronze horses driven by the winged figure of fame, and behind her in the chariot the huge form of Welleran, Merimna's ancient hero, standing with extended sword. So urgent was the mien and attitude of fame, and so swift the pose of the horses, that you had sworn that the chariot was instantly upon you, and that its dust already veiled the faces of the kings. And in the city was a mighty hall wherein were stored the trophies of Merimna's heroes. Sculptured it was, and domed, the glory of the art of masons a long while dead. And on the summit of the dome, the image of Rollery sat gazing across the Cyresian mountains, towards the wide lands beyond, the lands that knew his sword. And beside Rollery, like an old nurse, the figure of Victory sat, hammering into a golden wreath of laurels for his head, the crowns of fallen kings. Such was Merimna, a city of sculptured victories and warriors of bronze. Yet in the time of which I write, the art of war had been forgotten in Merimna, and the people almost slept. To and fro and up and down they would walk through the marble streets, gazing at memorials of the things achieved by their country's swords in the hands of those that long ago had loved Merimna well. Almost they slept, and dreamed of Welleran, Suvrenard, Momolek, Rollery, Akinax, and young Irini of the lands beyond the mountains that lay all round about them, they knew nothing, save that they were the theatre of the terrible deeds of Welleran, that he had done with his sword. Long since these lands had fallen back into the possession of the nations that had been scourged by Merimna's armies. Nothing now remained to Merimna's men, save their inviolate city, and the glory of the remembrance of their ancient fame. At night they would place sentinels far out into the desert, but these always slept at their posts dreaming of Rollery, and three times every night a guard would march around the city clad in purple, bearing lights and singing songs of Welleran. Always the guard went unarmed, but as the sound of their song went echoing across the plain towards the looming mountains, the desert robbers would hear the name of Welleran and steal away to their haunts. Often dawn would come across the plain, shimmering marvelously upon Merimna's spires, abashing all the stars, and find the guard still singing songs of Welleran and would change the color of their purple robes and pale the lights they bore. But the guard would go back, leaving the ramparts safe, and one by one the sentinels in the plain would awake from dreaming of Rollery and shuffle back into the city quite cold. Then something of the menace would pass away from the faces of the Cyresian mountains, that from the north and the west and the south lowered upon Merimna, and clear in the morning the statues and the pillars would arise in the old inviolate city. You would wonder that an unarmed guard and sentinels that slept could defend a city that was stored with all the glories of art, that was rich in gold and bronze, a haughty city, that had erst oppressed its neighbors, whose people had forgotten the art of war. Now this is the reason that, though all her other lands had long been taken from her, Merimna's city was safe. A strange thing was believed or feared by the fierce tribes beyond the mountains, and it was credited among them 
that at certain stations round Marimna's ramparts there still rode Welleran, Surinard, Mamalek, Rollery, Akanax, and young Irini. Yet it was close on a hundred years since Irini, the youngest of Marimna's heroes, fought his last battle with the tribes. Sometimes, indeed, there arose among the tribes young men who doubted, and said, How may a man forever escape death? But graver men answered them, Hear us, ye whose wisdom has discerned so much, and discerned for us how a man may escape death when two score horsemen assail him with their swords, all of them sworn to kill him and all of them sworn upon their country's gods, as often Welleran hath. Or discern for us how two men alone may enter a walled city by night, and bring away from it that city's king, as did Zurnard and Mamalek. Surely men that have escaped so many swords, and so many sleety arrows, shall escape the years and time. And the young men were humbled, and became silent. Still the suspicion grew, and often when the sun set on the Cyresian mountains, men in Marimna discerned the forms of savage tribesmen black against the light, peering towards the city. All knew in Marimna that the figures round the ramparts were only statues of stone, Yet even there a hope lingered among a few, that some day their old heroes would come again, for certainly none had ever seen them die. Now it had been the wont of these six warriors of old, as each received his last wound and knew it to be mortal, to ride away to a certain deep ravine and cast his body in, as somewhere I have read great elephants do hiding their bones away from lesser beasts. It was a ravine steep and narrow even at the ends, a great cleft into which no man could come by any path. There rode Welleran alone, panting hard, and there later rode Surinard and Momolek, Momolek with a mortal wound upon him not to return. But Surinard was unwounded, and rode back alone from leaving his dear friend, resting among the mighty bones of Welleran. And there rode Surinard when his day was come, with Rollery and Akanax, and Rollery rode in the middle, and Surinard and Akanax on either side. And the long ride was a hard and weary thing for Surinard and Akanax for they both had mortal wounds. But the long ride was easy for Rollery, for he was dead. So the bones of these five heroes whitened in an enemy's land, and very still they were, though they had troubled cities, and none knew where they lay, saving only Irini, the young captain, who was but twenty-five when Momolek, Rollery, and Akanax rode away and among them were strewn their saddles and their bridles, and all the accoutrements of their horses, lest any man should ever find them afterwards, and say in some foreign city, Lo, the bridles or the saddles of Marimna's captains, taken in war! But their beloved trusty horses they turned free. Forty years afterwards, in the hour of a great victory, his last wound came upon Irini, and the wound was terrible and would not close. And Irini was the last of the captains and rode away alone. It was a long way to the dark ravine, and Irini feared that he would never come to the resting place of the old heroes, and he urged his horse on swiftly and clung to the saddle with his hands. And often as he rode he fell asleep, and dreamed of earlier days, and of the times when he first rode forth to the great wars of Welleran, and of the time when Welleran first spake to him, 
and of the faces of Welleran's comrades when they led charges in the battle. And ever as he awoke a great longing arose in his soul, as it hovered on his body's brink, a longing to lie among the bones of the old heroes. At last, when he saw the dark ravine making a scar across the plain, the soul of Erione slipped out through his great wound and spread its wings, and pain departed from the poor hacked body. And still urging his horse forward, Erione died. But the old true horse cantered on till suddenly he saw before him the dark ravine, and put his forefeet on the very edge of it, and stopped. Then the body of Erione came toppling forward over the right shoulder of the horse, and his bones mingle and rest as the years go by with the bones of Merimna's heroes. Now there was a little boy in Merimna named Rold. I saw him first, I, the dreamer that sit before my fire asleep. I saw him first as his mother led him through the great hall, where stand the trophies of Merimna's heroes. He was five years old, and they stood before the great glass casket wherein lay the sword of Welleran, and his mother said, The sword of Welleran. And Rold said, What should a man do with the sword of Welleran? And his mother answered, Men look at the sword and remember Welleran. And they went on and stood before the great red cloak of Welleran, and the child said, Why did Welleran wear this great red cloak? And his mother answered, It was the way of Welleran. When Rold was a little older, he stole out of his mother's house, quite in the middle of the night, when all the world was still, and Merimna asleep, dreaming of Welleran, Surinard, Momolek, Rollery, Akanax, and young Erione. And he went down to the ramparts to hear the Purple Guard go by, singing of Welleran. And the Purple Guard came by with lights, all singing in the stillness, and dark shapes out in the desert turned and fled. And Rold went back again to his mother's house, with a great yearning towards the name of Welleran, such as men feel for very holy things. And in time Rold grew to know the pathway all round the ramparts, and the six equestrian statues that were there guarding Merimna still. These statues were not like other statues, they were so cunningly wrought of many-colored marbles that none might be quite sure until very close that they were not living men. There was a horse of dappled marble, the horse of Akanax. The horse of Rollery was of alabaster, pure white. His armor was wrought out of a stone that shone, and his horseman's cloak was made of a blue stone, very precious. He looked northwards. But the marble horse of Welleran was pure black, and there sat Welleran upon him, looking solemnly westwards. His horse it was whose cold neck rolled most loved to stroke, and it was Welleran whom the watchers at sunset on the mountains the most clearly saw as they peered towards the city. And Rold loved the red nostrils of the great black horse, and his rider's jasper cloak. Now beyond the Cyresians the suspicion grew that Merimna's heroes were dead, and a plan was devised that a man should go by night and come close to the figures upon the ramparts, and see whether they were Welleran, Surinard, Momolek, Rollery, Akanax, and young Erione. And all were agreed upon the plan, and many names were mentioned of those who should go, and the plan matured for many years. It was during these years that watchers clustered often at sunset upon the mountains, but came no nearer. Finally a better plan was made, and it was decided that two men who had been by chance condemned to death 
should be given a pardon if they went down to the plain by night and discovered whether or not Merimna's heroes lived. At first the two prisoners dared not go, but after a while one of them, Sijar, said to his companion, Sajar Ho, See now, when the king's axeman smites a man upon the neck, that man dies. And the other man said that this was so. Then said Sijar, And even though Welleran smite a man with his sword, no more befalleth him than death. Then Sajar Ho thought for a while. Presently he said, Yet the eye of the king's axeman might err at the moment of his stroke, or his arm fail him, and the eye of Welleran hath never erred, nor his arm failed. It were better to bide here. Then said Sejar, Maybe that Welleran is dead, and that some other holds his place upon the ramparts, or even a statue of stone. But Sajar Ho made answer. How can Welleran be dead when he even escaped from two score horsemen with swords that were sworn to slay him, and all sworn upon our country's gods? And Sejar said, This story his father told my grandfather concerning Welleran. On the day that the fight was lost on the plains of Kurlistan, he saw a, a dying horse near to the river, and the horse looked piteously towards the water, but could not reach it. And the father of my grandfather saw Welleran go down to the river's brink, and bring water from it with his own hand, and give it to the horse. Now we are in as sore a plight as that was that horse, and as near to death. It may be that Welleran will pity us, while the king's axemen cannot, because of the commands of the king. Then said Sajar Ho, Thou wast ever a cunning arguer. Thou broughtest us into this trouble with thy cunning and thy devices. We will see if thou canst bring us out of it. We will go. So news was brought to the king that the two prisoners would go down to Merimna. That evening the watchers led them to the mountain's edge, and Sijar and Sajar Ho went down towards the plain by the way of a deep ravine, and the watchers watched them go. Presently their figures were wholly hid in the dusk. Then night came up, huge and holy, out of waste marshes to the eastwards and lowlands and the sea. And the angels that watched over all men through the day closed their great eyes and slept, and the angels that watched over all men through the night awoke and ruffled their deep blue feathers and stood up and watched. But the plain became a thing of mystery, filled with fears. So the two spies went down the deep ravine, and coming to the plain sped stealthily across it. Soon they came to the line of sentinels asleep upon the sand, and one stirred in his sleep calling on Rollery, and a great dread seized upon the spies, and they whispered, Rollery lives. But they remembered the king's axemen, and went on. And next they came to the great bronze statue of fear, carved by some sculptor of the old glorious years in the attitude of flight towards the mountains, calling to her children as she fled. And the children of fear were carved in the likeness of the armies of all the Trans-Cyresian tribes, with their backs towards Merimna, flocking after fear. And from where she, he sat on his horse behind the ramparts, the sword of Welleran was stretched out over their heads as ever it was wont. And the two spies kneeled down in the sand and kissed the huge bronze foot of the statue of Fear, saying, O oh, Fear, Fear! And as they knelt they saw lights far off along the ramparts, coming nearer and nearer, and heard men singing of Welleran. And the purple guard came nearer, and went by with their lights, and passed on into the distance round the ramparts, still singing of Welleran. And all the while the two spies clung to the foot of the statue, muttering, O oh, fear, fear! But when they could hear the name of Welleran no more, they arose and came to the ramparts, 
and climbed over them, and came at once upon the figure of Welleran, and they bowed low to the ground, and Sejar said, O Welleran, we came to see whether thou didst yet live. And for a long while they waited with their faces to the earth. At last Sejar looked up towards Welleran's terrible sword, and it was still stretched out, pointing to the carved armies that followed after fear. And Sejar bowed to the ground again, and touched the horse's hoof, and it seemed cold to him. And he moved his hand higher, and touched the leg of the horse, and it seemed quite cold. At last he touched Welleran's foot, and the armor on it seemed hard and stiff. Then as Welleran moved not, and spake not, Sejar climbed up at last, and touched his hand, the terrible hand of Welleran, and it was marble. Then Sejar laughed aloud, and he and Sajar Ho sped down the empty pathway, and found Rollery, and he was marble too. Then they climbed down over the ramparts, and went back across the plain, walking contemptuously past the figure of fear, and heard the guard returning round the ramparts for the third time, singing of Welleran, and Sejar said, Ay, you may sing of Welleran, but Welleran is dead and a doom is on your city. And they passed on, and found the sentinel still restless in the night, and calling on Rollery, and Sajar Ho muttered, Ay, you may call on Rollery, but Rollery is dead and naught can save your city. And the two spies went back alive to their mountains again, and as they reached them the first ray of the sun came up red over the desert behind Merimna, and lit Merimna's spires. It was the hour when the Purple Guard were wont to go back into the city with their tapers pale and their robes a brighter color, when the cold sentinels came shuffling in from dreaming in the desert. It was the hour when the desert robbers hid themselves away, going back to their mountain caves. It was the hour when gauze-winged insects are born, that only live for a day. It was the hour when men die that are condemned to death, and in this hour a great peril, new and terrible, arose for Merimna, and Merimna knew it not. Then Sejar, turning, said, See how red the dawn is, and how red the spires of Merimna. They are angry with Merimna in paradise, and they bode its doom. So the two spies went back and brought the news to their king, and for a few days the kings of those countries were gathering their armies together, and one evening the armies of four kings were massed together at the top of the deep ravine, all crouching below the summit waiting for the sun to set. All wore resolute and fearless faces, yet inwardly every man was praying to his gods, unto each one in turn. Then the sun set, and it was the hour when the bats and the dark creatures are abroad, and the lions come down from their lairs, and the desert robbers go into the plains again, and fevers rise up winged and hot out of chill marshes. And it was the hour when safety leaves the thrones of kings, the hour when dynasties change. But in the desert the Purple Guard came swinging out of Merimna with their lights to sing of Welleran, and the sentinels lay down to sleep. Now into Paradise no sorrow may ever come, but may only beat like rain against its crystal walls. Yet the souls of Merimna's heroes were half aware of some sorrow far away, as some sleeper feels that some one is chilled and cold yet knows not in his sleep that it is he. And they fretted a little in their starry home. Then unseen there drifted earthward across the setting sun the souls of Welleran, Surinard, Momolek, Rollery, Akanax, and young Iraini. Already when they reached Merimna's ramparts it was just dark, Already the armies of the four kings had begun to move, 
jingling down the deep ravine. But when the six warriors saw their city again, so little changed after so many years, they looked towards her with a longing that was nearer to tears than any that their souls had known before, crying to her, O oh, Marimna, our city, Marimna, our walled city, how beautiful thou art with all thy spires, Marimna! For thee we left the earth, its kingdoms and little flowers, for thee we have come away for a while from paradise. It is very difficult to draw away from the face of God. It is like a warm fire, it is like dear sleep, it is like a great anthem, yet there is a stillness all about it, a stillness full of lights. We have left paradise for a while for thee, Marimna. Many women we have loved, Marimna, but only one city. Behold now all the people dream, all our loved people. How beautiful are dreams! In dreams the dead may live, even the long dead and the very silent. Thy lights are all sunk low, they have all gone out. No sound is in thy streets. Hush! Thou art like a maiden that shutteth up her eyes and is asleep, that draweth her breath softly and is quite still, being at ease and untroubled. Behold now the battlements, the old battlements. Do men defend them still as we defended them? They are worn a little, the battlements. And drifting nearer, they peered anxiously. It is not by the hand of man that they are worn, our battlements. Only the years have done it, and indomitable time. Thy battlements are like the girdle of a maiden, a girdle that is round about her. See now the dew upon them, they are like a jeweled girdle. Thou art in great danger, Marimna, because thou art so beautiful. Must thou perish to-night, because we no more defend thee, because we cry out and none hear us, as the bruised lilies cry out, and none have known their voices? Thus spake those strong-voiced, battle-ordering captains, calling to their dear city, and their voices came no louder than the whispers of little bats that drift across the twilight in the evening. Then the purple guard came near, going round the ramparts for the first time in the night, and the old warriors called to them, Marimna is in danger. Already her enemies gather in the darkness. But their voices were never heard, because they were only wandering ghosts. And the guard went by and passed unheeding away, still singing of Welleran. Then said Welleran to his comrades, Our hands can hold swords no more. Our voices cannot be heard. We are stalwart men no longer. We are but dreams. Let us go among dreams. Go all of you, and you too, young Eraini, and trouble the dreams of all the men that sleep, and urge them to take the old swords of their grandsires that hang upon the walls, and to gather at the mouth of the ravine, and I will find a leader and make him take my sword. Then they passed up over the ramparts and into their dear city, and the wind blew about this way and that as he went, the soul of Welleran, who had upon his day withstood the charges of tempestuous armies and the souls of his comrades, and with them young Irini, passed up into the city and troubled the dreams of every man who slept. And to every man the souls said in their dreams, It is hot and still in the city. Go out now into the desert, into the cool under the mountains, but take with thee the old sword that hangs upon the wall for fear of the desert robbers. And the god of that city sent up a fever over it, and the fever brooded over it, and the streets were hot, and all that slept awoke from dreaming that it would be cool and pleasant 
where the breezes came down the ravine out of the mountains, and they took the old swords that their grandsires had, according to their dreams, for fear of the desert robbers. And in and out of dreams passed the souls of Welleran's comrades, and with them young Erione, in great haste as the night wore on, and one by one they troubled the dreams of all Merimna's men, and caused them to arise and go out armed, all save the purple guard, who, heedless of danger, sang of Welleran still, for waking men cannot hear the souls of the dead. But Welleran drifted over the roofs of the city till he came to the form of Rold, lying fast asleep. Now Rold was grown strong and was eighteen years of age, and he was fair of hair and tall like Welleran, and the soul of Welleran hovered over him and went into his dreams as a butterfly flits through trellis work into a garden of flowers, and the soul of Welleran said to Rold in his dreams, Thou wouldst go and seek again the sword of Welleran, the great curved sword of Welleran. Thou wouldst go and look at it in the night, with the moonlight shining upon it. And the longing of Rold in his dreams to see the sword caused him to walk still sleeping from his mother's house to the hall wherein were the trophies of the heroes. And the soul of Welleran, urging the dreams of Rold, caused him to pause before the great red cloak, and there the soul said among the dreams, Thou art cold in the night, fling now a cloak around thee. And Rold drew around him the huge red cloak of Welleran. Then Rold's dreams took him to the sword, and the soul said to the dreams, Thou hast a longing to hold the sword of Welleran. Take up the sword in thy hand. But Rold said, What should a man do with the sword of Welleran? And the soul of the old captain said to the dreams, It is a good sword to hold. Take up the sword of Welleran. And Rold, still sleeping and speaking aloud, said, it is not lawful, none may touch the sword. And Rold turned to go. Then a great and terrible cry arose in the soul of Welleran, all the more bitter for that he could not utter it, and it went round and round his soul, finding no utterance, like a cry evoked long since by some murderous deed in some old haunted chamber that whispers through the ages, heard by none. And the soul of Welleran cried out to the dreams of Rold, Thy knees are tied, thou art fallen in a marsh, thou canst not move. And the dreams of Rold said to him, Thy knees are tied, thou art fallen in a marsh. And Rold stood before the sword. Then the soul of the warrior wailed among Rold's dreams, as Rold stood before the sword. Welleran is crying for his sword, his wonderful curved sword. Poor Welleran, that once fought for Merimna, is crying for his sword in the night. Thou wouldst not keep Welleran without his beautiful sword, when he is dead and cannot come for it, poor Welleran, who fought for Merimna. And Rold broke the glass casket with his hand and took the sword, the great curved sword of Welleran. And the soul of the warrior said among Rold's dreams, Welleran is waiting in the deep ravine that runs into the mountains, crying for his sword. And Rold went down through the city and climbed over the ramparts, and walked with his eyes wide open but still sleeping over the desert to the mountains. Already a great multitude of Merimna's citizens were gathered in the desert before the deep ravine with old swords in their hands, and Rold passed through them as he slept, holding the sword of Welleran 
and the people cried in amaze to one another as he passed, Rold hath the sword of Welleran! And Rold came to the mouth of the ravine, and there the voices of the people woke him. And Rold knew nothing that he had done in his sleep, and looked in amazement at the sword in his hand, and said, What art thou, thou beautiful thing? Lights shimmer in thee, thou art restless. It is the sword of Welleran, the curved sword of Welleran. And Rold kissed the hilt of it, and it was salt upon his lips with the battle sweat of Welleran. And Rold said, What should a man do with the sword of Welleran? And all the people wondered at Rold as he sat there with the sword in his hand, muttering, What should a man do with the sword of Welleran? Presently there came to the ears of Rold the noise of a jingling up in the ravine, and all the people, the people that knew naught of war, heard the jingling coming nearer in the night, for the four armies were moving on Merimna, and not yet expecting an enemy. And Rold gripped upon the hilt of the great curved sword, and the sword seemed to lift a little. And a new thought came into the hearts of Merimna's people as they gripped their grandsire's swords. Nearer and nearer came the heedless armies of the four kings, and old ancestral memories began to arise in the minds of Merimna's people in the desert with their swords in their hands, sitting behind Rold. And all the sentinels were awake holding their spears, for Rollery had put their dreams to flight, Rollery that once could put to flight armies, and now was but a dream struggling with other dreams. And now the armies had come very near. Suddenly Rold leaped up, crying, Welleran! And the sword of Welleran! And the savage, lusting sword that had thirsted for a hundred years went up with the hand of Rold and swept through a tribesman's ribs. And with the warm blood all about it there came a joy into the curved soul of that mighty sword, like to the joy of a swimmer coming up dripping out of warm seas after living for long in a dry land. When they saw the red cloak and that terrible sword, a cry ran through the tribal armies, Welleran lives! And there arose the sounds of the exultic of victorious men, and the panting of those that fled, and the sword singing softly to itself as it whirled dripping through the air. And the last that I saw of the battle as it poured into the depth and darkness of the ravine was the sword of Welleran sweeping up and falling, gleaming blue in the moonlight whenever it arose and afterwards gleaming red, and so disappearing into the darkness. But in the dawn Merimna's men came back, and the sun arising to give new life to the world shone instead upon the hideous things that the sword of Welleran had done. And Rold said, O oh, sword, sword, how horrible thou art! Thou art a terrible thing to have come among men. How many eyes shall look upon gardens no more because of thee? How many fields must go empty that might have been fair with cottages, white cottages with children all about them? How many valleys must go desolate that might have nursed warm hamlets, because thou hast slain long since the men that might have built them? I hear the wind crying against thee, thou sword. It comes from the empty valleys. It comes over the bare fields. There are children's voices in it. They were never born. Death brings an end to crying for those that had life once, but these must cry forever. O oh, sword, sword, why did the gods send thee among men? And the tears of Rold fell down upon the proud sword, but could not wash it clean. 
And now that the ardor of battle had passed away, the spirits of Barimna's people began to gloom a little, like their leaders, with their fatigue and with the cold of the morning. And they looked at the sword of Welleran in Rold's hand and said, Not any more, not any more forever will Welleran now return, for his sword is in the hand of another. Now we know indeed that he is dead. O oh, Welleran, thou wast our sun and moon and all our stars. Now is the sun fallen down and the moon broken, and all the stars are scattered as the diamonds of a necklace that is snapped off one who is slain by violence. Thus wept the people of Merimna in the hour of their great victory, for men have strange moods, while beside them their old inviolate city slumbered safe. But back from the ramparts and beyond the mountains and over the lands that they had conquered of old, beyond the world and back again to paradise, went the souls of Welleran, Surinard, Mamalek, Rollery, Akanax, and young Eryne. End of the Sword of Welleran by Lord Dunsany Read by James Birkinshaw Baker's Chat by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Now that corpse, said the undertaker, patting the folded hands of deceased approvingly, was a brick. Every way you took him, he was a brick. He was so real accommodating and so modest-like and simple in his last moments. Friends wanted metallic burial case. Nothing else would do. I couldn't get it. There weren't going to be time. Anybody could see that. Corpse said, never mind. Shake him up some kind of box he could stretch out in comfortable. He weren't particular about the general style of it. Said he went more on room than style. Anyway, in a last final container. Friends wanted a silver door plate on the coffin, signifying who he was and where he was from. Now, you know, a feller couldn't roust out such a gaily thing as that in a little country town like this. What did Corpse say? Corpse said, Whitewash his old canoe and daub his address and general destination onto it with a blacking brush and a stencil plate, along with a verse from some likely hymn or other and pint him for the tomb and mark him C.O.D. and just let him flicker. He weren't distressed any more than you be. On the contrary, just as calm and collected as a hearse horse. Said he judged that while he was going to, a body would find it considerable better to attract attention by a picturesque moral character than a natty burial case with a swell door plate on it. Splendid man he was. I'd rather do for a corpse like that than any I've tackled in seven years. There's some satisfaction in burying a man like that. You feel that what you're doing is appreciated. Lord bless you. So she got planted before he smiled, he was perfectly satisfied. Said his relations meant well, perfectly well, but all them preparations was bound to delay the thing more or less, and he didn't wish to be kept laying around. 
you never see such a clear head as what he had and so calm and so cool just a hunk of brains that is what he was <laughs> perfectly awful it was a ripping distance from one end of that man's head to t'other often and over again he's had brain fever a raging in one place and the rest of the pile didn't know anything about it didn't affect it any more than an engine insurrection in arizona affects the atlantic states well the relations they wanted a big funeral but corpse said he was down on flummery didn't want any procession fill the hearse full of mourners and get out a stern line and tow him behind he was the most down on style of any remains i ever struck a beautiful simple-minded creature it was what he was you can depend on that he was just set on having things the way he wanted them and he took a solid comfort in laying his little plans he had me measure him and take a whole raft of directions then he had the minister stand up behind a long box with a tablecloth over it to represent the coffin and read his funeral sermon saying encore encore at the good places and making him scratch out every bit of brag about him and all the highfalutin and then he made them trot out the choir so's he could help them pick out the tunes for the occasion and he got them to sing pop goes the weasel because he had always liked that tune when he was downhearted and solemn music made him sad and when they sung that with tears in their eyes because they all loved him and his relations grieving around he just laid there as happy as a bug and trying to beat time and showing all over how much he enjoyed it and presently he got worked up and excited and tried to join in for mind you he was pretty proud of his abilities in the singing line but the first time he opened his mouth and was just going to spread himself his breath took a walk i never see a man snuffed out so sudden oh it was a great loss a powerful loss to this poor little one-horse town well 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 I, I i ain't got time to be palavering along here got the nail on the lid and mosey along with him and if you'll just give me a lift we'll skeet him into the hearse and meander along relations bound to have it so don't pay no attention to dying injunctions minute a corpse is gone but if i had my way if i didn't respect his last wishes and tow him behind the hearse i'll be cussed i consider that whatever a corpse wants done for his comfort is little enough matter and a man ain't got no right to deceive him or take advantage of him and whatever a corpse trusts me to do i'm a going to do you know even if it's to stuff him and paint him yeller and keep him for a keepsake you hear me he cracked his whip and went lumbering away with his ancient ruin of a hearse and i continued my walk with a valuable lesson learned that a healthy and wholesome cheerfulness is not necessarily impossible to any occupation the lesson is likely to be lasting for it will take many months to obliterate the memory of the remarks and circumstances that impressed it end of the undertaker's chat by mark twain read by tom merritt
Eck London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When Clay Dillham left the tent to get a sled load of firewood, he expected to be back in a half an hour. So he told Swanson, who was cooking the dinner. Swanson and he belonged to different outfits, located about twenty miles apart on the Stewart River, but they became traveling partners on a trip down the Yukon to Dawson to get the mail. Swanson had laughed when Clay said he would be back in a half an hour. It stood to reason, Swanson said, that good, dry firewood would not be found so close to Dawson, that whatever firewood there was originally had long since been gathered in, that firewood would not be selling at forty dollars a cord if any man could go out and get a sled load and be back in time Clay expected to make it. Then it was Clay's turn to laugh as he sprang on the sled and mushed the dogs onto the river trail. For, coming up from the Seawash village the previous day, he had noticed a small dead pine in an out-of-the-way place which had defied discovery by eyes less sharp than his. And his eyes were both young and sharp, for his seventeenth birthday was just cleared. A swift ten minutes over the ice brought him to the place, and figuring ten minutes to get the tree and ten minutes to return made him certain that Swanson's dinner would not wait. Just below Dawson, and rising out of the Yukon itself, towered the great Moosehide Mountain, so named by Lieutenant Schwaka long ere the Klondike became famous. On the riverside the mountain was scarred and gullied and gored, and it was up one of these gores or gullies that Clay had seen the tree. Halting his dogs beneath, on the river ice, he looked up, and after some searching rediscovered it. Being dead, its weather-beaten gray so blended with the gray of the rock that a thousand men could pass by and never notice it. Taking root in a cranny, it had grown up, exhausted its bit of soil, and perished. Beneath it the wall fell sheer away for a hundred feet to the river. All one had to do was sink an axe into the dry trunk a dozen times, and it would fall to the ice and most probably smashed conveniently into pieces. This Clay had figured on when confidently limiting the trip to a half an hour. He studied the cliff thoroughly before attempting it. So far as he was concerned, the longest way round was the shortest way to the tree. Twenty feet of nearly perpendicular climbing would bring him to where a slide sloped more gently in. By making a long zigzag across the face of this slide and back again, he would arrive at the pine. Fastening his axe across his shoulders so that it would not interfere with his movements, he clawed up the broken rock, hand and foot, like a cat, till the twenty feet were cleared, and he could draw breath on the edge of the slide. The slide was steep and its snow-covered surface slippery. Further, the heelless walrus hide soles of his mucklucks were polished by much ice travel, and by a second step he realized how little he could depend upon them for clinging purposes. A slip at that point meant a plunge over the edge and a twenty-foot fall onto the ice. A hundred feet farther, and a slide would mean a fifty-foot fall. He thrust his mitted hand through the snow to the earth to steady himself, and went on. But he was forced to exercise such care that the first zigzag consumed five minutes. Then, returning across the face of the slide towards the pine, he was met with a new difficulty. The slope steepened considerably so that little snow collected, while bent flat beneath this thin covering were long, dry last year's grasses. The surface they presented was glassy as that of his mucklucks, and when both surfaces came together his feet shot out and he fell on his face, sliding downwards and convulsively clutching for something to stay himself. This he succeeded in doing, though he lay quiet for a couple of minutes to get back his nerve. He would have taken off his mucklucks and gone at it in his socks, only the cold was thirty below zero, and at such temperature his feet would quickly freeze. So he went on, and after ten minutes of risky work made the safe and solid rock where stood the pine. A few strokes of the axe felled it into the chasm, and peeping over the edge he indulged in a laugh at the startled dogs. They were on the verge of bolting when he called aloud to them, soothingly, and they were reassured. Then he turned about for the back trip. Going down, he knew, was even more dangerous than coming up, but how dangerous he did not realize till he had slipped half a dozen times, and each time saved himself by what appeared to him a miracle. Time and again he ventured upon the slide, and time and again he was balked when he came to the grasses. He sat down and looked at the tremendous snow-covered slope. It was manifestly impossible for him to make it with a whole body, and he did not wish to arrive at the bottom shattered like the pine tree. But while he sat inactive, the frost was stealing in on him. 
the quick chilling of his body warned him that he could not delay. He must be doing something to keep his blood circulating. If he could not go down by going down, there only remained to him to get down by going up. It was a Herculean task, but it was the only way out of the predicament. From where he was he could not see the top of the cliff, but he reasoned that the gully in which lay the slide must give inward more and more as it approached the top. From what little he could see, the gully displayed this tendency, and he noticed also that the slide extended for many hundreds of feet upward, and that where it ended the rock was well broken up and favorable for climbing. Here and there, at several wide intervals, small masses of rocks projected through the snow of the slide itself, giving sufficient stability to the enterprise to encourage him. So, instead of taking the zigzag which led downward, he made a new one leading upward and crossing the slide at an angle of thirty degrees. The grasses gave him much trouble, and made him long for soft, tanned, moose-hide moccasins, which would make his feet cling like a second pair of hands. He soon found that thrusting his mitted hand through the snow and clinging the grass roots was uncertain and unsafe. His mittens were too thick for him to be sure of his grip, so he took them off. But this brought with it new trouble. When he held on to a bunch of roots, the snow, coming in contact with his bare warm hand, was melted, so that his hands and his wristbands of his woolen shirt were dripping with water. This the frost was quick to attack, and his fingers were numbed and made worthless. Then he was forced to seek good footing where he could stand erect unsupported, to put on his mittens, and to thrash his hands against his sides until heat came back into them. This constant numbing of his fingers made his progress very slow, but the zigzag came to an end, finally, where the side of the slide was buttressed by perpendicular rock, and he turned back and upward again. As he climbed higher and higher, he found that the slide was wedge-shaped, its rocky buttresses pinching it away as it neared its upper end. Each step increased the depth which seemed to yawn for him. While beating his hands against his side, he turned to look down the long slippery slope, and figured, in case he slipped, he would be flying with the speed of an express train ere he took the final plunge into the icy bed of the Yukon. He passed the first outcropping rock, and the second, and at the end of an hour found himself above the third and fully five hundred feet above the river. And here, with the end nearly two hundred feet above him, the pitch of the slide was increasing. Each step became more difficult and perilous, and he was faint from exertion and from lack of Swanson's dinner. Three or four times he slipped slightly and recovered himself, but growing careless from the exhaustion and the long tension on his nerves, he tried to continue with too great haste, and was rewarded by a double slip of each foot which tore loose and started him down the slope. On account of the steepness there was little snow, but what little there was was displaced by his body, so that he became the nucleus of a young avalanche. He clawed desperately with his hands, but there was little to cling to, and he sped downward faster and faster. The first and second L cropping were below him, but he knew that the first was almost out of line, and he pinned his hope on the second. Yet the first was just enough in line to catch one of his feet and to whirl him over and head downward on his back. The shock of this was severe in itself, and the fine snow enveloped him in a blinding, maddening cloud, but he was thinking quickly and clearly of what would happen if he brought up head first against the second outcropping. He twisted himself over in his stomach, thrust both hands out to one side, and pressed them heavily against the flying surface. This had the effect of a break, drawing his head and shoulders to the side. In this position, he rolled over and over a couple of times, and then, with a quick jerk at the right moment, he got his body the rest of the way around. And none too soon, for the next moment his feet drove into the outcropping, his legs doubled up and the wind was driven from his stomach with the abruptness of the stop. There was much snow down his neck and up his sleeves. At once with unconcern he shook this out, only to discover when he looked up to where he must climb again, he had lost his nerve. He was shaking as if with a palsy, and sick and faint from frightful nausea. Fully ten minutes passed by ere he could master these sensations and summon sufficient strength for the weary climb. His legs hurt him and he was limping, and he was conscious of a sore place in his back where he had fallen on the axe. In an hour he had regained the point of his tumble, and he was contemplating the slide, which so suddenly steepened. It was plain to him that he could not go up with hands and feet alone, and he was beginning to lose his nerve again when he remembered the axe. Reaching upward the distance of a step, he brushed away the snow, 
and in the frozen gravel and crumbled rock of the slide chopped a shallow resting place for his foot. Then he came up a step, reaching forward and repeating the maneuver. And so on, step by step, foothold by foothold, a tiny speck of toiling life poised like a fly on the mighty face of Moosehide Mountain, he fought his way upward. Twilight was beginning to fall when he gained the head of the slide and drew himself into the rocky bottom of the gully. At this point the shoulder of the mountain began to bend back toward the crest, and in addition to being less steep, the rocks offered better handholds and footholds. The worst was over, and the best was yet to come. The gully opened out into a miniature basin, in which a floor of soil had been deposited, out of which, in turn, a tiny grove of pines had sprung. The trees were all dead, dry and seasoned, having long since exhausted the thin skin of earth. Clay ran his experienced eye over the timber, and estimated it would chop up into fifty cords at least. Beyond, the gully closed in and became barren rock again. On every hand was barren rock, so the wonder was small that the trees had escaped the eyes of men. They were only to be discovered as he discovered them, by climbing after them. He continued the ascent, and the white moon greeted him when he came up upon the crest of Moosehide Mountain. At his feet, a thousand feet below, sparkled the lights of Dawson. But the descent on that side was precipitate and dangerous in the uncertain moonshine, and he elected to go down the mountain by its gentler northern flank. In a couple of hours, he reached the Yukon at the Siwash village, and he took the river trail back to where he had left the dogs. There he found Swanson, with a fire going, waiting for him to come down. And though Swanson had a hearty laugh at his expense, nevertheless, a week or so later, in Dawson, there were fifty cords of wood sold at forty dollars a cord, and it was he and Swanson who sold them. End of Up the Slide by Jack London The Upturned Face by Stephen Crane This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Upturned Face by Stephen Crane What will we do now? said the adjutant, troubled and excited. Bury him, said Timothy Lean. The two officers looked down close to their toes where lay the body of their comrade. The face was chalk blue. Gleaming eyes stared at the sun. Over the two upright figures was a windy sound of bullets, and on the top of the hill Lean's prostrate company of Spitzbergen infantry was firing measured volleys. "'Don't you think it would be better?' began the adjutant. "'We might leave him until tomorrow.' "'No,' said Lean. "'I can't hold that post an hour longer. I've got to fall back, and we've got to bury old Bill.' "'Of course.' said the adjutant at once. Your men got entrenching tools? Lean shouted back to his little line, and two men came slowly, one with a pick, one with a shovel. They started in the direction of the Rostina sharpshooters. Bullets cracked near their ears. Dick here, said Lean gruffly. The men, thus caused to lower their glances to the turf, became hurried and frightened merely because they could not look to see whence the bullets came. The dull beat of the pick, striking the earth, sounded amid the swift snap of close bullets. Presently the other private began to shovel. "'I suppose,' said the adjutant slowly, "'we'd better search his clothes for things.' Lean nodded. Together in curious abstraction they looked at the body, then Lean stirred his shoulders suddenly, arousing himself. Yes, he said, we'd better see what he's got. He dropped to his knees, and his hands approached the body of the dead officer. But his hands wavered over the buttons of the tunic. The first button was brick-red with drying blood, and he did not seem to dare touch it. Go on, said the adjutant, hoarsely. Lean stretched his wooden hand, and his fingers fumbled the blood-stained buttons. At last he rose with ghastly face. He had gathered a watch, a whistle, a pipe, a tobacco pouch, a handkerchief, a little case of cards and papers. 
He looked at the adjutant. There was a silence. The adjutant was feeling that he had been a coward to make Lean do all the grisly business. Well, said Lean, that's all, I think. You have a sword and revolver? Yes, said the adjutant, his face working, and then he burst out in a sudden strange fury at the two privates. Why don't you hurry up with that grave? What are you doing, anyhow? Hurry, do you hear? I never saw such stupid— even as he cried out in his passion, the two men were laboring for their lives. Ever overhead the bullets were spitting. The grave was finished. It was not a masterpiece, a poor little shallow thing. Lean and the adjutant again looked at each other in a curious, silent communication. Suddenly the adjutant croaked out a weird laugh. It was a terrible laugh, which had its origin in that part of the mind which is first moved by the singing of the nerves. <laughs> well, he said humorously to Lean, I suppose we had best tumble him in. Yes, said Lean. The two privates stood waiting, bent over their implements. I suppose, said Lean, it would be better if we laid him in ourselves. Yes, said the adjutant. Then, apparently remembering that he had made Lean search the body, he stooped with great fortitude and took hold of the dead officer's clothing. Lean joined him. Both were particular that their fingers should not feel the corpse. They tugged away. The corpse lifted, heaved, toppled, flopped into the grave, and the two officers, straightening, looked again at each other. They were always looking at each other. They sighed with relief. The adjutant said, I suppose we should. We should say something. Do you know the service, Tim? They don't read the service until the grave is filled in, said Lean, pressing his lips to an academic expression. Don't they? said the adjutant, shocked that he had made the mistake. Oh, well, he cried suddenly. Let us, let us say something while he can hear us. All right, said Lean. Do you know the service? I can't remember a line of it, said the adjutant. Lean was extremely dubious. I can repeat two lines, but... Well, do it, said the adjutant. Go as far as you can. That's better than nothing. And the beasts have got our range exactly. Lean looked at his two men. Attention, he barked. The privates came to attention with a click, looking much aggrieved. The adjutant lowered his helmet to his knee. Lean, bareheaded, he stood over the grave. The Rostina sharpshooters fired briskly. Oh, father, our friend has sunk in the deep waters of death, but his spirit has leapt toward thee as the bubble arises from the lips of the drowning. Perceive, we beseech, O oh, father, the little flying bubble, and— Lean, although husky and ashamed, had suffered no hesitation up to this point, but he stopped with a hopeless feeling and looked at the corpse. The adjutant moved uneasily. And from thy superb heights, he began, and then he too came to an end. And from thy superb heights, said Lean. The adjutant suddenly remembered a phrase in the back part of the Spitzbergen burial service, and he exploited it with the triumphant manner of a man who has recalled everything and can go on. O oh God, have mercy! O oh God, have mercy, said Ling. Mercy, repeated the adjutant, in a quick failure. Mercy, said Ling. And then he was moved by some violence of feeling, for he turned suddenly upon his two men and tigerishly said, Throw the dirt in! The fire of the Rostina sharpshooters was accurate and continuous. One of the aggrieved privates came forward with his shovel. He lifted his first shovel-load of earth, and for a moment of inexplicable hesitation it was held poised above this corpse, which from its chalk-blue face looked keenly out from the grave. Then the soldier emptied his shovel on, on the feet. Timothy Lean felt as if tons had been swiftly lifted from off his forehead. 
He had felt that perhaps the private might empty the shovel on, on the face. It had been emptied on the feet. There was a great point gained there. Ha, ha! The first shovel had been emptied on the feet. How satisfactory! The adjutant began to babble. Well, of course, a man we've messed with all these years. Impossible. You can't, you know, leave your intimate friends rotting on the field. Go on, for God's sake, and shovel, you. The man with the shovel suddenly ducked, grabbed his left arm with his right hand, and looked at his officer for orders. Lean picked the shovel from the ground. Go to the rear, he said to the wounded man. He also addressed the other private. You get under cover, too. I'll finish this business. The wounded man scrambled hard still for the top of the ridge, without devoting any glances to the direction whence the bullets came, and the other man followed at an equal pace. But he was different, in that he looked back anxiously three times. This is merely the way, often, of the hit and unhit. Timothy Lean filled the shovel, hesitated, and then, in a movement which was like a gesture of aberrance, he flung the dirt into the grave, and as it landed, it made a sound, plop. Lean suddenly stopped and mopped his brow, a tired laborer. Perhaps we have been wrong, said the adjutant. His glance wavered stupidly. It might have been better if we hadn't buried him just at this time. Of course, if we advanced tomorrow, the body would have been... Damn you! said Lean. Shut your mouth! He was not the senior officer. He again filled the shovel and flung the earth. Always the earth made that sound. Plop! For a space, Lean worked frantically, like a man digging himself out of danger. Soon there was nothing to be seen but the chalk-blue face. Lean filled the shovel. Good God! he cried to the adjutant. Why didn't you turn him somehow when you put him in? This! Then Lean began to stutter. The adjutant understood. He was pale to the lips. Go on, man! he cried beseechingly, almost in a shout. Lean swung back the shovel. It went forward in a pendulum curve. When the earth landed, it made a sound. Plop! End of The Upturned Face by Stephen Crane War by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He was a young man, not more than twenty-four or five, and he might have set his horse with the careless grace of his youth had he not been so cat-like and tense. His black eyes roved everywhere, catching the movements of twigs and branches where small birds hopped, questing onward through the changing vistas of trees and brush, and returning always to the clumps of undergrowth on either side. And as he watched, so did he listen. Though he rode on in silence, save for the boom of heavy guns far to the west, this had been sounding monotonously in his ears for hours, and only its cessation would have aroused his notice, for he had business closer to hand. Across his saddle bow was balanced a carbine. So tensely was he strung that a bunch of quail, exploding into flight from under his horse's nose, startled him to such an extent that automatically, instantly, he had reined in and fetched the carbine halfway to his shoulder. He grinned sheepishly, recovered himself, and rode on. So tense was he, so bent upon the work he had to do, that the sweat stung his eyes, unwiped and unheeded, rolled down his nose and spattered his saddle pommel. The bend of his cavalryman's hat was fresh stained with sweat. The roan horse under him was likewise wet. It was high noon of a breathless day of heat. Even the birds and squirrels did not dare the sun, but sheltered in shady hiding places among the trees. Man and horse were littered with leaves and dusted with yellow pollen, for the open was ventured no more than was compulsory. They kept to the brush and trees, and invariably the man halted and peered out before crossing a dry glade or naked stretch of upland pasturage. He worked always to the north, though his way was devious, and it was from the north that he seemed the most apprehend that for which he was looking. He was no coward, but his courage was only that of the average civilized man, and he was looking to live, not die. Up a small hillside he followed a cow path, through such dense scrub that he was forced to dismount and lead his horse, 
but when the path swung around to the west, he abandoned it and headed to the north again, along the oak-covered top of the ridge. The ridge ended in a steep descent, so steep that he zigzagged back and forth across the face of the slope, sliding and stumbling among the dead leaves and matted vines and keeping a watchful eye on the horse above that threatened to fall down upon him. The sweat ran from him, and the pollen dust settling pungently in mouth and nostrils increased his thirst. Try as he would, nevertheless, the descent was noisy, and frequently he stopped, panting in the dry heat and listening for any warning from beneath. At the bottom, he came out on a flat, so densely forested that he could not make out its extent. Here the character of the woods changed, and he was able to remount. Instead of the twisted hillside oaks, tall straight trees, big trunked and prosperous, rose from the damp fat soil. Only here and there were thickets, easily avoided while he encountered winding, park-like glades where the cattle had pastured in the days before war had run them off. His progress was more rapid now, as he came down into the valley, and at the end of half an hour he halted at an ancient rail fence on the edge of a clearing. He did not like the openness of it, yet his path lay across to the fringe of trees that marked the banks of the stream. It was a mere quarter of a mile across that open, but the thought of venturing out in it was repugnant. A rifle, a score of them, a thousand, might lurk in that fringe by the stream. Twice he essayed to start, and twice he paused. He was appalled by his own loneliness. The pulse of war that beat from the west suggested the companionship of battling thousands. Here was naught but silence, and himself, and possibly death-dealing bullets from a myriad ambushes. And yet his task was to find what he feared to find. He must on and on, till somewhere, sometime, he encountered another man or other men from the other side, scouting as he was scouting, to make report, as he must make report, of having come in touch. Changing his mind, he skirted inside the woods for a distance, and again peeped forth. This time, in the middle of a clearing, he saw a small farmhouse. There were no signs of life, no smoke curled from the chimney, not a barnyard fowl clucked and strutted. The kitchen door stood open, and he gazed so long and hard into the black aperture that it seemed almost that a farmer's wife must emerge at any moment. He licked the pollen and dust from his dry lips, stiffened himself, mind and body, and rode out into the blazing sunshine. Nothing stirred. He went on past the house and approached the wall of trees and bushes by the river's bank. One thought persisted maddeningly. It was of the crash into his body of a high-velocity bullet. It made him feel very fragile and defenseless, and he crouched lower in the saddle. Tethering his horse in the edge of the wood, he continued a hundred yards on foot till he came to the stream. Twenty feet wide it was, without perceptible current, cool and inviting, and he was very thirsty. But he waited inside the screen of leafage, his eyes fixed on the screen on the opposite side. To make the wait endurable, he sat down, his carbine resting on his knees. The minutes passed, and slowly his tenseness relaxed. At last he decided there was no danger. But just as he prepared to part the bushes and bend down to the water, a movement among the opposite bushes caught his eye. It might be a bird, but he waited. Again there was an agitation of the bushes, and then, so suddenly that it almost startled a cry from him, the bushes parted and a face peered out. It was a face covered with several weeks' growth of ginger-colored beard. The eyes were blue and wide apart, with laughter wrinkles in the corners that showed despite the tired and anxious look of the whole face. All this he could see with microscopic clearness, for the distance was no more than twenty feet, and all this he saw in such brief time that he saw it as he lifted his carbine to his shoulder. He glanced along the sights and knew he was gazing upon a man who was as good as dead. It was impossible to miss at such point-blank range. But he did not shoot. Slowly he lowered the carbine and watched. A hand clutching a water bottle became visible, and the ginger beard bent downward to fill the bottle. He could hear the gurgle of the water, then arm and bottle, and ginger beard disappeared behind the closing bushes. A long time he waited, when with thirst unslacked, he crept back to his horse, rode slowly across the sun-washed clearing, and passed into the shelter of the woods beyond. Another day, hot and breathless, a deserted farmhouse, large, without buildings, in an orchard, standing in a clearing. From the woods on a roan horse, carbine across pommel, rode the young man with the quick black eyes. He breathed with relief as he gained the house. That a fight had taken place here earlier in the season was evident. Clips and empty cartridges, tarnished with verdigris, lay on the ground which while wet had been torn up by the hooves of horses. Hard by the kitchen garden were graves, tagged and numbered. From the oak tree by the kitchen door, in tattered, weather-beaten garments, hung the bodies of two men. The faces shriveled and defaced. 
bore no likeness to the faces of men. The roan horse snorted beneath them. The rider caressed and soothed it and tied it farther away. Entering the house, he found the interior erect. He trod on empty cartridges as he walked from room to room to reconnoiter from the windows. Men had camped and slept everywhere, and on the floor of one room he came upon stains unmistakable where the wounded had been laid down. Again outside, he led the horse around behind the barn and invaded the orchard. A dozen trees were burdened with ripe apples. He filled his pockets, eating while he picked. Then a thought came to him, and he glanced at the sun. Calculating the time of his return to camp, he pulled off his shirt, tying the sleeves and making a bag. This he proceeded to fill with apples. As he was about to mount his horse, the animal suddenly pricked up its ears. The man, too, he listened and heard faintly the thud of hoofs on the soft earth. He crept to the corner of the barn and peered out. A dozen mounted men, strung out loosely, approaching from the opposite side of the clearing, were only a matter of a hundred yards or so away. They rode on to the house. Some dismounted, while others remained in the saddle, as an earnest that their stay would be short. They seemed to be holding a council, for he could hear them talking excitedly in the detested tongue of the alien invader. The time passed, but they seemed unable to reach a decision. He put the carbine away in its boot, mounted, and waited impatiently, balancing the shirt of apples on his pommel. He heard footsteps approaching, and drove his spurs so fiercely into the roan as to force a surprised groan from the animal as it leaped forward. At the corner of the barn he saw the intruder, a mere boy of nineteen or twenty, for all of his uniform jumped back to escape being run down. At the same moment the roan swerved and its rider caught a glimpse of the aroused men by the house. Some were springing from their horses, and he could see the rifles going to their shoulders. He passed the kitchen door and dried corpses swinging in the shade, compelling his foes to run around the front of the house. A rifle cracked, and a second. But he was going fast, leaning forward low in the saddle, one hand clutching the shirt of apples, the other guiding the horse. The top bar of the fence was four feet high, but he knew his roan and leaped it at full career to the accompaniment of several scattered shots. Eight hundred yards straight away were the woods, and the roan was covering the distance with mighty strides. Every man was now firing, pumping their guns so rapidly that he no longer heard individual shots. A bullet went through his hat, but he was unaware, though he did not know when another tore through the apples on the pommel, and he winced and ducked even lower when a third bullet, fired low, struck a stone between the horse's legs and ricocheted off through the air, buzzing and humming like some incredible insect. The shots died down as the magazines were emptied, until quickly there was no more shooting. The young man was elated. Through that astonishing fusillade he had come unscathed, he glanced back. Yes, they had emptied their magazines. He could see several reloading. Others were running behind the house for their horses. As he looked, two already mounted came back into view around the corner, riding hard. At the same moment he saw the man with the unmistakable ginger beard kneel down on the ground, level his gun, and coolly take his time for the long shot. The young man threw his spurs into the horse, crouched very low, and swerved in his flight in order to distract the other's aim and still the shot did not come. With each jump of the horse, the wood sprang nearer. They were only two hundred yards away, and still the shot was delayed. Then he heard it, the last thing he was to hear, for he was dead ere he hit the ground in the long, crashing fall from the saddle. And they watched at the house, saw him fall, saw his body bounce when it struck the earth, and saw the burst of red-cheeked apples that rolled about him. They laughed at the unexpected eruption of apples, and clapped their hands in applause of the long shot by the man with the ginger beard. The End of War by Jack London. This recording is in the public domain. Of Obligation by Rex Speech. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Weight of Obligation This is the story of a burden, the tale of a load that irked a strong man's shoulders. To those who do not know the North, it may seem strange, but to those who understand the humours of men in solitude, and the extravagant vagaries that steal in upon their minds, as fog drifts with the night, it will not appear unusual. There are spirits in the wilderness, eerie forces which play pranks, some droll or whimsical, others grim. 
Johnny Cantwell and Mortimer Grant were partners, trail mates, brothers in soul, if not in blood. The ebb and flood of frontier life had brought them together. Its hardships had united them until they were as one. They were something of a mystery to each other, neither having surrendered all his confidence, and because of this they retained their mutual attraction. They had met by accident, but they remained together by desire. The spirit of adventure bubbled merrily within them, and it led them into curious byways. It was this which sent them northward from the States in the dead of winter, on the heels of the Stony River strike. It was this which induced them to land at Katmai instead of Iliamna, whither their land journey should have commenced. There are two routes over the coast range, the captain of the Dora told them, and only two. Iliamna Pass is low and easy, but the distance is longer than by way of Katmai. I can land you at either place. Katmai is pretty tough, isn't it? Grant inquired. We've understood it's the worst pass in Alaska. Cantwell's eyes were eager. It's awful. Nobody travels it except natives, and they don't like it. Now, Iliamna... We'll try Katmai, ain't Mort? Sure. They don't come hard enough for us, Cap. We'll see if it's as bad as it's painted. So, one grey January morning, they were landed on a frozen beach. Their outfit was flung ashore through the surf. The lifeboat pulled away, and the Dora disappeared after a farewell toot of her whistle. Their last glimpse of her showed the captain waving goodbye, and the purser flapping a red tablecloth at them from the after-deck. "'Cheerful place, this,' Grant remarked, as he noted the desolate surroundings of dune and hillside. The beach itself was black and raw, where the surf washed it, but elsewhere all was white, save for the thickets of alder and willow, which protruded nakedly. The bay was little more than a hollow, scooped out of the Alaskan range. Along the foothills behind, there was a belt of spruce and cottonwood and birch. It was a lonely and apparently unpeopled wilderness, in which they had been set down. "'Seems good to be back in the north again, doesn't it?' said Cantwell cheerily. I'm tired of the booze and the street cars and the dames and all that civilized stuff. I'd rather be broke in Alaska with you than a banker's son back home. Soon a globular Russian half-breed, the Katmai trader, appeared among the dunes, and with him were some native villagers. That night the partners slept in a snug log cabin, the roof of which was chained down with old ship's cables. Petalin, the fat little trader, explained that roofs in Katmai had a way of sailing off to seaward when the wind blew. He listened to their plan of crossing the divide and nodded. It could be done, of course, he agreed, but they were foolish to try it when the Iliamna route was open. Still, now that they were here, he would find dogs for them and a guide. The village hunters were out after meat, however, and until they returned the white men would need to wait in patience. There followed several days of idleness, during which Cantwell and Grant amused themselves around the village, teasing the squaws, playing games with the boys, and flirting harmlessly with the girls, one of whom, in particular, was not unattractive. She was perhaps three-quarters elute, the other quarter being plain coquette, and, having been educated in the town of Kodiak, she knew the ways and wiles of the white man. Cantwell approached her, and she met his extravagant advances more than halfway. They were getting along nicely together, when Grant, in a spirit of fun, entered the game and won her fickle smiles for himself. He joked his partner unmercifully, and Johnny accepted defeat gracefully, never giving the matter a second thought. When the hunters returned, dogs were bought, a guide was hired, and, a week after landing, the friends were camped at Timberline, awaiting a favourable moment for their dash across the range. Above them, white hillsides rose in irregular leaps to the gash in the sawtooth barrier, which formed the pass. Below them, a short valley led down to Katmai and the sea. The day was bright, the air clear. Nevertheless, after the guide had stared at the peaks for a time, he shook his head, then re-entered the tent and lay down. The mountains were smoking. From their tops streamed a gossamer veil, which the travellers knew to be drifting snow clouds, carried by the wind. It meant delay, but they were patient. 
They were up and going on the following morning, however, with the Indian in the lead. There was no trail. The hills were steep. In places they were forced to unload the sled and hoist their outfit by means of ropes, and as they mounted higher, the snow deepened. It lay like loose sand, only lighter. It shoved ahead of the sled in a feathery mass. The dogs wallowed in it and were unable to pull, hence the greater part of the work devolved upon the men. Once above the foothills and into the range proper, the going became more level, but the snow remained knee-deep. The Indian broke trail stolidly. The partners strained at the sled, which hung back like a leaden thing. By afternoon the dogs had become disheartened and refused to heed the whip. There was neither fuel nor running water, and therefore the party did not pause for luncheon. The men were sweating profusely from their exertions, and had long since become parched with thirst, but the dry snow was like chalk and scoured their throats. Cantwell was the first to show the effects of his unusual exertions, for not only had he assumed a lion's share of the work, but the last few months of easy living had softened his muscles, and in consequence his vitality was quickly spent. His undergarments were drenched, he was fearfully dry inside, a terrible thirst seemed to penetrate his whole body. He was forced to rest frequently. Grant eyed him with some concern, finally inquiring, "'Feel bad, Johnny?' Cantwell nodded. Their fatigue made both men economical of language. "'What's the matter?' "'Thirsty,' the former could barely speak. "'There won't be any water till we get across. You'll have to stand it.' They resumed their duty. The Indians swish-swished ahead, as if wading through a sea of swans down. The dogs followed listlessly. The partners leaned against the stubborn load. A faint breath finally came out of the north, causing Grant and the guide to study the sky anxiously. Cantwell was too weary to heed the increasing cold. The snow on the slopes above began to move. Here and there, on exposed ridges, it rose in clouds and puffs. The clean-cut outlines of the hills became obscured, as by a fog. The languid wind bit cruelly. After a time, Johnny fell back upon the sled and exclaimed, "'I'm all in, Mort. Don't seem to have the guts.' He was pale. His eyes were tortured. He scooped a mitten full of snow and raised it to his lips and spat it out still dry. "'Here, brace up!' In a panic of apprehension at this collapse, Grant shook him. He had never known Johnny to fail like this. "'Take a drink. It will do you good.' He drew a bottle from one of the dunnage bags, and Cantwell seized it avidly. It was wet. It would quench his thirst, he thought. Before Mort could check him, he had drunk a third of the contents. The effect was almost instantaneous, for Cantwell's stomach was empty, and his tissues seemed to absorb the liquor like a dry sponge. His fatigue fell away, he became suddenly strong and vigorous again, but before he had gone a hundred yards the reaction followed. First his mind grew thick, then his limbs became unmanageable, and his muscles flabby. He was drunk. Yet it was a strange and dangerous intoxication, against which he struggled desperately. He fought it for perhaps a quarter of a mile before it mastered him. Then he gave up. Both men knew that stimulants are never taken on the trail, but they had never stopped to reason why, and even now they did not attribute Johnny's breakdown to the brandy. After a while he stumbled and fell, then the cool snow being grateful to his face, he sprawled there, motionless, until Mort dragged him to the sled. He stared at his partner in perplexity and laughed foolishly. The wind was increasing, darkness was near, they had not yet reached the bearing slope. Something in the drunken man's face frightened Grant, and, extricating the ship's biscuit from the grub box, he said hurriedly, Here, Johnny, get something under your belt, quick. Cantwell obediently munched the hard cracker, but there was no moisture on his tongue. His throat was paralyzed. The crumbs crowded themselves from the corners of his lips. He tried with limber fingers to stuff them down or to assist the muscular action of swallowing but finally expelled them in a cloud. Mort drew the parker hood over his partner's head, for the wind cut like a scythe, and the dogs were turning tail to it, digging holes in the snow for protection. 
The air about them was like yeast. The light was fading. The Indian snowshoed his way back, advising a quick camp until the storm abated, but to this suggestion Grant refused to listen, knowing only too well the peril of such a course. Nor did he dare take Johnny on the sled, since the fellow was half asleep already, but instead whipped up the dogs and urged his companion to follow as best he could. When Cantwell fell for a second time, he returned, dragged him forward and tied his wrists firmly yet loosely to the load. The storm was pouring over them now like water out of a spout. It seared and blinded them. Its touch was like that of a flame. Nevertheless, they struggled on into the smother, making what headway they could. The Indian led, pulling at the edge of a rope. Grant strained at the sled and hoarsely encouraged the dogs. Cantwell stumbled and lurched in the rear like an unwilling prisoner. When he fell, his companion lifted him, then beat him, cursed him, tried in every way to rouse him from his lethargy. After an interminable time, they found they were descending, and this gave them heart to plunge ahead more rapidly. The dogs began to trot as the sled overran them. They rushed blindly into gullies, fetching up at the bottom in a tangle, and Johnny followed in a nerveless, stupefied condition. He was dragged like a sack of flour, for his legs were limp, and he lacked muscular control. But every dash, every fall, every quick descent, drove the sluggish blood through his veins and cleared his brain momentarily. Such moments were fleeting, however. Much of the time his mind was a blank, and it was only by a mechanical effort that he fought off unconsciousness. He had vague memories of many beatings at Mort's hands, of the slippery, clean-swept ice of a stream over which he limply skidded, of being carried into a tent where a candle flickered and a stove roared. Grant was holding something hot to his lips, and then... It was morning. He was weak and sick. He felt as if he had awakened from a hideous dream. "'I played out, didn't I?' he queried wonderingly. "'You sure did,' Grant laughed. "'It was a tight squeak, old boy. I never thought I'd get you through.' "'Played out. I can't understand it. Cantwell prided himself on his strength and stamina, therefore the truth was unbelievable.' He and Mort had long been partners. They had given and taken much at each other's hands. But this was something altogether different. Grant had saved his life, at risk of his own. The older man's endurance had been the greater, and he had used it to good advantage. It embarrassed Johnny tremendously to realize that he had proved unequal to his share of the work, for he had never before experienced such an obligation. He apologized repeatedly during the few days he lay sick, and meanwhile Mort waited upon him like a mother. Cantwell was relieved when, at last, they had abandoned camp, changed guides at the next village, and were on their way along the coast, for somehow he felt very sensitive about his collapse. He was, in fact, extremely ashamed of himself. Once he had fully recovered, he had no further trouble, but soon rounded into fit condition and showed no effects of his ordeal. Day after day, he and Mort travelled through the solitudes, their isolation broken only by occasional glimpses of native villages, where they rested briefly and renewed their supply of dog feed. But although the younger man was now well and strong as ever, he was uncomfortably conscious that his trailmate regarded him as the weaker of the two, and shielded him in many ways. Grant performed most of the unpleasant tasks, and occasionally cautioned Johnny about overdoing. This protective attitude, at first amused, then offended Cantwell. It galled him until he was on the point of voicing his resentment, but reflected that he had no right to object, for, judging by past performances, he had proved his inferiority. This uncomfortable realization forever arose to prevent open rebellion, but he asserted himself secretly by robbing Grant of his self-appointed tasks. He rose first in the mornings, he did the cooking. He lengthened his turns ahead of the dogs. He mended harness after the day's hike had ended. Of course the older man objected, and for a time they had a good-natured rivalry as to who should work and who should rest, only it was not quite so good-natured on Campwell's part as he made it appear. Mort broke out in friendly irritation one day, 
Don't try to do everything, Johnny. Remember, I'm no cripple. Huh, you proved that. I guess it's up to me to do your work. Oh, forget that day on the pass, can't you? Johnny grunted a second time, and from his tone it was evident that he would never forget, unpleasant though the memory remained. Sensing his sullen resentment, the other tried to rally him, but made a bad job of it. The humour of men in the open is not delicate. Their wit and their words become coarsened in direct proportion as they revert to the primitive. It is one of the effects of the solitudes. Grant spoke extravagantly, mockingly, of his own superiority, in a way which ordinarily would have brought a smile to Cantwell's lips. But the latter did not smile. He taunted Johnny humorously on his lack of physical prowess, his lack of good looks and manly qualities, something which had never failed to result in a friendly exchange of badinage. He even teased him about his defeat with the Katmai girl. Cantwell did respond finally, but afterward he found himself wondering if Mort could have been in earnest. He dismissed the thought with some impatience, but men on the trail have too much time for their thoughts. There is nothing in the monotonous routine of the day's work to distract them. So the partner who had played out dwelt more and more upon his debt and upon his friend's easy assumption of preeminence. The weight of obligation began to chafe him, lightly at first, but with ever-increasing discomfort. He began to think that Grant honestly considered himself the better man, merely because chance had played into his hand. It was silly, even childish, to dwell on the subject, he reflected, and yet he could not banish it from his mind. It was always before him, in one form or another. He felt the strength in his lean muscles, and sneered at the thought that Mort should be deceived. If it came to a physical test, he felt sure he could break his slighter partner with his bare hands, and as for endurance, well, he was hungry for a chance to demonstrate it. They talked little. Men seldom converse in the wastes, for there is something about the silence of the wilderness which discourages speech. And no land is so grimly silent, so hushed and soundless, as the frozen north. For days they march through desolation, without glimpse of human habitation, without sight of track or trail, without sound of a human voice to break the monotony. There was no game in the country, with the exception of an occasional bird or rabbit, nothing but the white hills, the fringe of alder tops along the watercourses, and the thickets of gnarled, unhealthy spruce in the smothered valleys. Their destination was a mysterious stream at the headwaters of the unmapped Cuscoquim, where rumour said there was gold, and whither they feared other men were hastening from the mining country far to the north. Now it is a penalty of the white country that men shall think of women. Cantwell began to brood upon the cat, my girl, for she was the last. Her eyes were haunting, and distance had worked its usual enchantment. He reflected that Mort had shouldered him aside and won her favour, then boasted of it. Johnny awoke one night with a dream of her, and lay quivering. She was only a squaw, he said, half aloud, if I'd really tried. Grant lay beside him, snoring, the heat of their bodies intermingled. The waking man tried to compose himself, but his partner's stertorous breathing irritated him beyond measure. For a long time he remained motionless, staring into the grey blur of his tent-top. He had played out. He owed his life to the man who had cheated him of the Katmai girl, and that man knew it. He had become a weak, helpless thing, dependent upon another's strength, and that other now accepted his superiority as a matter of course. The obligation was insufferable, and it was unjust. The North had played him a devilish trick, it had betrayed him, it had bound him to his benefactor with chains of gratitude which were irksome. Had they been real chains, they could have galled him no more than at this moment. As time passed, the men spoke less frequently to each other. Grant joshed his mate roughly, once or twice, masking beneath an assumption of jocularity his own vague irritation at the change that had come over them. It was as if he had probed at an open wound with clumsy fingers. Cantwell had by this time assumed most of those petty camp tasks which provoke tired trailers, those humdrum duties which are so trying to exhausted nerves, and of course they wore upon him 
as they wear upon every man. But once he had taken them over, he began to resent Grant's easy relinquishment. It rankled him to realize how willingly the other allowed him to do the cooking, the dishwashing, the fire building, the bed making. Little monotonies of this kind form the hardest part of winter travel. They are the rocks upon which friendships founder and partnerships are wrecked. Out on the trail, nature equalizes the work to a great extent, and no man can shirk unduly. But in camp, inside the cramped confines of a tent pitched on boughs laid over the snow, it is very different. There, one must busy himself while the other rests, and keeps his legs out of the way if possible. One man sits on the bedding at the rear of the shelter and shivers, while the other squats over a tantalizing fire of green wood, blistering his face and parboiling his limbs inside his sweaty clothing. Dishes must be passed, food divided, and it is poor food, poorly prepared at best. Sometimes men criticize and voice longings for better grub and better cooking. Remarks of this kind have been known to result in tragedies, bitter words and flaming curses. Then perhaps wild actions, memories of which the later years can never erase. It is but one prank of the wilderness, one grim manifestation of its silent forces. Had Grant been unable to do his part, Cantwell would have willingly accepted the added burden, but Mort was able. He was nimble and handy. He was the better cook of the two. In fact, he was the better man in every way, or so he believed. Cantwell sneered at the last thought, and the memory of his debt was like bitter medicine. His resentment, in reality nothing more than a phase of insanity begot of isolation and silence, could not help but communicate itself to his companion, and there resulted a mutual antagonism, which grew into a dislike, then festered into something more, something strange, reasonless, yet terribly vivid, and amazingly potent for evil. Neither man ever mentioned it. Their tongues were clenched between their teeth, and they held themselves in check with harsh hands. But it was constantly in their minds, nevertheless, no man who has not suffered the manifold irritations of such an intimate association can appreciate the gnawing canker of animosity like this. It was dangerous because there was no relief from it. The two were bound together as by gyves. They shared each other's every action and every plan. They trod in each other's tracks, slept in the same bed, ate from the same plate. They were like prisoners ironed to the same staple. Each fought the obsession in his own way. But it is hard to fight the impalpable, hence their sick fancies grew in spite of themselves. Their minds needed food to prey upon, but found none. Each began to criticize the other silently, to sneer at his weaknesses, to meditate derisively upon his peculiarities. After a time they no longer resisted the advance of these poisonous thoughts, but welcomed it. On more than one occasion the embers of their wrath were upon the point of bursting into flame. But each realized that the first ill-considered word would serve to slip the leash from those demons that were straining to go free, and so managed to restrain himself. The crisis came one crisp morning when a dog-team whirled around a bend of the river and a white man hailed them. He was the mail-carrier, on his way out from Nome, and he brought news of the inside. "'Where are you boys bound for?' he inquired, when greetings were over and gossip of the trail had passed. "'We're going to the Stony River strike,' Grant told him. "'Stony River? Up the Cuscoquim?' "'Yes,' the man laughed. "'Can you beat that? Ain't you heard about Stony River?' "'No.' "'Why, it's a fake. No such place.' There was a silence. The partners avoided each other's eyes. MacDonald, the fellow that started it, is on his way to Dawson. There's a gang after him, too, and if he's caught, it'll go hard with him. He wrote the letters to himself, and spread the news just to raise a grub stake. He cleaned up big before they got on to him. He peddled his tips for real money. Yes, Grant spoke quietly. Johnny bought one. That's what brought us from Seattle. We were out on the last boat and figured we'd come in from this side before the break-up. So, fake. Gee, you fellas, bit good. The mail carrier shook his head. Well, you better keep going now. 
You'll get to Nome before the season opens. Better take dogfish from Bethel. It's four bits a pound on the Yukon. Sorry I didn't hit your camp last night. We'd a had a visit. Tell the gang that you saw me. He shook hands ceremoniously, yelled at his panting dogs, and went swiftly on his way, waving a mitten on high as he vanished around the next bend. The partners watched him go. Then Grant turned to Johnny and repeated, Fake! MacDonald stung you! Cantwell's face went as white as the snow behind him. His eyes blazed. Why did you tell him I bit? he demanded harshly. Huh? Didn't you bite? Two thousand miles of foot, three months of Hades, for nothing? That's biting some. Well, the speaker's face was convulsed, and Grant's flamed with an answering anger. They glared at each other for a moment. Don't blame me, you fell for it too. I... Mort checked his rushing words. Yes, you. Now, what are you going to do about it, Welsh? I'm going through to Nome. The sight of his partner's rage has set Mort to shaking with a furious desire to fly at his throat, but fortunately he retained a spark of sanity. Then shut up and quit chewing the rag. You talk too much. Mort's eyes were bloodshot. They fell upon the carbine under the sled lashings and lingered there, then wavered. He opened his lips, reconsidered, spoke softly to the team, then lifted the heavy dog whip and smote the Malamutes with all his strength. The men resumed their journey without further words, but each was cursing inwardly. So, I talk too much, Grant thought. The accusation struck in his mind, and he determined to speak no more. He blames me, Cantwell reflected bitterly. I'm in the wrong again, and he couldn't keep his mouth shut. A fine partner he is. All day they plodded on, neither trusting himself to speak. They ate their evening meal like mutes. They avoided each other's eyes. Even the guide noticed the change and looked on curiously. There were two robes, and these the partners shared nightly, but their hatred had grown so during the past few hours that the thought of lying side by side, limb to limb, was distasteful. Yet neither dared suggest a division of the bedding, for that would have brought further words and resulted in the crash which they longed for, but feared. They stripped off their furs and laid down beside each other with the same repugnance they would have felt had there been a serpent in the couch. This unending malevolent silence became terrible. The strain of it increased, for each man now had something definite to cherish in the words and the looks that had passed. They divided the camp work with scrupulous nicety. Each man waited upon himself and asked no favours. The knowledge of his debt forever chafed Campwell. Grant resented his companion's lack of gratitude. Of course they spoke occasionally. It was beyond human endurance to remain entirely dumb. But they conversed in monosyllables, about trivial things, and their voices were throaty, as if the effort choked them. Meanwhile, they continued to glow inwardly at a white heat. Cantwell no longer felt the desire merely to match his strength against Grant's. The estrangement had become too wide for that. A physical victory would have been flat and tasteless. He craved some deeper satisfaction. He began to think of the axe, just how or when or why he never knew. It was a thin-bladed, polished thing of frosty steel, and the more he thought of it, the stronger grew his impulse to rid himself once for all of that presence which exasperated him. It would be very easy, he reasoned, a sudden blow with the weight of his shoulders behind it, he fancied he could feel the bits sink into Grant's flesh, cleaving bone and cartilages in its course. A slanting downward stroke aimed at the neck where it joined the body, and he would be forever satisfied. It would be ridiculously simple. He practised in the gloom of evening as he felled spruce trees for firewood. He guarded the axe religiously. It became a living thing which urged him on to violence. He saw it standing by the tent fly when he closed his eyes to sleep. He dreamed of it. He sought it out with his eyes when he first awoke. He slid it loosely under the sled lashings every morning, thinking that its use could not long be delayed. As for Grant, the carbine dwelt forever in his mind, and his fingers itched for it. He secretly slipped a cartridge into the chamber, 
and when an occasional ptarmigan offered itself for a target, he saw the white spot of the breast of Johnny's reindeer parker dancing ahead of the lime and bead. The solitude had done its work. The North had played its grim comedy to the final curtain, making sport of men's affections and turning love to rankling hate. But into the mind of each man crept a certain craftiness, each longed to strike, but feared to face the consequences. It was lonesome here among the white hills and the deathly silences, yet they reflected that it would be still more lonesome if they were left to keep step with nothing more substantial than a memory. They determined, therefore, to wait until civilization was nearer, meanwhile rehearsing the moment they knew was inevitable. Over and over in their thoughts, each of them enacted the scene, ending it always with the picture of a prostrate man in a patch of trampled snow which grew crimson as the other gloated. They paused at Bethel Mission long enough to load with dried salmon, then made the ninety-mile portage over lake and tundra to the Yukon. There they got their first touch of the inside world. They camped in a barabora where white men had slept a few nights before, and heard their own language spoken by native tongues. The time was growing short now, and they purposely dismissed their guide, knowing that the trail was plain from there on. When they hitched up on the next morning, Cantwell placed the axe bit down between the tarpaulin and the sled rail, leaving the helve projecting where his hand could reach it. Grant thrust the barrel of the rifle beneath the lashing, with the butt close by the handlebars, and it was loaded. A mile from the village they were overtaken by an Indian and his squaw, travelling light behind hungry dogs. The natives attached themselves to the white men, and hung stubbornly to their heels, taking advantage of their tracks. When night came, they camped alongside in the hope of food. They announced that they were bound for St. Michael's, and in spite of every effort to shake them off, they remained close behind the partners until that point was reached. At St. Michael's there were white men, practically the first Johnny and Mort had encountered since landing at Katmai, and for a day at least they were sane. But there were still three hundred miles to be travelled, three hundred miles of solitude and haunting thoughts. Just as they were about to start, Cantwell came upon Grant and the A.C. agent, and heard his name pronounced and the word Katmai. He noted that Mort fell silent at his approach, and instantly his anger blazed afresh. He decided that the latter had been telling the story of their experience on the pass, and boasting of his service. So much the better, he thought, in a blinding rage. That which he planned doing would appear all the more like an accident, for who would dream that a man could kill the person to whom he owed his life? That night he waited for a chance. They were camped in a dismal hut on a wind-swept shore. They were alone. But Grant was waiting also, it seemed. They lay down beside each other, ostensibly to sleep. Their limbs touched, the warmth from their bodies intermingled, but they did not close their eyes. They were up and away early, with Gnome drawing rapidly nearer. They had skirted an ocean, foot by foot. Bering Sea lay behind them now, and its northern shore swung westward to their goal. For two months they had lived in silent animosity, feeding on bitter food while their elbows rubbed. Noon found them floundering through one of those unheralded storms which make coast travel so hazardous. The morning had turned off grey. The sky was of a leaden hue, which blended perfectly with the snow underfoot. There was no horizon. It was impossible to see more than a few yards in any direction. The trail soon became obliterated, and their eyes began to play tricks. For all they could distinguish, they might have been suspended in space. They seemed to be treading the measures of an endless dance in the centre of a whirling cloud. Of course it was cold, for the wind off the open sea was damp, but they were not men to turn back. They soon discovered that their difficulty lay not in facing the storm, but in holding to the trail. That narrow two-foot causeway, packed by a winter's travel and frozen into a ribbon of ice by a winter's frosts, afforded their only avenue of progress, for the moment they left it the sled ploughed into the loose snow, well-nigh disappearing and bringing the dogs to a standstill. It was the duty of the driver in such case to wallow forward, right the load if necessary, and lift it back into place. 
These mishaps were forever occurring, for it was impossible to distinguish the trail beneath its soft covering. However, if the driver's task was hard, it was no more trying than that of the man ahead, who was compelled to feel out and explore the ridge of hardened snow and ice with his feet, after the fashion of a man walking a plank in the dark. Frequently he lunged into the drifts with one foot, or both. His glazed muck soles slid about, causing him to bestride the invisible hogback, or again his legs crossed awkwardly, throwing him off balance. At times he wandered away from the path entirely, and had to search it out again. These exertions were very wearing, and they were dangerous also, for joints are easily dislocated, muscles twisted, and tendons strained. Hour after hour the march continued, unrelieved by any change, unbroken by any speck or spot of colour. The nerves of their eyes, wearied by constant near-sighted peering at the snow, began to jump, so that vision became untrustworthy. Both travellers appreciated the necessity of clinging to the trail, for, once they lost it, they knew they might wander about indefinitely until they chanced to regain it or found their way to the shore while always to seaward was the menace of open water, of air-holes or cracks which might gape beneath their feet like jaws. Immersion in this temperature, no matter how brief, meant death. The monotony of progress through this unreal leaden world became almost unbearable. The repeated strainings and twistings they suffered in walking the slippery ridge reduced the men to weariness, their legs grew clumsy and their feet uncertain. Had they found a camping place, they would have stopped, but they dared not forsake the thin thread that linked them with safety to go and look for one, not knowing where the shore lay. In storms of this kind, men have lain in their sleeping bags for days within a stone's throw of a roadhouse or village. Bodies have been found within a hundred yards of shelter after blizzards have abated. Cantwell and Grant had no choice, therefore, except to bore into the welter of drifting flakes. It was late in the afternoon when the latter met with an accident. Johnny, who had taken a spell at the rear, heard him cry out, saw him stagger, struggle to hold his footing, then sink into the snow. The dogs paused instantly, lay down, and began to strip the ice pellets from between their toes. Cantwell spoke harshly, leaning upon the handlebars. "'Well, what's the idea?' It was the longest sentence of the day. "'I hurt myself.' Mort's voice was thin and strange. He raised himself to a sitting posture and reached beneath his parka, then lay back weakly. He writhed. His face was twisted with pain. He continued to lie there, doubled into a knot of suffering. A groan was wrenched from between his teeth. "'Hurt? How?' Johnny inquired dully. It seemed very ridiculous to see that strong man kicking around in the snow. "'I've ripped something loose. Here!' Mort's palms were pressed in upon his groin. His fingers were clutching something. "'Ruptured, I guess.' He tried again to rise, but sank back. His cap had fallen off, and his forehead glistened with sweat. Cantwell went forward and lifted him. It was the first time in many days that their hands had touched, and their sensation affected him strangely. He struggled to repress a devilish mirth at the thought that Grant had played out. It amounted to that, and nothing less. The trail had delivered him into his enemy's hand. His hour had struck. Johnny determined to square the debt now, once for all, and wipe his own mind clean of that poison which corroded it. His muscles were strong, his brain clear. He had never felt his strength so irresistible as at this moment while Mort, for all his boasted superiority, was nothing but a nerveless thing hanging limp against his breast. Providence had arranged it all. The younger man was impelled to give raucous voice to his glee, and yet his helpless burden exerted an odd effect upon him. He deposited his foe upon the sled, and stared at the face he had not met for several days. He saw how white it was, how wet and cold, how weak and dazed, then as he looked he cursed inwardly, for the triumph of his moment was spoiled. The axe was there. Its polished bit showed like a piece of ice. Its held protruded handily. But there was no need of it now. His fingers were all the weapons Johnny needed. 
They were more than sufficient, in fact, for Mort was like a child. Cantwell was a strong man, and although the North had coarsened him, yet underneath the surface was a chivalrous regard for all things weak, and this the trail madness had not affected. He had longed for this instant, but now that it had come he felt no enjoyment, since he could not harm a sick man and wage no war on cripples. Perhaps when Mort had rested they could settle their quarrel. This was as good a place as any. The storm hid them. They would leave no traces. There could be no interruption. But Mort did not rest. He could not walk. Movement brought excruciating pain. Finally, Cantwell heard himself say, "'Better wrap up and lie still for a while. I'll get the dogs under way.' His words amazed him dully. They were not at all what he had intended to say. The injured man demurred, but the other insisted gruffly, then brought him his mittens and cap, slapping the snow out of them before rousing the team to motion. The load was very heavy now, the dogs had no footprints to guide them, and it required all of Campbell's efforts to prevent capsizing. Night approached swiftly. The whirling snow particles continued to flow past upon the wind, shrouding the earth in an impenetrable pall. The journey soon became a terrible ordeal, a slow, halting progress that led nowhere, and was accomplished at the cost of tremendous exertion. Time after time Johnny broke trail, then returned and urged the huskies forward to the end of his tracks. When he lost the path, he sought it out, laboriously hoisted the sledge back into place, and coaxed his four-footed helpers to renewed effort. He was drenched with perspiration. His inner garments were steaming. His outer ones were frozen into a coat of armor. When he paused, he chilled rapidly. His vision was untrustworthy also, and he felt snow blindness coming on. Grant begged him more than once to unroll the bedding and prepare to sleep out the storm. He even urged Johnny to leave him and make a dash for his own safety. But at this the younger man cursed and told him to hold his tongue. Knight found the lone driver slipping, plunging, lurching ahead of the dogs, or shoving at the handlebars, and shouting at the dogs. Finally, during a pause for rest, he heard a sound which roused him. Out of the gloom to the right came the faint complaining howl of a malamute. It was answered by his own dogs, and the next moment they had caught a scent which swerved them shoreward and led them scrambling through the drifts. Two hundred yards and a steep bank loomed above, up and over which they rushed, with Cantwell yelling encouragement. Then a light showed, and they were in the lee of a low-roofed hut. A sick native huddled over a Yukon stove made them welcome to his mean abode, explaining that his wife and son had gone to Unalaklik for supplies. Johnny carried his partner to the one unoccupied bunk and stripped his clothes from him. With his own hands he rubbed the warmth back into Mortimer's limbs, then swiftly prepared hot food, and holding him in the hollow of his aching arm, fed him a little at a time. He was like to drop from exhaustion, but he made no complaint. With one folded robe he made the hard boards comfortable, then spread the other as a covering. And for himself he sat beside the fire and fought his weariness. When he dozed off, the cold awakened him. He renewed the fire, he heated beef tea, and, rousing Mort, fed it to him with a teaspoon. All night long, at intervals, he tended the sick man, and Grant's eyes followed him with an expression that brought a fierce pain to Cantwell's throat. "'You're mighty good after the rotten way I acted,' the former whispered once, and Johnny's big hands trembled so that he spilled the broth. His voice was low and tender as he inquired, "'Are you resting easier now?' the other nodded. "'Maybe you're not hurt badly after all.' "'God, that would be awful,' Cantwell choked, turned away, and raising his arm against the log wall, buried his face in them. The morning broke clear. Grant was sleeping. As Johnny stiffly mounted the creek bank with a bucket of water, he heard a jingle of sleigh bells and saw a sled with two white men swing in toward the cabin. Hello, he called, then heard his own name pronounced. Johnny Campwell, by all that's holy. The next moment he was shaking hands vigorously with two old friends from Nome. Martin and me are bound for St. Mike's, one of them explained. 
"'Where the deuce did you come from, Johnny?' "'The outside. "'Started for the Stony River, but... "'Stony River?' "'The newcomers began to laugh loudly, and Campwell joined them. "'It was the first time he had laughed for weeks. "'He realised the fact with a start, "'then recollected also his sleeping partner, "'and said, "'Shh! Mort's inside asleep.' During the night, everything had changed for Johnny Campwell. His mental attitude, his hatred, his whole reasonless insanity. Everything was different now. Even his debt was cancelled, the weight of obligation was removed, and his diseased fancies were completely cured. Yes, Stony River, he repeated, grinning broadly. I bit. Martin burst forth gleefully. They caught MacDonald at Holy Cross and ran him out on a limb. He'll never start another stampede. "'Old man Baker gun-branded him.' "'What's the matter with Mort?' inquired the second traveller. "'He's resting up. Yesterday during the storm he—' "'Johnny was upon the point of saying played out, "'but changed it to had an accident. "'We thought it was serious, but a few days' rest'll bring him around all right. "'He saved me at the Katmai coming in. "'I petered out and threw up my tail, but he got me through. "'Come inside and tell him the news. "'Sure thing.' "'Well, well,' Martin said. "'So you and Mort are still partners, eh?' "'Still partners?' Johnny took up the pail of water. "'Well, rather. We'll always be partners.' His voice was young and full and hearty as he continued. "'Why, Mort's the best fellow in the world. I'd lay down my life for him.'" End of The Weight of Obligation by Rex Beach Can Lick to Bully by Irvin Batchelor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. In the early summer of 1831, Samson Trailer and his wife Sarah and two children left their home near the village of Vergen, Vermont and began their travels towards the setting sun with four chairs a breadboard and rolling pin a feather bed and blankets a small looking glass a skillet an axe a pack basket with a pad of sole leather on the same a water pail a box of dishes a tub of salt pork a rifle a teapot a sack of meal sundry small provisions and a violin in a double wagon drawn by oxen a young black shepherd dog with tawny points and the name of Sambo followed the wagon or explored the fields and woods it passed. The boy Josiah, familiarly called Joe, sits beside his mother. He is a slender, sweet-faced boy. He is looking up wistfully at his mother. The little girl Betsy sits between him and her father. That evening... They stopped at the house of an old friend some miles up the dusty road to the north. "'Here we are, going west,' Samson shouted to the man at the doorstep. He alighted and helped his family out of the wagon. "'You go right in. I'll take care of the oxen,' said the man. Samson started for the house with the girl under one arm and the boy under the other. A pleasant-faced woman greeted them with a hearty welcome at the door. "'You poor man, come right in,' she said. "'Poor? I'm the richest man in the world,' said he. "'Look at the gold on that girl's head. "'Curly, fine gold, too. "'The best there is. "'She's Betsy, my little toy woman. "'Half past seven years old. "'Blue eyes. "'Helps her mother get tired every day. "'Here's my toy man, Josiah. "'Yes, brown hair and brown eyes like Sarah. "'Heart of gold. "'Helps his mother, too. Six times one year old.' "'What pretty faces!' said the woman as she stooped and kissed them. "'Yes, ma'am. Got them from the fairies,' Samson went on. "'They have all kinds of heads for little folks, "'and I guess they colour em up with the blood of roses "'and the gold of buttercups and the blue of violets. "'Here's this wife of mine. She's richer than I am. "'She owns all of us. We're her slaves. "'Looks as young as she did the day she was married nine years ago,' said the woman. Exactly, Samson exclaimed, straight as an arrow and proud. I don't blame her. She's got enough to make her proud, I say. 
I fall in love again every time I look into her big brown eyes. The talk and laughter brought the dog into the house. There's Sambo, our camp follower, said Samson. He likes us, one and all, but he often feels sorry for us because we cannot feel the joy that lies in buried bones and the smell of a liberty pole or a gate post. They had a joyous evening and a restful night with these old friends and resumed their journey soon after daylight. They ferried across the lake at Burlington and, and fared away over the mountains and through deep forest on the Chattagay Trail. They had read a little book called The Country of the Sangamon. The latter was a word of the Potawatomi's, meaning land of plenty. It was the name of a river in Illinois draining boundless flowery meadows of unexampled beauty and fertility, belted with timber, blessed with shady groves, covered with game and mostly level, without a stick or a stone to vex the ploughman. Thither were they bound to take up a section of government land. They stopped for a visit with Elisha Howard and his wife, old friends of theirs who lived in the village of Malone, which was in Franklin County, New York. There they traded their oxen for a team of horses. They were large grey horses named Pete and Colonel. The latter was fat and good-natured. His chief interest in life was food. Pete was always looking for food and perils. Colonel was the near horse. Now and then Samson threw a sheepskin over his back and put the boy on it and tramped along within arm's reach of Joe's left leg. This was a great delight to the little lad. They proceeded at a better pace to the Black River country, toward which, in the village of Canton, they tarried again for a visit with Captain Moody and Silas Wright, both of whom had taught school in the town of Vergennes. They proceeded through De Kalb, Richville, and Gouverneur, and Antwerp, and on to the Sand Plains. They had gone far out of their way to look at these old friends of theirs. Every day the children would ask many questions as they rode along, mainly about the beasts and birds in the dark shadows of the forest through which they passed. These were answered patiently by their father and mother, and every answer led to other queries. "'You're a funny pair,' said the father one day. "'You have to turn over every word we say to see what's under it. "'I used to be just like ye, used to go out in the lot "'and tip over every stick and stone I could lift "'to see the bugs and crickets run. "'You're always hoping to see a bear or a panther or a fairy "'run out from under my remarks.' "'Wonder why we don't see no bears?' Joe asked. "'Cause they always see us first or hear us coming,' said his father. If you're going to see old Uncle Bear, you got to pay the price of admission. What's that? Joe asked. Got to go still and careful, so you'll see him first. If this old wagon didn't talk so loud and would kind of go on its tiptoes, maybe we'd see him. He don't like to be seen. Seems so he was kind of ashamed of himself, and I wouldn't wonder if he was. He's done a lot of things to be shamed of. What's he done? Joe asked. Catch sheep and pigs and fawns and run off with them. What does he do with them? Eats them up. Now you quit. Here's a lot of rocks and mud and I got to tend to business. You tackle your mother and chase her up and down the hills a while and let me get my breath. On the twenty-ninth day after their journey began, they came in sight of the beautiful green valley of the Mohawk. As they looked from the hills, they saw the roof of the forest dipping down to the river shores and stretching far to the east and west, and broken here and there by small clearings. Soon they could see the smoke and spires of the thriving village of, the thriving village of Utica. Here they bought provisions and a tin trumpet for Joe, and a doll with a real porcelain face for Betsy, and turned into the great main thoroughfare of the north, leading eastward to Boston, and westward to a shore of the Midland Seas. This road was once the great trail of the Iroquois, by them called the Long House, because it had reached from the Hudson to Lake Erie, and in their day had been well roofed with foliage. Here the travellers got their first view of a steam engine. The latter stood puffing and smoking near the village of Utica, to the horror and amazement of the team and the great excitement of those in the wagon. The boy clung to his father for fear of it. Samson longed to get out of the wagon and take a close look at the noisy monster. But his horses were rearing in their haste to get away, and even a short stop was impossible. Sambo, with his tail between his legs, 
ran ahead in a panic and took refuge in some bushes by the roadside what was that father the boy asked when the horses had ceased to worry over this new peril a steam engine he answered sarah did you get a good look at it yes if that don't beat all the new-fangled notions i ever heard of she exclaimed it's just begun doing business said samson what does it do joe asked on a railroad track it can grab hold of a house full of folks and run off with it goes like the wind too does it eat em up joe asked no it eat woods and oil and keeps yelling for more i guess it could eat a cord of wood and wash it down with half a bucket of castor oil in about five minutes it snatches folks away to some place and drops em i guess it must make their hair stand up and their teeth chatter does it hurt anybody joe asked hopefully well sir if anybody wanted to be hurt and got in its way i rather guess he'd succeed pretty well it's powerful why if a man were to catch hold of the tail of a locomotive and hang on it would jerk the toenails right off him joe began to have great respect for locomotives soon they came in view of the famous erie canal hard by the road through it the grain of the far west had just begun moving eastward in that tide that was flowing from april to december big barges drawn by mules and horses on its shore were cutting the still waters of the canal they stopped and looked at the barges and the long tow ropes and the tugging animals there's a real artificial river hundreds of miles long handmade of the best material watertight no snags or rocks or other imperfections durability guaranteed said samson it has made the name of dewitt clinton known everywhere i wonder what next sarah exclaimed they met many teams and passed other movers going west and some prosperous farms on a road wider and smoother than any they had travelled they camped that night close by the river with a connecticut family on its way to ohio with a great load of household furniture on one wagon and seven children in another there were merry hours for the young and pleasant visiting between the older folk that evening at the fireside there was much talk among the latter about the great erie canal so they fared along the canandaigua and across the genesee to the village of rochester and on through lewiston and up the niagara river to the falls and camped where they could see the great water flood and hear its muffled thunder children said samson i want you to take a good look at that it's the most wonderful thing in the world and maybe you'll never see it again the indians used to think that the great spirit was in this river said sarah kind of seems to me they were right samson remarked thoughtfully kind of seems as if the great spirit of america was in that water it moves on in the way it wills and nothing can stop it everything in its current goes along with it they had the lake view and its cool breeze on their way to silver creek dunkirk and erie and a rough way it was in those days they fared along through indiana and over the wide savannas of illinois and on the ninety-seventh day of their journey they drove through rolling grassy flowering prairies and up a long hard hill to the small log cabin settlement of new salem illinois on the shore of the sangamon they halted about noon in the middle of this little prairie village opposite a small clapboarded house a sign hung over its door which bore the rudely lettered words rutledge's tavern a long slim stoop-shouldered young man sat in the shade of an oak tree that stood near the corner of the tavern with a number of children playing about him he had sat leaning against the tree trunk reading a book he had risen as they came near and stood looking at them with the book under his arm he wore a hickory shirt without a collar or coat or jacket one suspender held up his coarse linsey trousers the legs of which fitted closely and came only to a blue yarn zone above his heavy cowhide shoes samson writes that he fetched a sneeze and wiped his big nose with a red handkerchief as he stood surveying them in silence while dr john allen who had sat on the doorstep reading a paper a kindly-faced man of middle age with a short white beard under his chin greeted them cheerfully the withering sunlight of a day late in august fell upon the dusty street now almost deserted faces at the doors and windows of the little houses were looking out at them two ragged boys and a ginger-coloured dog came running towards the wagon 
The latter and Sambo surveyed each other with raised hair and began scratching the earth straight-legged whining meanwhile and in a moment began to play together a man in blue jeans who sat on the veranda of a store opposite leaning against its wall stopped whittling and shut his jackknife where do you hail from the doctor asked vermont said samson all the way in that wagon yes sir i guess you're made of the right stuff said the doctor where you bound don't know exactly going to take up a claim somewhere there's no better country than right here. This is the Canaan of America. We need people like you. Unhitch your team and have some dinner, and we'll talk things over after you've rested. I'm the doctor here, and I ride all over this part of the country. I reckon I know it pretty well. A woman in a neat calico dress came out of the door, a strong-built and rather well-favoured woman with blonde hair and dark eyes. Mrs. Rutledge, these are travellers from the east, said the doctor. Give them some dinner, and if they can't pay for it, I can. They've come all the way from Vermont. Good land. Come right in and rest yourselves. Abe, you show the gentleman where to put his horses and lend him a hand. Abe extended his long arm towards Samson and said, Howdy, as they shook hands. When his big hand got hold of mine, I kind of felt his timber, Samson writes. I says to myself, there's a man it would be hard to tip over in a rustle. What's your name? How long you been travelling? My conscience, ain't you wore out? The hospitable Mrs. Rutledge was asking as she went into the house with Sarah and the children. You go and mix up with the little ones and let your mother rest while I get dinner, she said to Joe and Betsy, and added as she shook Sarah's shawl and bonnet, You lock down and rest yourself while I'm flying about the fire. Come all the way from Vermont? Abe asked as he and Samson were unhitching. Yes, sir. By jing, the slim giant exclaimed. I reckon you feel like throwing off your harness and taking a roll in the grass. The tavern was the only house in New Salem with stairs in it. Stairs so steep, as Samson writes, that they were first cousins to the ladder. There were four small rooms above them. Two of these were parted by a partition of cloth hanging from the rafters. In each was a bed and bedstead, and smaller beds on the floor. In case there were a number of adult guests, the bedstead was greened, with sheets hung upon strings. In one of these rooms the travellers had a night of refreshing sleep. After riding two days with the doctor, Samson bought the claim of one Isaac Golliher to a half-section of land a little more than a mile from the western end of the village. He chose a site for his house on the edge of an open prairie. Now we'll go over and see Abe, said Dr. Allen, after the deal was made. He's the best man with an axe and a saw in this part of the country. He clerks for Mr. Offutt. Abe Lincoln is one of the best fellows that ever lived, a rough diamond just out of the great mine of the West that only needs to be cut and polished. Denton Offutt's store was a small log structure, about twenty by twenty, which stood near the brow of the hill east of Rutledge's Tavern. When they entered it, Abe lay at full length on the counter, his head resting on a bolt of blue denim, as he studied a book in his hand. He wore the same shirt and one suspender and linsey trousers, which he had worn in the dooryard of the tavern, but his feet were covered only by his blue yarn socks. Abe laid aside his book and rose to a sitting posture. "'Mr. Trailer, said Dr. Allen, "'has just acquired an interest in all our institutions.' He has bought the Gullaher tract, and is going to build a house and some fences. Abe, couldn't you help get the timber out in a hurry so we can have a raising within a week? You know the art of the axe better than any of us. Abe looked at Samson. I reckon he and I would make a good team with an axe, he said. He looks as if he could push a house down with one hand and build it up with the other. You bet I'll be glad to help in any way I can. Next morning, at daylight, two parties went out in the woods to cut timber for the home of the newcomers. In one party were Harry Needles carrying two axes and a well-filled luncheon pail, Samson with a saw in his hand and the boy Joe on his back, Abe with saw and axe and a small jug of root beer, and a book tied in a big red handkerchief and slung around his neck. When they reached the woods, Abe cut a pole for the small boy and carried him on his shoulder to the creek and said, Now you sit down here and keep order in this little frog city. If you hear a frog say anything improper, 
You fetch him a whack. Don't allow any nonsense. We'll make you mayor of Frog City. The men fell to with axes and saws while Harry limbed the logs and looked after the mare. Their huge muscles flung the sharp axes into the timber and gnawed through it with a saw. Many big trees fell before noontime when they stopped for luncheon. While they were eating, Abe said, I reckon we better saw out a few boards this afternoon. Need em for the doors. We'll tote a couple of logs up on the side of that knoll, put em on skids and whip em up into boards with the saw. Samson took hold of the middle of one of the logs and raised it from the ground. I guess we can carry em, he said. Can you shoulder it? Abe asked. Easy, said Samson, as he raised an end of the log, stepped beneath it and, resting its weight on his back, soon got his shoulder near its centre and swung it clear of the ground and walked with it to the knoll side where he let it fall with a resounding thump that shook the ground. Abe stopped eating and watched every move in this remarkable performance. The ease with which the big Vermonter had so defied the law of gravitation with that unwieldy stick amazed him. "'That thing will weigh from seven to eight hundred pounds,' said he. "'I reckon you're the stoutest man in this part of the state, and I'm quite a man myself. "'I've lifted a barrel of whiskey and put my mouth to the bunghole. "'I never drink it.' "'Say,' he added, as he sat down and began eating a doughnut, "'if you ever hit anybody, take a sledgehammer or a crowbar.' It wouldn't be decent to use your fist. Don't talk when you've got food in your mouth, said Joe, who seemed to have acquired a sense of responsibility for the manners of Abe. I reckon you're right, Abe laughed. A man's idea is not to be mingled with cheese and doughnuts. Once in a while I like to try myself in a lift, said Samson. It feels good. I don't do it to show off. I know there's a good many men stouter than I be. I guess you're one of them. No, I'm too stretched out. "'My neck is too far from the ground,' Abe answered. "'I'm like a crowbar. "'If I can get my big toe or my fingers under anything, I can pry some.' "'After luncheon, he took off his shoes and socks. "'When I'm working hard, I always try to give my feet a rest "'and my brain a little work at noontime,' he remarked. "'My brain is so far behind the procession, "'I have to keep putting the gad on it. "'Give me twenty minutes of Kirkham and I'll be with you again.' He lay down on his back under a tree, with his book in hand and his feet resting on the tree trunk well above him. Soon he was up and at work again. When they were getting ready to go home that afternoon, Joe got into a great hurry to see his mother. It seemed to him that ages had elapsed since he had seen her, a conviction which led to noisy tears. Abe knelt before him and comforted the boy. Then he wrapped him in his jacket and swung him in the air, and started for home with Joe astride his neck. Samson says in his diary, His tender play with the little lad gave me another look at the man, Lincoln. Someone proposed once that we should call that stream the Minnehaha, said Abe as he walked along. After this, Joe and I are going to call it the Minnie Boohoo. The women of the little village had met at a quilting party at ten o'clock, with Mrs. Martin Waddell. There Sarah had had a seat at the frame and learned all the gossip of the countryside. So the day passed with them, and was interrupted by the noisy entrance of Joe, soon after candlelight, who climbed on the back of his mother's chair and kissed her, and in a breathless eagerness began to relate the history of his own day. That ended the quilting party, and Sarah and Mrs. Rutledge and her daughter Anne joined Samson and Abe and Harry Needles, who were waiting outside, and walked to the tavern with them. John McNeil, whom the trailers had met on the road near Niagara Falls and who had shared their camp with them, arrived on the stage that evening. Abe came in soon after eight o'clock and was introduced to the stranger. All noted the contrast between the two young men as they greeted each other. Abe sat down for a few minutes and looked sadly into the fire, but said nothing. He rose presently, excused himself, and went away. Soon Samson followed. Over at Offutt's store he did not find Abe, but Bill Berry was drawing liquor from the spigot of a barrel set on the blocks in a shed connected with the rear end of the store, and serving it to a number of hilarious young Irishmen. The young men asked Samson to join them. "'No, thank you. I never touch it,' he said. "'Well, come over here and learn ye how to enjoy yourself some day,' one of them said. "'I'm pretty well posted on that subject now,' Samson answered. 
It is likely that they would have begun his schooling at once, but when they came out into the store and saw the big Vermonter standing in the candlelight, their laughter ceased for a moment. Bill was among them, with a well-filled bottle in his hand. He and the others got into a wagon which had been waiting at the door, and drove away with a wild Indian whoop from the lips of one of the young men. Samson sat down in the candlelight, and Abe in a moment arrived. "'I'm getting awful sick of this business,' said Abe. "'I kind of guess you don't like the whiskey part of it,' Samson remarked, as he felt a piece of cloth. "'I hate it,' Abe went on. "'It don't seem respectable any longer. "'Back in Vermont we don't like the whiskey business. "'You're right. It breeds devilry and disorder. "'In my youth I was surrounded by whiskey. Everybody drank it.' A bottle or a jug of liquor was thought to be as legitimate a piece of merchandise as a pound of tea or a yard of calico. That's the way I've always thought of it. But lately I've begun to get the Yankee notion about whiskey. When it gets into bad company, it can raise the devil. Soon after nine o'clock, Abe drew a mattress filled with corn husks from under the counter, cleared away the bolts of cloth, and laid it where they had been, and covered it with a blanket. "'This is my bed,' said he. "'I'll be up at five in the morning, "'then I'll be making tea here by the fireplace "'to wash down some jerked meat and a hunk of bread. "'At six or a little after, "'I'll be ready to go with you again. "'Jack Kelso is going to look after the store tomorrow.' "'He began to laugh. "'You know when I went out of the tavern, "'that little vixen stood peeking at the window. "'Bim, Jack's girl,' said Abe. "'I asked her why she didn't go in, "'and she said she was scared. "'Who are you afraid of?' I asked. "'Oh, I reckon that boy,' says she, and honestly her hand trembled when she took hold of my arm and walked to her father's house with me. Abe snickered as he spread another blanket. "'What a cut-up she is. Say, we'll have some fun watching them two, I reckon,' he said. The logs were ready two days after the cutting began. Martin Modell and Samuel Hill sent teams to haul them. John Cameron and Peter Lukins had brought the window sash and some clapboards from Beardstown in a small flat boat. Then came the day of raising. A clear, warm day early in September. All the men from the village and the near farms gathered to help make a home for the newcomers. Samson and Jack Kelso went out for a hunt after the cutting and brought in a fat buck and many grouse for the bee dinner, to which every woman of the neighbourhood made a contribution of cake or pie or cookies or doughnuts. "'What would be my part?' Samson inquired of Kelso. "'Nothing but a jug of whiskey and a kind word and a housewarming,' Kelso had answered. They notched and bored the logs, and made pins to bind them, and cut those that were to go around the fireplace and window spaces. Strong, willing, and well-trained hands hewed and fitted the logs together. Alexander Ferguson lined the fireplace with a curious mortar made of clay, in which he mixed grass for a binder. This mortar he rolled into layers called cats, each eight inches long and three inches thick. Then he laid them against the logs and held them in place with a woven network of sticks. The first fire, a slow one, baked the clay into a rigid stone-like sheath inside the logs, and presently the sticks were burned away. The women had cooked the meats in an open fire and spread the dinner on a table of rough boards resting on poles set in crutches. At noon, one of them sounded a conch shell. Then, with shouts of joy, the men hurried to the fireside, and for a moment there was a great spluttering over the wash basins. Before they ate, every man except Abe and Samson took a pull at the jug, long or short, to quote a phrase of the time. It was a cheerful company that sat down upon the grass around the table with loaded plates. Their food had its extra seasoning of merry jests and loud laughter. Sarah was a little shocked at the forthright directness of their eating, no knives or forks or napkins being needed in that process. Having eaten, washed and packed away their dishes, the women went home at two. Before they had gone, Samson's ears caught a thunder of horses' feet in the distance. Looking in its direction, he saw a cloud of dust in the road, and a band of horsemen riding toward them at full speed. Abe came to him and said, I see the boys from Clary's Grove are coming. If they get mean, let me deal with them. It's my responsibility. I wouldn't wonder if they had some of Offutt's whiskey in them. 
the boys arrived in a cloud of dust and a chorus of indian whoops and dismounted and hobbled their horses they came toward the workers led by burly jack armstrong a stalwart hard-faced blacksmith of about twenty-two with broad heavy shoulders whose name has gone into history they had been drinking some but no one of them was in the least degree off his balance they scuffled around the jug for a moment in perfect good nature and then abe and mrs waddell provided them with the best remnants of the dinner they were rather noisy soon they went up on the roof to help with the rafters and the clapboarding they worked well a few minutes and suddenly they came scrambling down for another pull at the jug they were out for a spree and abe knew it and knew further that they had reached the limit of discretion boys there are ladies here and we've got to be careful he said did i ever tell you what uncle jerry holman said to his bull calf he said he said the calf was such a success that he didn't leave any milk for the family and while the calf was growing fat the children was growing poor in my opinion you're about fat enough for the present let's stick to the job till four o'clock then we'll knock off for refreshments the young revelers gathered in a group and began to whisper together samson writes that it became evident when they were going to make trouble and says we had left the children at rutledge's in the care of anne i went to sarah and told her she had better go on and see if they were all right don't you get in any fight she said which shows that the women knew what was in the air sarah led the way and the others followed her those big brawny fellows from the grove when they got merry were looking always for a chance to get mad at some man and turn him into a plaything a victim had been a necessary part of their sprees many a poor fellow had been fastened in a barrel and rolled down hill or nearly drowned in a ducking for their amusement a chance had come to get mad and they were going to make the most of it they began to growl with resentment some were wigging their leader jack armstrong to fight abe one of them ran to his horse and brought a bottle from his saddle-bag it began passing from mouth to mouth jack armstrong got the bottle before it was half emptied drained it and flung it high in the air another called him a hog and grappled him around the waist and there was a desperate struggle which ended quickly armstrong got a hold on the neck of his assailant and choked him until he let go this was not enough for the sturdy bully of clary's grove he seized his follower and flung him so roughly on the ground that the latter lay for a moment stunned armstrong had got his blood warm and was now ready for action with a wild whoop he threw off his coat unbuttoned his right shirt sleeve and rolled it to the shoulder and declared in a loud voice as he swung his arm in the air that he could out jump out hop out run throw down drag and lick any man in new salem in a letter to his father samson writes abe was working at my elbow i saw him drop his hammer and get up and make for the ladder i knew something was going to happen and i followed him in a minute every one was off the roof and out of the building i guess they knew what was coming the big lad stood there swinging his arm and yelling like an injun it was a big arm and muscle and corded up some but i guess if i'd shoved the calico off mine and held it up he'd have pulled down his sleeve i suppose the feller's arm had a kind of mule's kick in it but good gracious if he'd a seen as many arms as you and i have that have growed up on a hickory helve he'd a known that his was nothing to brag of i didn't know just how good a man abe was and i was kind of scared for a minute i never found it so hard work to do nothing as i did then honest my hands kind of ached i wanted to go and cuff that feller's ears and grab hold of him and toss him over the ridge pole abe went right up to him and said jack you ain't half so bad or half so cordy as you think you are you say you can throw down any man here i reckon i'll have to show you that you're mistaken i'll wrestle with you we're friends and we won't talk about licking each other let's have a friendly wrestle in a second the two men were locked together armstrong had lunged at abe with a yell there was no friendship in the way he took hold he was going to do all the damage he could in any way he could he tried to butt with his head and ram his knee into abe's stomach as soon as they came together half drunk jack is a man who would bite your ear off it was no wrestle it was a fight abe moved like lightning 
He acted awful limber and well greased in a second He had got hold of the fellow's neck and his big right hand and hooked his left into the cloth of his hip and That way he held him off and shook him as you've seen our dog shake a woodchuck Abe's blood was hot if the whole crowd had piled on him I guess he would have come out all right for when he's roused there's something in Abe more than bones and muscles I suppose it's what I feel when he speaks a piece. It's a kind of lightning. I Guess it's what our minister used to call the power of a spirit Abe said to me afterward that he felt as if he was fighting for the peace and honor of New Salem a Friend of the bully jumped in and tried to trip Abe Harry needle stood beside me Before I could move he dashed forward and hit that fella in the middle of his forehead and knocked him flat Harry had hit Bap Knoll the cockfighter I got up next to the kettle then and took the scum off it Fetched one of them devils a slap with the side of my hand that took the skin off his face and rolled him over and over When I looked again Armstrong was going limp his mouth was open and his tongue out With one hand fastened to his right leg and the other to the nape of his neck Abe lifted him at arm's length and gave him a toss in the air Armstrong fell about ten feet from where Abe stood and lay there for a minute the fight was all out of him and he was kind of dazed and sick Abe stood up like a giant and his face looked awful solemn Boys if there's any more of you that want trouble you can have some off the same piece he said They hung their heads and not one of them made a move or said a word Abe went to Armstrong and helped him up Jack I'm sorry that I had to hurt you he said you get on your horse and go home Abe you're a better man than me said the bully and he offered his hand to Abe I'll do anything you say So the Clary's Grove gang was conquered They were to make more trouble, but not again were they to imperil the foundations of law and order in the little community of New Salem End of when Lincoln licked a bully by Irving Batchelor